Hello, everybody. Welcome to EFAP. Uh, I'm not even going to... Who knows what number these could ever be. Hopefully, it's it's where I expect it to be, but I'm not even going to guess. It is this episode Triple where we X'd. talk about House of the Dragon Season 2, Episodes 3 and hopefully 4. But you never know. Maybe we talk about 3 so long. This is just the Episode 3 episode where we, we simply episode about that episode. So, uh, uh, I, I have no idea. It is offline. Because this is being, we've got a stack of episodes uh, to take care of, and there's there's very little time to to slot them into different places. So we're trying to get this done, get you guys the anal sis that we've uh, we've promised. All right, we got to get this shit sorted. So we're probably just going to run right into it, unless there's anything anyone wants to mention. You know what? Broadly speaking, it's, it's worth mentioning that there are six episodes that have released out of the season so far. What's, uh, has anyone got any controversial opinions? How are you feeling about the season, everybody? Controversial opinions about the entirety of the season so far? Well, I mean, anything you want to say, I or, guess. Hmm. Um, controvert. Well, I don't really have um, any clue what people generally think about the show. Well, I don't, apart from this, I don't really talk to anybody about it, and I don't really <laughs> look Loser. up forums or it, it, listen I to suppose you know, it might be a controversial opinion to say that you're really, really enjoying it since people are uh, expressing disapproval of this mm. season in not small quantities. Bum, bum, bum. Would it be controversial if I said that I find the show's understanding of medieval society to be persistently vexatious? Mm. I like that word. Is that, that a hot work. take? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> It would depend on what aspects you're picking. I can't imagine I would disagree with whichever ones you would choose to end up picking. It's, um, I guess to keep broad strokes for now, it's very much like you can tell that it's modern writers writing about the medieval period, if you know what I mean. Like, they've inserted a lot of modern attitudes in there, and I don't mean that sort of thing before anyone jumps on that, no. Uh, I mean in terms of how people view their positions in the world. They're very self-aware and conscious of... Like, for example, uh, the treatment of women in the setting. They're very, very conscious of the fact that they are depowered, which isn't necessarily the case, because Westeros is first off depowering them beyond what would be expected in a medieval society, and second off, um, when people are born and raised in a society like that, they don't necessarily have this awareness that things should be any other way. Hmm. That makes sense? Interesting. I think I understand what you mean. There are lots of uh, comments about the meta position of women in the universe. I think I get what you're saying. It's like, why would they ever say mm -hmm. that? It would be it's it's a very small gripe in the grand scheme of things. But as a as a medieval historian, I guess I have to be I have to be mad about it. I wow. need to make videos where I have like laser beams coming out of my eyes, uh, oh. getting mad about <laughs> getting on fire. I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope nobody here thinks the Harren Hall stuff has been boring or pointless. I sure hope <gasps> oh, that's absolutely a, not. Not a hot take okay. that anybody oh, here has. Okay, good. No, I have some of my favorite stuff. Yeah, yeah. especially mm. in more recent Unf episodes. Mm. Unfortunately, people disagree. They do. People no, it's all filler because he's just stuck in the me, castle. That's that right. That's what people want. Um, because I think. Oh, I drink in those well, scenes. Yeah, I... Everyone we get. Yeah. But... Well, it yeah, seems like something really that's um, something that's become a bit of a topic is, is like whether or not people realize that you, they shouldn't expect battles every episode, um, or or even necessarily the most insane things to happen every episode either. That there are going to be episodes that are just advancing Seven. elements that are currently in play rather than, you know, exploding constantly. God forbid, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I know, right? It's like, that's how television <laughs> shows work. I try to but... find yeah, some of, something of a bridge for that sort of conversation, because I don't want to dis disregard everyone as just they want action scenes or whatever. It's like, what is it that they want? And I think it's more action, not necessarily uh, fighting battles and stuff, but action that moves events forward, as opposed to he's in his own head, so all of it isn't necessarily moving anything anywhere. But it is, though, because it's going to be affecting him very specifically. It's relevant it, to him, which is the important part. Um, sometimes yeah. I wonder if a lot of these things will be seen much differently once you get the full context. Uh, so, you know, I've Maybe. said before, I was going to like... wait before being able to sort of fully give a perspective on just how much we're gaining from all of this. Uh, I felt the same way about a lot of the good shows that we've come across. It's like, uh, I, don't, I don't, you know, there's something that could happen. I'd be like, I'm not 100% sure of what that even means yet. 
Um, and then later on, you're like, oh, that was the thing of the thing. Nice. Good work. High five. Because they just want to put some stuff in your head. And the funny thing is, I way prefer it being um, harder to figure out than when they go, hey, look at this person. And you're like, who's that? And they go, it's a guy called Hugh. Keep that in mind. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> like, what, I don't know. Uh, that, that's, that's less preferential, even though Thanks I don't letting you know, me know, show. have any issue with it necessarily. Anyway, I suppose we'll get started up, because technically we're still relatively further back in the timeline of, uh, of good old Hot D compared to what, uh, certainly what people will be talking about as this episode comes out. So we gotta, gotta catch up, gotta get going. In which case we can, uh, House of the Dragon... Uh, episode three opens with a good old discussion with the Brackens and Blackwoods. Uh, they're having their iconic breakdown, which was mentioned in the prior season as the thing that happens. They are symbolic, if you will, of a certain is, is a conflict that's happening on a grander scale because they don't remember exactly what started the big old feud between these two houses. But at this point, it's causing yeah. big old issues. And, uh, you know, cycles of violence, that whole whim-wham. Some would argue that is the broad theme of House of the Dragon, but, I mean, it's really dependent on what you see more of or less of in the show. I, uh, you know, I enjoy the scene enough as, as just a... It's a, two territorial groups of people who are like, fuck you, no, fuck you, you move the stones, you move the stones, blah, 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 little fight, big fight, and then it hard cuts to a massacre, or rather a big old battle that's ended with everybody being dead. It's gotta dead. be hard. The move. same character... Well, it's one of the arguing characters. Right? It's yes. one of the characters that's arguing. It's the Bracken guy's corpse. It just hard cuts to that guy dead, even though he he was kind of the one that could have just decided to not engage in the argument any further and walk away. Well, it but just seems realistic a microcosm enough. Of yeah. The, uh, yeah, a microcosm of the broader conflict at play and kind of foreshadowing of its uh, dramatic consequences. Is it worth it? Is it worth I, um, your pride to be like, where, 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 when the final result is just corpses? Everywhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I can't be the only one who thought of Springfield and Shelbyville. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's a, Why that's can't they just get along? Example. I I think it was uh because it was um an interesting choice to not show the uh the battle because that was a known and expected like plot point going into that episode or you know going into the season anyways as a significant event. So it's an interesting choice to not show it, but I think it's an effective... I think it's effective the way that it is. Well, so the counter-argument to that yeah, would, of I course, be good. they cheaped out on us. They didn't give us the battle. What do you have to say to well, that? Um, so, I if there... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 I was no. just going to say that if there's no named characters that are fighting in that battle, why would they show it to us? Because it's fun. Like, you know what I mean? I don't think well, I would. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't use that argument myself. I'd go I would use that argument. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mine well, uh, uh, would would be one of. Um, it, I mean, if you were thinking about like within the scope of, I guess you know, budget concerns, right, and like whether or not, you know, does a does a choice to depict the battle there in any way compromise their ability to depict um, the battle in the subsequent episode? And if that was the case, that. if you're able to essentially achieve a really strong effect of, um like a, a, a like a hard cut between all of these people alive and arguing with each other to the consequences directly uh skipping past the the conflict itself um you can just create like a really potent moment of just the hard cut to all of the devastation that's been wrought and you know kind of like immediately hit people with oh this is this is you know there's a microcosm of what's going on here this is some this kind of level of destruction and carnage is something that will happen um, and then, you know, kind of like, it almost feels like it starkly contrasts the, the almost pettiness of the, of the initial argument with its dramatic ramifications. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think quite the juxtaposition mm -hmm. is very important to what they're trying to get across there. And I think if you actually see the battle, that juxtaposition is harmed. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hard cut from how it started to how it's going is, mm -hmm. uh, is very effective. I think it's a good, uh, creative decision. And it starts things off on a very grim note. It really kind of prepares you for what the stakes are. I am inclined to agree. Yeah, I, mean... I think it can undermine how special and uh, wide-scale and horrifying the battle in the next episode is going to be if we show this one 
which is e equally, if not worse, you know, in, in different ways, brutal and gruesome. Uh, that, that we can watch a battle unfold from start to finish later, but simultaneously they get to have the image of the field of corpses versus some some kids messing around and fucking with each other because of the fact that their parents and their parents and their parents have fought over land for so long. Something so small can lead to something so big is, is expertly illustrated, uh, and you wouldn't get it otherwise. It's an opportunity, and it would be missed otherwise. I don't believe that we needed to have... Uh, the fight, I'm not sure how much we would have gained, but I would of course defend that we can gain plenty from having the Bracken and Blackwoods fight of the burning mill or whatever. It's, it's not like it wouldn't be anything to gain, it's just that I appreciate the artistic choice as is. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I guess I mean, uh, so. to clarify, yep. I think I think Fringy kind of helped out the point that I was trying to make about saying the no named character <laughs> thing. It was just like, w w I don't know why they would want to spend the money producing that fight when the... the uh, uh, and a thematic point was made the way they did it and it would have cost a hell of a lot more money to show a fight that doesn't have anyone involved who we know about i suppose that's what would be said as like a secondary benefit is not only is it a really good creative choice anyway that's really effective but it saves you money that you can then use yeah. later when um when it feels like it's required because i would say that the battle in episode four is something that we need to see because part of what's important about it is showing the the dynamics of the battle before and after dragons get involved yes and it did not yeah. look yeah. cheap no yeah it's it a smart really narrative decision image. a smart narrative decision with the benefit of saving money because the the effect yeah. is much superior when you have when you juxtapose images immediately one after another like, because that, yeah. that gets the audience thinking about the purpose of the contrast. Whereas if it's gradual with a battle in between, the point would be lost or Speaking more likely would be lost. Of the which, point becomes the action sequence. The next uh, image you see after that field of corpses is the grave for both of the uh, twins, which again is like the other element that drives home the point of what we're going to see of this whole story, right? You have that much death, but then also the family kills itself is what uh, mm -hmm. is going to be very meaningful about everything going forward. It's uh, We were just talking about how this is a microcosm of the grander war that's at stake, and so were the twins, a representative of a family torn in half and then destroyed each other. Uh, or itself, you could say. It's uh, th Though it's, it was distracting to me and many others, uh, you probably wouldn't bury them with the King's God armor. That's, that's probably not happening. You might want to keep that. That is... Um, <laughs> I could buy it maybe for certain kings or, or higher up royals and stuff with certain uh, being buried with certain whatevers, but in a, in the middle of a war, King's God armor is fucking brilliant. Like you would want to grab that and uh, put it onto the next person, sort of thing. Because mm -hmm. uh, that shit is expensive. But hey, maybe the word you wouldn't understand who these people are without it. You do not get sets of full plate from out of thin air. Um, yeah, that shit's expensive and takes some pretty intense craftsmanship to make as well. I think I appreciate too Bad that um, Maybe. Rhaenyra had them buried together. Uh, Jace thinks it's kind of fucked up because one of them was, one was a traitor, but then she's like, not really in a way. Like, neither are a traitor. You know, they mm -hmm. stood for what they believed their oath represented, which... Um, I've always appreciated that. There's this uh, in Game of Thrones, Sir Barristan Selmy would have fought for like the Mad King, but they recognize like, yeah, but you did it because you that's your oath. You're not supposed to not do yeah. that. It's uh yeah, it's good shit, uh, but also sad, you know? Those uh those twin boys. It's uh an unfortunate end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is sad. I think Bad luck it, to wear the armor that a twin died in, so that's why they had to bury it with him. I think a lot of people <laughs> A lot of people, in the, you know, would have told you that, you know, if a twin died in this armor, can't wear it. It's bad luck. Bad luck, yeah. It's an ill omen. Yeah. And uh, Rainis talks about how we don't really know the origin of the fight anymore, of the war. It's hard to say who owes who what. It's it's pretty much gotten so far out of hand that it's just it's just going to happen. But uh, this episode is a, a, the final attempts, I think, to stop the war from being fully conducted. And she kind of sets that up. Uh, the the thing I find curious about what she says to Rhaenyra is that Otto Hightower would never have allowed this. Uh, we mentioned, I think we were discussing episode two, but it's just... 
he he the 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 plan itself with the ruse with the the twins i i assume maybe that's what she's referencing but the nature of trying to assassinate I think so, a queen yeah. at night is definitely something that he would have uh, considered yeah i think it was the twin i i think it was the twin part that's what i got from that cuz it's kind of a it it's kind of a it's kind of a crazy idea it's a little little out there so, uh, so, some other things that Renée says, because she is a source of cringe for me in this show, as with uh, other people. She says, Hotter blood has prevailed, the young men have taken the bit in the teeth and they wish to punish, to revenge, soon they'll not even remember what started the war in the first place. As if this does not apply to the women at all in this show. It's very odd. Uh, I suppose you'd say it's a failing on her character to not understand that several women, including herself, have made incredibly bad choices that relate to uh, significant consequences that push the war forward. But uh, she seems to think it's the I mean, men arguably, that are if, the reason. I mean, if it was kind of her quote-unquote cooler blood that is the reason we're even having a civil war at Well, it's, all. it's funny, right? If her hot blood was, killed uh, a bunch of civilians that her cool blood didn't kill yeah. the people that would have ended the war. <laughs> <It's> like, hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Curious. Uh, Plenty to discuss there, too, I think. Damage. If you wanted to commit to that being a part of your character, we could have explored it. I would have been fine with it if they'd actually addressed it, you know? But they never did. Uh, it was I'd, never love yeah. how, how, I'd love to know how either side expects a war to be avoided at this point. Because this is a succession crisis. Both, both factions believe that they have the true heir to the Iron Throne. How do we reach, like, we're at an impasse. How do we actually reach an amicable, like, conclusion here? One of them just has to say, okay, I just won't then. I, I just won't be king or queen. Yeah. Which is also, I mean, it's at the end of the episode, but it's also why Rhaenyra might not have had much of a chance of convincing Alicent of anything. Well, yeah, this is a point they make earlier, uh, later on, but it makes the entire thing come across as a little bit naive to me. It's like... What what do they think can happen that will cause a war to not happen? I think there's a I think there's a reasonable sort of a, like a natural element to wanting to avoid open conflict as long as possible, uh, knowing that you don't know all of the possibilities, wanting to delay that as much as possible, and the people involved, uh, a lot of them at least, not wanting to kind of cross that line. That isn't easily uncrossed. So I can believe that they'd want to delay it as much as possible. Do everything the involvement, they can to avoid it. The involvement of dragons is what makes it like palatable to me. W without dragons being involved, uh, I would have a lot more issues with um, the amount of dithering that's going on in attempts to like resolve a succession crisis without going to war. I don't know if there's gaps in my knowledge here, but to my understand, I don't. I can't recall a succession crisis that was ever resolved like peacefully in that manner currently. That's fair, but I do think the show does put efforts in to say the dragons are the biggest reason why people yeah. aren't uh, moving exactly. forward. And episode four gives its argument for that as well. Um, yeah, Renée finishes off. Episode four really pays that off. With saying like playing the blame game is probably worthless too, because uh, as far as Rhaenyra thinks, Alicent would have approved of the horrible plans that have taken place, and vice versa. Um, this is a more interesting point to me from Rhaenys, that both sides, it's not even necessarily, her, her thing is like, you can reach Alicent because it's not necessarily that she made the choices to do the horrible things that have happened to you and vice versa. But, um, I think the more interesting commentary would just be, well, the, the, the sides are now responsible somewhat. Rhaenyra had to recognize that with Damon's choice and simultaneously Alicent with, uh, a lot of these goofy ass fucking decisions like the twin plan. It's um, undeniably going to be a, a, an accounting for the teams of, of the horrors that they've committed, so to speak. But like I said, the Rhaenys' dialogue is unfortunately a bit uh, fucked up with the certain writers of like trying to make it about men all the time, which I think is a uniquely uninteresting point of view about the show. And if if you know if the writer were here right now and they were like, but that is the point, I'd be like, oh well, you haven't done very a very good job with the events and uh, to to sort of support that point of view. Unfortunately, I find myself distracted I mean, by the many decisions women have made in this show. Yeah, it's, a... it's, it's frustrating to me because I just go back to real history again. Uh, the the conflict that the Dance of the Dragons is based off of is the anarchy from English history, which is a succession crisis in much the same way. One of the leaders of one of the factions in that succession crisis was Empress Matilda, a woman. 
<laughs> like mm. hotter blood absolutely can and does prevail in women as well and they had the power to act on it that's what i mean um and, and it's weird too to come off the heels of game of thrones season eight where the biggest horrifying massacre of all time was done by a woman in the, in the canon mm -hmm. of you know what i mean it's just like i just don't i don't i don't follow i get very confused by what you're trying to do and you're not apparently acknowledging the events as you write them especially like i said rainice's ones but we hard cut from the grave to cole looking down uh this is as was mentioned in our episodes one and two discussion cole was in a in a possibly bad place at the end of season one for us in terms of breaking him down character wise but even this shot is uh, is is helping him. He's climbing up them uh, um, uh, that ladder a little bit. You know, he's uh, they're clearly offering him humanity, which I felt was um, being taken from him on the latter parts of season one. And so it's like, all right, we'll see where this. Yeah, goes. I was. Yeah, he didn't really know after the last season if they just turn him into a total Goofball. psycho killer. Yeah, yeah which would have been. Not very interesting. No, uh, uh, we, we, we speculate on all kinds of potential well, for Cole as a character, and then it felt like they were taking it away, and it was like, okay, fine, I guess, if you want to just make him a clown. But this feels like they're kind of bringing it back, right? He is now the hand, and uh, he is not ready for it. No, he's stressing out. He's even late. But he's got himself a, um, yep. a hand suited for, like, like a design of a necklace specifically for the Lord Commander becoming a uh, Hand of the King, which, first of all, I think is kind of cool. That in universe they would have something ready for that sort of situation because it's not ever not happened, you know. But secondly, uh, considering who Cole is to have a series of gilded hands around his neck is a uh, perfect sim symbolism for the position he is in. Is uh, he's incredibly high considering his um his start, and yet he has barely any control or understanding. Or suitability for this position at this point, other than he can fight and he knows how war works. But uh, being elevated to some level of political control, or even to be used as a cudgel in like uh, battles for the royal family at the highest regards, it, it just, uh, I like the symbology, if that's even a word, of being strangled by uh, a whole bunch of people around him with barely any control or understanding. So it's, um, it's neat. I feel like I a lot's being said without words. As he uh, makes well, his way yeah, subtext. to the council, he realizes it's that... Not, um, the, mm -hmm. His little hand necklace thing, it's very um, plain as well in terms of its, its, its color. It's hue. It's not gilded. It's almost like brassy looking. Sure. And I don't know if that's supposed to be, you know, like mean something. It's not supposed to be shiny. It's not supposed to look ornate, I guess, in its sheen or whatnot. In any case, he makes his way to the old small council meeting, but on the way he discovers that uh, people have been named to the King's Guard who don't give a shit and uh, with people he didn't even know about, which I think stands in good contrast to season one's establishing of the king's god was much more thorough and important and like respected but now aegon just threw his buddies who we knew from episode one into the king's yeah. god that's just something they have now which you can tell he's uh he's not happy about that and neither are they really giving any kind of a shit about the role they're just sort of like yeah we're king's god yeah, it was sitting on the stairs it's a thing i do with my buddies yeah, yeah. which is a shame because it's uh it's a really respectful position it's getting all shat on and one could say that's commentary not only on the state of the king's guard through the king but also through the lord commander maybe he's not doing enough to um, ensure its sort of legacy i think that would i think that would certainly be a personal reflection on his part considering his feelings on his own position and like yeah. his history and considering his constant mm -hmm. failing upward essentially in his own mind and this is what the king's guard has come to under his watch yeah and then we get a green council People who don't meeting. care about the vow at all. Oh, no, no, no. There's a scene for that as well. But yeah, the green council meetings are kind of like top tier. There's never been a scene in this room that's not basically excellent at this point. Certainly not in this season. There was one in season one that we weren't happy with, but that's okay. Uh, always a 
calamity of perspectives, essentially. And uh, I, I hate to report, but there is no more Otto for these scenes. He's gone now. Hey. No. No. Boo! It's haunting to know, but he doesn't turn up for episodes three, four, five, or six so far. I'm hoping he's Where back. Where is Otto? Is he safe? <laughs> Many no, I blame Reese Effin's agent. I guess so. He should have just been like, make me the main character. That's what it, that's what yeah. should be. And then the writers would be like, okay. Otto spinoff one. That's going to be Otto. <laughs> <laughs> we would all watch it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. The uh, One of the bigger interesting notes is that uh, Amond joins the council. And it's... Uh, there's there's plenty of different things that have been you know like losing Otto you're gonna uh, assume that there's a lot of strategy that's been lost for um, how things will move forward, but we also get strategy from Amond and I think there's an interesting dynamic happening because we know about it from episode one that Amond and Cole have strategized together and you had Otto talking to Amond so. I guess what I'm getting at is that Aegon is kind of I don't want to say like fully but kind of useless. Alicent is more vying for power than necessarily yeah. exercising it, and so now it's like, so what is the dynamic of this council? And uh, in a sense, you could see it slowly sort of turning toward Aemond, Um which is an interesting thing. Well, he's very... Happen. Yeah, he's, he's more capable. He's more aggressive. He's more assertive. Yeah. He's trying to get himself in there. He's ambitious. He's, uh, he's, he's very unlike Aegon in a lot of ways. And the the people on the council seem to be very aware of that, which is why they kind of let him get away with sort of outstepping his position as far as like making battle plans behind the king's back without approval and things like that. Yes. Yeah, well, him being close with a hand and being the brother and well, having me, a dragon it, and a lot of it isn't even stuff that they've given us necessarily explicit scenes for. A lot of it is uh, set up by his interests. Um He's he's getting up to a lot of things. He's he's pulling strings and stuff, but it's quite subtle until we get clear in later episodes exactly what his plans were because he's laid them out ahead of time quite significantly in a way. Um, but so something that happens here as well is that Cole obviously clarifies the the state of the king's guard. He's not very happy about it, and um, Aegon says we got to replace the ones we lost. And uh, Alicent says yes, lost one quite needlessly. You know, being a uh, sir. Yeah, I was, I was, plan. Is it Eric or Eric that we lost? Well, both of them technically, but <laughs> who's on the? Oh, okay, it's the A one. <laughs> a is at King's Landing, and E is at Dragonstone, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, Sir Eric, we're gonna make them. Was... Oh, we make them look the same, and we give them similar names. Ooh, are we? Oh, we'll put them in the same clothes too. Oh boy, ah. Uh, uh, Cole says that uh, he failed his challenge. He failed to dis uh, discharge the challenge of ending Rhaenyra's, um, you know, uh, challenge to the throne. And um, she said it uh, failed because he, he, uh, the scheme was rash. And he says, perhaps, but we can't all hide in our castles waiting for war to come to us. And then she says, as now it surely will. Which I thought was a pretty good response to that line, to be honest with you. It's like... Mm -hmm. You can argue all day long that this was to prevent war, but you've now overstepped significantly. Because um, for every time something horrible happens, it like provides a bit of leverage to the other side, and you have an opportunity to try and build a bridge as opposed to, you know, do vengeance. And if it keeps switching back and forth and back and forth, eventually it'll just be too much to ignore. Like, it'll never be able to be settled ever again. Um, which is the worry everyone has, I think. It's about the ever-spreading nature of conflict, which uh, this episode and the season especially are very concerned with. It's the burning mill again. The idea that, like, one ill deed begets another, begets another, begets another, until yeah. there's just blood feud with no real root in anything anymore. And so, yeah, they, uh, they have a bit of a fight over what exactly the plan should be for conducting the inevitable war, and it's become very obvious that without Otto, it's already a mess, this, um, the discussions being had. Everyone has different ideas on what exactly one should definitively do, though there's no, like, huge conflict between Cole and Aemond, because we're going to find out in the next episode that they've already got somewhat of a plan. Uh, Cole wants to get to the Riverlands... Because the, uh, as they've said several times, including in season one, the Riverlands are the key to the war, and Harrenhal is the key to the Riverlands. 
just mainly just uh, making, taking advantage of all the men in the Riverlands and using it as a strategic sort of point of travel for all different uh, armies that are coming down. Mainly the Greybeards from the north, the Lannister army from the west, the Rivermen themselves. You got all these people who are ready to die. So, you no, know, exactly how and when is it all going to happen? I suppose we'll find out. Whichever um, side holds Harren Hall to allow them, like good passage and communications and the ability to hold land has a pretty strong yeah. advantage. And you got uh, the twins as well, which will be relevant possibly in episode 7. We shall see. I can't know for sure just yet. Um, we'll see. But yes. Uh, there's a suggestion that Vega would absolutely remain in the city while uh, Cole goes out to Harrenhal. And then Aegon is like, "Yeah, and I'll come. I'll come with Sunfire. I'll uh, we'll sort that out." And then they're like, "That would be insane. Don't be doing that." And uh, you know, if they encounter a dragon, what are they going to do? And so it, it's sort of all these pieces are setting up what we'll actually see in the following episode of just all these worries that we have. But uh, there's still a big old conflict between everybody of figuring out exactly what the plans are. And I don't know. It's something I quite enjoy watching. There's such different interests from all the characters in the Green Council. Uh, the Black Council, as much as I enjoy the, uh, the the scenes as well, I find that the Greens, because there's like so much turmoil in house as well as out of it, um, and then people like Cole, who are definitely loyal to the Greens, but simultaneously very uh, out of his element. There's there's dynamics happening that I find to be much more interesting, I suppose. But we'll see more of that. The thing with the Green Council is, I think. Converse to the, um, like, contrary to the Green Council, the Black Council is made up a lot of a lot of people who aren't such established characters to us, maybe yet. I don't know if they're mm. going to get a lot more time and attention, but there's, there's less so, understanding yeah. of the players involved in order to, like, create drama between them in terms of what they might want or, you know, their views on how the whole thing should go about. So... The Green Council has a bit of an advantage in that capacity. Like you've got Kristen, Cole, uh, Aemon, Allison, and Egon all in the same room a lot of the time, mm -hmm. and that's pretty good. Well, and uh, you you have not to fret because the Black Council is soon to get an addition, uh, one that we're all very fond of. The next scene is uh, Miss Andrew. Otto. Oh, if only. Oh. She's uh, talking to oh. Rhaenyra about uh, you know what happened last episode. She's like, "Hey, I I saved your life because of." being brought back from the ship, warned you about the crazy king's god who's gonna kill you. And then is like, so you want a reward? And then she's like, yeah, I think I should be able to be on your council. Or your court, anyway. And, um... Uh, she said, I thought you wanted to leave Westeros. And she's like, yeah, well, you've essentially proven you're someone that I might be with. You know, you, you were willing to let me go, so now I kinda wanna support you. And, uh... She also says she wants to punish the High Towers for what they did to her, and um, I mean, it, it seems that she's she's bought her place into the into the into Rhaenyra's court, which I find to be pretty cringe, uh, actually. I almost How find... does that not read as the yeah. most suspicious thing in the universe I know. to Rhaenyra? Is what I want to know. So yeah, Rhaenyra's so forgotten weird. because she has lapses in memory and judgment significantly uh, <laughs> when it comes to this character. She told her she is of no use to her. Then she told her, I will give you, you know, uh, information that relates to, like, say, uh, sorry, rewind to Damon. She said, I've got no information that's of use to you. And then she bought her freedom from him with information. So the first thing she said was a lie, it turns out. But it's an expected lie, almost, because of course she has information, because she was the equivalent of the Master of Whispers in the, uh, in the Red Keep, well, not the Red Keep, the, the King's Landing in total, King's arguably. Landing. So, it's very, um, like, deceptive already. And then, everything we talked about in Episode 2, just, just every single thing that Rhaenyra hears from this woman is, is bullshit, and she doesn't seem to be able to poke through it at all. And now she's telling her... Yes, I did want to leave. Yes, I didn't have anything of use to you. But now, I can be of great use to you, and I want to join you. And I want to get revenge on my own personal level against certain people. And, uh, hey, I saved your life, so you owe me. Built into In a way, sales pitch is saying I lied to you a whole bunch before. Yes. She's kind of like the inverse of Cole, in the sense that Cole has sort of found himself in the place where he doesn't belong. Uh, but it's not really his fault or his doing, and it makes sense how he got there. 
whereas Masaria is just sort of here, and she doesn't belong here, and there's no reason for it, and she stumbled into this part, but it's like all meta plot armor BS that got her here, mm. and I want her to go away and be the gone. The world and just else. contorts around her. It's really, really frustrating to watch. I it's would say, uh, it's um... conspicuous. It, she stands out. She is, uh, she is distracting. Said it before, we'll say it again. She should have been in the prison. She should have provided three different cases of really important information. And then she should have been like, right, you can move around the grounds, but you'll always have a King's Guard slash a, a guard with you to prevent you from leaving and prevent you from sharing any information that you shouldn't be until we can definitely rely on you. And then she'd need to do something like she did in episode two, where she discovers something and she clearly has the opportunity to use the information to her benefit, but chooses to benefit Rhaenyra. And as soon as you can write an event like that, you can have Rhaenyra being like, okay, clearly you're like someone I can think to trust somewhat. I don't know what your game is, but you're clearly not uh, trying to destroy me at every end. So that's interesting. And you keep that up until you eventually earn uh, the right. She says, like, you're free to go sort of thing. Like, you've done enough for me now that I feel, you know, something like that. And I'm talking many episodes later. And then she's like, I'd like to stay. Doesn't get Im immediate access to the fucking direct council. Just says stays. And then, you know. You have some of those scenes where she casually bumps into her and she's like, hey, you know, about this new thing that you're doing, I feel like you should do this instead. That sort of stuff until you eventually yeah, get yourself this reminds higher me of up. A thing that we did back in King's Landing and da da da. Instead, the story. in the course of a couple of scenes, she went from being in a cell to being her direct advisor for the war. Yeah, like her it really is a couple of scenes. It's, it's terrible, I think. It's possibly some of the worst shit because it's going to have so many egregious effects on the plot line. Uh, yeah, um, the episode two thing, that choice she makes, it, it should have been, like, episode three, episode four, maybe even later. It should have been the culmination of a bunch of stuff. Just can't help but think about how easy it would be for Mysaria to now still just be sending letters to the High Towers or yep. to the Greens. Because yep. she's just in the council now. I don't know, like... Yeah, and all she, she needs is a raven, a, raven, a messenger. <laughs> it's so funny you captured someone who is so intimate with the knowledge of everything to the point where she sold out your house and she admits to it, and then she's just like, but I'm with you now. It's it's so like, oh yeah? Yeah? You're with me now that I've got you in my cell? <laughs> like, that, I guess so. It's, Believe you for sure. And what's funny, of course, is um, we've seen... I assume everyone here has seen up to uh, episode six, so we know mm -hmm. that this is going to get worse. Uh, it was Sexy. we were hoping uh, there was some speculation that Rhaenyra had an awareness that she was fucking with her somewhat or something, and it was like, nope, that's definitely not the case. And then uh, there was another one that is still on the cards, but I, I don't think it's going to happen, which is that she's going to betray Rhaenyra at some point, and that she was per playing her the whole time, which I would actually think would make this a bit better, but still. It, don't think that's going to happen anymore. Rhaenyra does that make Rhaenyra kind of dumb, No, it does. It does. Yeah. Rhaenyra's already in trouble with this. She's, uh, yep. It's gone as far as it already has. It's already a huge problem. She shouldn't have trusted this lady as much as she has. Uh, obviously, the counter to this is that they share a history of manipulation from Damon or from being taken advantage of or being not taken seriously because of their station, whatever have you. Uh, you don't know that any of she, what she's told you is true. She has every reason They're to lie to you. trauma bonding. Yep. Like yeah. Boogie in this car. Oh, God. So it's um, See, it's all manipulation, and Rhaenyra is more than familiar with this. She's lived a long enough life to know this is how people do shit, and she's just uh, she's eaten it all. Like, yep, it makes 100%. me so concerned going forward because this character just seems so corrosive to everything she gets involved with. Yeah, well, and uh, it's already done now because like any anything good, like well written event in future that involves her, it's going to be marred by this history. We're gonna be like, oh great, yep. this is something that she couldn't have done if they weren't retarded earlier. Blah blah blah. Anyway, uh, Rhaenyra talks to Bela, I think, or Reyna. Yeah, Reyna is uh, the... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah Reyna is the one who goes to Eerie. It's, uh, it's one of uh, Daemon and Lena's daughters who didn't get a dragon. She's going to be sent to the Eerie with the two children. It's going to be hard for me to keep track of all the names, okay? It's only fair. And they're... Uh, they're going to be heading to there for safety with two dragons. There's not a is huge it... amount to summarize here other than she obviously feels like this is bullshit because she's being forced to be a babysitter when everyone else is going to be fighting on dragons and stuff. And the kids were Joffrey and Aegon the Younger? I believe so, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, the reality of the situation, of course, is just that it's a matter of, uh, well, it's, uh, you you can't ride a dragon, and we need someone to take care of these kids and to represent the family, and that's going to be you. Um, I guess I appreciate that she's having a bit of a, I want to be on a dragon sort of thing, where it's like, but despite the fact that her role will be incredibly important, she's going to be essentially taking care of the future of the entire family, be it in the form of dragons or the, you know, next generation. So, um, Honestly, both with how Targaryen power is tied to dragon power. Yeah, it's very, very important that she is to do what she does, but she says she'll do it. It's just a, oh, it's like a, hmm. And then mm -hmm. we get Damon entering Harrenhal. An event for many people that is... Uh, not happen as we went over, people are not happy about this whole storyline, but uh, oh, they're wrong, even to the point that people didn't like how long his initial walk into Harren Hall took. What's uh, what commentary we got for that, everybody? Um, I think it's supposed to tell us that uh, it's almost surprisingly empty to him, he didn't expect it to be like this. Um, he's getting his first taste of sort of the state of the castle. Uh, and as a result, maybe the people who uh, take care of it, uh, their abilities to do so. He was expecting more. It, he's just, well, he's in there, he's got a sword, he's looking around, what's going on? But, like, it takes him a while to find a guard hanging out. Uh, think... It's just the, the state of decay that is sort of overtaken this kind of place, and the difference of what it used to be. Because mm -hmm. I don't know when the last time he's been here. But there's also, in retrospect, I think, yeah. what this place is yeah. going to mean to him. Yeah. Very haunting and, and spooky, set in vibes. Well, I think especially where, ha, us knowing where this goes, at least as far as we do at this point, it th it really does kind of set the tone for this whole arc. Like, with it being... It, it's like he's entering a haunted castle. Well, so to be clear, but what I'm saying is that he's entering the castle with his sword up, his armor ready, he's like, I'm going to defeat the enemy. The enemy for him, in a sense, is Harrenhal. This huge place that has no interest in providing him something straightforward to cut down. And Nothing that whole defeat, scene, man. I think, captures it. It's it's big, it's empty, it's cold, and it's making him face a lot of realities, right? He keeps hearing echoes of history. And uh, the whole place is possibly the most difficult thing he's ever going to deal with in his whole life. He doesn't want to have to deal with this. But it's uh, that's what I kind of like about this scene. Um, at the time, it was great as yeah. a tone setter, but in retrospect, it's... Such a great setup to what this place is going to do to him, slash what it means to him. Yeah. It's one of those lo locations in um, fiction that becomes like a mindscape for like whoever is inhabiting it, where they are exploring their own psychology. So like it, it's obviously like haunted on the surface, but it's also like he's exploring himself in a way. Yeah. Sort of like the 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 maze in, at the end of Goblet of Fire. It's just like you may just lose yourself in there you know if you're creeping around into every dark corner one yeah, of the notable like the visuals is the the hole where jaharis would have decided that viserys was his uh successor which i think is deliberate in that you could argue that's where this all is drawn back to yeah. certainly from the perspective of this show right that's the first thing was shown in the uh in season one so it's you know the, all this trauma that's come from that one decision getting made I find it's quite effective, and I thoroughly I think enjoy so too. The, the when he finally finds a guard, he like punches him out. <laughs> it's just yeah, <laughs> thunk. I find it very and... strange that he wasn't received in any way. I don't know. A Targaryen well, a... lord arrives on dragon back. It is a sudden hard arrival, though, right? And sure, if but you're it's hard gonna miss, if you're gonna put a character in a location like this, where when it it's basically like a psychological exploration of him. Like, this is the character to do it with, because he's a very complicated character that needs unpacking, and this is mm -hmm. a great way to do it. Well, on the, uh, the point Theo just made, I, I would say that um, he lands on a portion of the castle and then goes into one of the towers. I don't even know they know where he is. I think they're just waiting for him. Which seems to be the case with Simon, right? Certainly with him, I suppose. Although, that could just be a subdued reaction. He didn't know he was there at all. Heron Hall is supposed to be pretty damn big, too. So, like, yeah, considering they don't seem to have a lot of men there, it would probably make sense that all the people are, you know, focused towards the middle. And it does look like he landed on, like, a the, the top of a, a turret. 
So I don't know if that was where he's supposed to go or if he if it's I very clear they, where he's supposed to be. I genuinely assume they wouldn't even show where he was in the castle. Because it's a it's dark Especially and in that weather right? and yeah. They know they knew a dragon arrived, they called it out, but I don't know that they would have known where to say he was exactly. Um Do you think <laughs> they knew which dragon it was? That's actually a good good point. I'm not sure that they do. It's it's kinda hard to spot him from a distance, but maybe Caraxes is uh, notable enough that they'd know. Do you imagine that many lords of the other houses can distinguish between the dragons? Um, I don't know, actually. They've never really given us reason to think one they, or the they, other. They I, have to I can see it going either way. Either. They've probably seen or read about them. And well, seen I was going to say, the thing is, if I were uh, growing up in this universe as a royal and there's plenty of things to learn about, I could see myself being obsessed with learning about the dragons. Yeah. Yeah. And at the Imagine, same time, it could be like, well, you know, the chances of us ever having to deal yeah. with a dragon are like so low that I'm not even going to worry about it. Though the yeah. fact that maybe it's almost wartime would encourage them to know which one's which. I'd imagine like some awareness of which Targaryen rides which dragon, but not necessarily yeah. a visual association for those. Like, Vhagar would probably be pretty obvious, because everyone knows yeah. that Vhagar is the giant one. But I don't know that they'd be able to, if you asked someone to distinguish which one's Caraxes and which one is Melee's, they would be able to necessarily do so. Well, but they'd know, that, they, they, they'd know that they'd know that Damon rides have... Caraxes, and yeah. You well, know. They, they probably have drawings in their books, though, right? But, uh, I don't know that they would. One they thing might. that's worth mentioning is that the culture surrounding this show would be reflected somewhat in the universe of the people will probably talk about how Caraxes has a big old wormy neck compared to other mm -hmm. dragons, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. But as a general rule, when people see dragons, they have no idea. They're like, no, oh, they're shit. more just um, terrified. Probably, they're probably to uh, yeah. yeah, get away. <laughs> that's a dragon, is the first thought that occurs. Mm -hmm. mm. Whether or not he's a friendly or a, or a not so friendly is not of much importance to me. Uh, so then, yeah, we get the introduction of one of my favorite new characters, being Simon Strong. Yes. Uh, he's so he's like all Simon. <laughs> he's such a the guy, the man. <laughs> he feels like such a perfect foil. To I'm so I'm so interested to see what it's going to end up being. Whatever the grand point of his character is, because obviously I would settle happily for him just being exactly who he is, so to speak, on the tin, as opposed to any sort of realization. But there is something in the newest episode that implies there's a bit more to him than we uh, may have realized. But I'm totally up for it either way. Really love the performance from the actor, and I just I like the 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 effortlessness in how he convinces me. He's very experienced, very careful, but simultaneously got uh, an interest in the events of how everything's unfolding. He's um, uh, uh, Damon comes in and says, "I'm claiming Harren Hall," and he just goes, "Apparently so." Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> he's just on out. And... He's just eating dinner there. And yeah, like, oh, okay. I love his explanation of what's for dinner. <laughs> the little apology of no black currants. Sorry about, Sorry about that. that. Sorry. Yeah, it's. <laughs> oh, I love the way he talks as well. Yeah. Um and yeah, uh, th this I feel is very deliberate. But Damon's opening scene with him has him denying food, and he says, "I'm not going to be poisoned. That's going to be bullshit." Uh, people have highlighted that compared to his vision quest being caused by uh, likely spiked drinks, so why would he be accepting that but not food? I think watching him over the course of Harren Hall, it's not like he can actually just not eat anything. So um, what? we'd have to either assume that he's been preparing and eating his own food, or that he's gradually decided that he can trust the chef under Simon Strong. Um, but as for the drinks, we can talk about that in a second. Yeah, um, I, I was under the impression that this was the only meal that he was suspicious of that. that I, like I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I, I think it's safe to say, especially with the latest stuff, that um, he never quite trusts Simon nor the people in Harrenhal. He's yeah. uh, on not edge. Not exactly the most trusting individual, especially here. So, uh, uh, it's, do you mean Damon himself? As in, yeah. Because yeah. I was going to say, Simon is very warm and welcoming, but there is a sense uh, to an extent that is all cheeky. of that a lie. Yeah, he is mm -hmm. a bit cheeky. He's he's cheeky. Um you get a uh information on his sort of Simon's perspective on Laris. He says he's like clubfoot asshole who killed his uh brother and his father in this very yeah. castle sort of thing. It's kinda nice to hear because 
it does make you wonder. He stood to benefit significantly from that event, and it was kind of insane. So it's it does seem to be maybe an open secret somewhat that people figure it was him, but there's no proof. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. people know, but they can't prove it. It's like Damon and his ex-wife. Ex -ex yes, yes. That was a good example. It was funny. Um, I saw a post from someone saying um, it was a huge miss from the show to not have her be one of the people who haunts Damon in this castle. And then I saw an even better quote tweet saying Damon doesn't think about her at all. And yeah. That is true. He's not haunted by her whatsoever. He doesn't give a shit about, as he called her, the bronze bitch. Doesn't, doesn't yeah, think about her. First wife. He didn't um, think yeah, about her while she was alive. So <laughs> it's, it's, This is the thing. I was like, it's just a misunderstanding of the point of Harrod Hall. He's not going to imagine her here haunting him. He's, he's going to be like, who the fuck even were you? I don't remember your name. Like, it's, <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, Girl I dated for a bit when I was young. But yes, the uh, Simon even talks about sin begetting sin begetting sin, and that that is the origin of the Bracken and Blackwood. Uh, conflict, and we're obviously supposed to grasp that that is possibly now going to become the the. It's kind of cool to see because we watched in real time, right, how the Targaryen civil war started, but that we're already entering the portion of this history where it's going to start to be forgotten how it actually began, what event was what kicked it off. Who can really say? There's a decent amount of uh, dialogue that relates to that in this. Um, that but, answer's lost to the time was a good line. I thought that, that was a, an interesting way of describing it. The thing is, it's both lost to time in the sense that it's hard to recall all of the events as they happened, but it's also hard to recall which came first yeah, or which, pointed. like, what even happened in them, according to who was a part of it, you know? Yeah, Do you the count only thing the, straw, the straw that broke the camel's back or all the other straws, too? Yeah. Well, the only thing that's going to stick around is it was a succession crisis. That's how it's going to be remembered as a succession crisis. And everything else that went into it maybe like just becomes footnotes to history or maybe a tipping point or whatever, as you may say. And Damon makes sure to correct Simon that he is not to be referred to as my prince, but rather your grace. Bold move. Hmm. What could it mean? We shall find out more. I mean... Uh, maybe he thinks very, very highly of himself. Thinks he's ambitious. He wants, uh, he wants to, the titles and the power potentially, the prestige that comes with it. But oh boy, we will definitely get into it. And uh, yeah, as to his cheekiness, right? You'd be like, uh, he says, "Why are you here?" And Damon says, "Harren Hall is the largest castle in the Seven Kingdoms, or has that escaped your attention?" And he says, "Well, it is also not to be argumentative in something of a state of disrepair." Disrepair. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> not not splendorous which is kind of a cool aspect of Harrod Hall at this point I think that it's a spooky haunted castle in the center of Westeros that's very very important to everything it's just a, a fun element and the idea that Simon Strong this is goober old man who's just chill is, is living in it is uh I like the idea that Harrod Hall has no reason to make him suffer in any way you know this place of immense strategic value that just isn't really used because there's been a whole lot of peace and yeah. it's fallen into a bit of a state of disrepair and <laughs> so it's not particularly useful for its intended use because of that as it were yeah um and so yes the first port of call would be lord grover tully who's going to be the uh, liege lord of the riverlands essentially he's going to be super important for making the river men do whatever you want but uh, as is said, he's essentially bedridden and can no longer speak or seal his bowels, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, uh, Damon says, I'll speak to him nonetheless. People should obey their liege lord no matter his condition. Which uh, even looks down when he says it, and you can't help but think about Viserys when he's saying that. Poor fella. Thinking about his bro. Which will come up in future wonder if he knows why he's thinking about his bro. Hmm. I wonder how well Damon understands his own psychology in that regard. Well, and I think another interesting comment is he's, uh, he's obviously already at his wit's end with the shit that happened in last episode, the fact that it's, he's at war, he's, he's at war with himself somewhat too. But um, he says the presence of a dragon and the crown are probably going to change things around these parts, which uh, we'll see about that in the future as well. Uh, but yes, he's interested in taking the throne, which actually surprises Simon, uh, which I get the impression that it surprises him as much as anybody who's of the position that the throne 
is not important compared to the grand operation of the actual kingdom, you know? That's always been the point, somewhat. Mm -hmm. Like, the idea that he's like, we gotta get the throat, and so I was like, oh. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. We go. do? Go get it, the son, I guess. Yeah, I was just eating dinner here. <laughs> in my leaky castle. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, Kristen's preparing to leave. You know, going off to uh, the Crown Lands, dominating castles is the hope. And uh, we get introduced to Sir Gawain Hightower, who would be Otto's son, who we've not met before, who's been living in the old uh, old town. Where the Hightower. In the old are. town. Wait, hey, doesn't he fight in the first episode of this of season one? Does he? Yeah, oh, pretty, he, do, he does. But yes, he's uh, he has a helmet on. I think you don't see this actor. Yeah, or and it's a different actor. I think if you do see him. I know it was it was not the same one. But cast. Correct, yes, you do spot him in that. Um in, in he I think he's actually like dueling with fucking Damon, which I would never allow my son to fight Damon uh, Targaryen. <laughs> but then again, maybe it's an Otto thing. Maybe you know? we should just not do that. It's just especially with how much David hates Otto and that you can get yeah. away with killing people in Can't those trust tournaments. Him to play the room play by the rules. Exactly. Um Yes. Uh Gwen's clearly annoyed with Kristen Cole, because he's replaced his dad as Hand of the King, which he thinks he doesn't deserve, which is kind of funny, right? Because from his point of view, he has no reason to know anything about whether or not he deserves it, but maybe it's Allison who's uh, told him that. Talked to him about how this uh, this is this is not fair that this has happened. You could obviously assume it. Yeah, I imagine word gets around. Especially well, there's, with Hand this of the King, is, people are like, oh, him? Yeah, the, the, to, it's hard to know whether or not he would have been qualified exactly when you don't know anything about the situation, but she actually would. She would be able to, uh, to a point, explain that Otto was removed in a ridiculous fucking fashion, and that he's only taking over because he's aggressive enough that Aegon likes him. But um, you get some sly insults, which I've always enjoyed in this show, or these sorts of shows where uh, uh, Gwen says... Uh, how exhilarating to arrive at court after three long months on the road to find my lord father who served three kings faithfully unseated as hand of the king and by a man with such modest beginnings. What a giddying ascent the gods have bestowed upon you. It's such a like... Wait, did you just make fun of me? <laughs> it's, like... yeah, no. <laughs> it's, it's fun, that sort of thing. Yeah, and he says, uh, none is more delighted than I to march out to war with a Dornishman. Like it's it, it, obviously it's 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 commenting on Dornishman are talented at war, but simultaneously that is not his position. He's fucking hand of the king. He's Lord Commander of the King's gut. Those are his like actual titles, and he's just like a Dornishman. A man of Dornish. So it's uh... the entire presentation of the scene very much feels like Alicent like foisting going upon Kristen yes. and his host. So that lends some credence to the idea that. Allison has loaded some opinions into his head about the kind of person that Kristen is, which is interesting considering their relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and then is sending Gwen to like try and control or temper him in some regard to try and retain control over literally anything that's happening in Westeros anymore. Yeah, and to probably spy on him somewhat as well. Yeah, just keep an eye on my crazy king's god man. Because yeah, uh, the relationship between Cole and Allison is very just unknown, I think, to the audience and to both characters. They're not exactly sure where everything stands, because uh, he's kind of gradually taken over her in influence on the council, which is insane, in a way. Considering, once upon a time, he was soon to be executed and she saved him. Uh, you know, and, and, and he became her personal guard, and he's just slowly elevated to the point now where he doesn't actually have to do anything she says. It's uh, an interesting shot here as well. I, I appreciate stuff like this. We've talked before about uh, Mike Flanagan's works popping in things in the background so that only the most attentive can see. But uh, this is the sort of thing that I think needs to happen more, if anything, of a certain sneaky fella who keeps an eye on everybody in the castle is very visible for just a few seconds in the middle of this scene. Can yeah, you spot I like him? the subtlety there. Yeah. Where could he yeah. be? He's um he's not like acknowledged in any significant way in this scene, but he's there keeping an eye on things. 
It's uh, it's kind of perfect, I'd say, because there's there's like an archetype of those characters in the Song of Ice and Fire world, and uh, it's just nice to see their influence, even if it's not overt. Yeah, the more whispers. than just oh, this is the scene where they talk and do stuff. Yeah, it does some around. justice to how they know all of the things that they do a little bit as well by you know letting us see it to an extent. Yeah, um, and yeah, Cole asks for her blessing, much like. Uh, once upon a time, and and she gives him, uh, I guess, a napkin or something. <laughs> I'm not sure, but napkin. <laughs> anyway, you know, it's it, that's what I mean about the whole like. So where do we stand? And they're, they're not going to yeah, talk about the that. The soup is messy. Uh, also interesting that we see the crows have pecked a significant portion of the rat catcher's flesh out. They're still there. Um, it was a symbol of a bad move from Aegon, and they're just they're just still there. Uh, probably worth cutting him down, but maybe not. He's, he's, I get, you know, he was mad, and he was fair to be mad about what happened in episode one. You know, IMO. I think I'd be mad. Yeah, I'd be like annoyed. Yeah, I yeah, mad, exactly. Though, you know, don't want to go too far. Anyway, we get back to the uh, the Black Council, who are gradually getting more and more annoyed at Rhaenyra's decisions, which, to be honest with you, summarizes a vast majority of the Black Council scenes. I. Like we were kind of talking earlier, like the the characters aren't as fully developed, and the dynamism is isn't quite as there as the Green Council. But I do think it would probably be one of my criticisms of the show. I think there should have been a maybe an effort to try and create a different feeling to that in the in these council meetings because a lot of it would be we need to do X, we need to do Y, we need to do Z, and then when you would be like, I'm not sure, walks away. And then Radies would be like, Hey, he's your queen, okay? It's very like. Hmm. Uh. I feel like a lot of our black side stuff is on Damon and Harrenhal, uh, and not a lot. There's no, yeah, there is no comparison really between the, you know, the the green meetings on the black side. You don't really get a lot of that, which is uh, I feel like something's think... lost because the people she'd surround herself with, you know, they they got to be important people. There's a reason they're there. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to learn a little more about them. The problem yeah. I sort of find myself running into is that I don't have much context for any of the things that Rhaenyra is being implored to do. I don't really, so like, I don't know how to read these scenes as such. I don't know if Rhaenyra is like dithering, and that is something that like we should very much be taking note of in that she is being indecisive and this is a negative thing about her, or if she's just receiving bad advice and being like constantly compelled to take bad moves by people who are not really like seeking the team's or her best interests or whatnot. Because I don't really understand exactly everything that they are telling her to do. Because yeah, yeah I don't really have. The yeah, when they say set. go from you know place to place or do push person from here to here, take dragon to here to here, we're all just like, yeah, maybe that'll work. I guess I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a Damon or a Corlys to explain to the audience why that move would be retarded or not. We, or an we... author. Yeah, or an auto. Because you'd think maybe I wouldn't have minded if Rainice were the one to do it, but a lot of Rainice's dialogue is simply, hey, respect the queen. Yeah. And it's like, okay. But yeah. and a part of my frustration for that was I never felt that the people on this council were idiots. I felt that they were sure aggressive, but I don't see why we can't have aggressive council meetings. This is war. It yeah, it should I was about be. to say the stakes are very big. Also because of not to come back to this too much, but because of gender roles in the medieval period, uh, this may be them being respectful. A lot of the time, queens were seen as, like, they needed to be advised and guided in that sort of way. Like, they are they are the rudder of the, of the kingdom that needs to be steered in the right direction by the advisory council of men, in a lot of cases. So, that is respect in their, in the cultural understanding of things, in a sense. I think that they missed out on potentially more interesting conversations, right? Because she says in this scene that we're not going to use the dragons. The fear of using a dragon is a weapon in and of itself. And one of the responses is the fear of a sword is not in its scabbard. Which I think is, there's a conversation to be had about um, if we send a dragon to do anything, they will send their dragons to do something and then everything burns. You understand that, right? And then to get a response out of the guy, like I would have liked to see what he'd say to that. Maybe mm -hmm. it would be something interesting like, yeah... Okay, so we'll just wait until they decide to stop burning everything then. Like, why wouldn't we want to strategically take out things that, well, we have the chance? Do you think inevitably we're just going to have peace? Like, what, what do you imagine is going to happen? Do you think if we have war that either side is going to be able to keep dragons out of it? 
yeah it's um there's interesting conversations to be had but she sort of hears out everybody's aggressive plans and then says i will think about it and so you're like mm. makes me very frustrated with rhaenyra this season so far because She's, so much uh... of it seems to be like her council tells her about things that kind of like need to or should happen and then she goes off and does a secret mission or a, a harebrained scheme or some caper with like her advisory council or like some other individual yes or sneaking off to you know <laughs> king's land uh, <laughs> no. well uh, no so what's interesting about that is that i completely agree and that i pr way prefer i'm i'm like completely interested in every decision and every feeling that Alicent has. She's a much more interesting character to me, but uh, the world, or at least the world of Twitter, believes right now that Alicent sucks and practically deserves to die while Rhaenyra is queen and the best character. Uh, uh, is... Well, this is probably just That's a shame, because Alicent is way more interesting right now. <laughs> probably people just annoyingly like moralizing at characters, because Rhaenyra is being painted in a more moral light, I suppose, yes. and I guess that matters to people, even <laughs> though none of these characters, none of these characters are moral. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Uh, I don't think people think about it. Hey, that Simon, much. Simon's an angel. Okay, I mean, on, maybe. I hope maybe. so. On on one hand, <laughs> you'll have them putting up Rhaenyra because of some kind of moral argument, which is bizarre because she's made serious mistakes, certainly in season one. But then, secondly, they'll. You know, they'll love a character like Eamon or David. You, you just sit there like, yeah. you, you understand. If you're going to go with the moral you, route, like, it's, it's not. you square that? Yeah, but he's really cool. They're he's really cool, cool though. though. Cool fact. Yeah, They're yeah, really okay. cool, though. I think a lot um, of people watch, like, movies and TV shows in a conventional way where it's just like, who's the goody and who's the baddie? <laughs> and then they just sort yeah, of stories like put yeah. all their <laughs> chips on one side. <laughs> like, okay, I'm rooting for this character now. Instead of looking at it as a mature exploration of two characters that have been thrust into a world and circumstances that you know it's not entirely their fault the the position that they're each in and they're they're each trying to work through it in their own way in a way that i think anybody can at least understand i suppose mm -hmm. um on the one hand like it's it's kind of like uh it's a little bit lame that people feel like they have to boil it down like that but at the same time the show is kind of actively encouraged the whole hey which team are you on when I'm yeah. not, Team I don't Simon. care about the teams. There's no teams. I'm just interested in seeing what yeah. decisions they'll make. Yeah. Reese fans' answer remains the best answer to that question. Yeah. Genocide well, I, I don't mind the idea. I don't mind the idea of teams so much in the fandom because it does get people asking questions about like, well, who who am I rooting for in this? Like it, it, it you know. I, I guess I, I that, that could change that, um... from episode to episode. I guess, but. Well, I think at this point it seems like it's never changing. It's basically most people are on Rhaenyra's side. God, I hope, of people well, hate I hope the story does something to make that more interesting if they're really going to push the team aspect. Like, well, you know. I, so I find the marketing strategy so strange because one side is being quite clearly portrayed as yeah. like more heroic or moral in some sense. Absolutely. Right, and if they yeah. were super overt about are you on the, 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 the good side or the bad side, and they were just very overt about it, I feel like that'd be almost more palatable than trying to act like, oh, it's one. Uh, uh, uh. But well, imagine they, they kind of like marketed Revenge of the Sith as Team Sith or Team Jedi. You'd be like, uh, um, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I guess the, like, the way I interpret the team black, team green thing is more about which one you think has the more valid right to the succession and like in that I don't sense so. i would be oh really say i mean no, i guess that's like, how I this has gone way mind. further than who deserves to be on that throne like deserves at this point i think people are starting to discuss like morally that's what happened with game of thrones yeah, more it was morally, never about exactly. like the bloodline people will uh have different posts about how you guys don't even understand our succession or bloodlines like how muddled it already is how bullshit all the rules are and so usually they come down to who who deserves it. And when you get to stuff like that, we, we're going to be talking about the good people who want the goodness in the world for all the good, good, good. And that, that'll take you to Team Black. Look at all the characters in Team Black. The worst one is Damon. And people love Damon. You know, if you yeah. understand what I'm saying. Like Team Green have people in there who are who are so monstrous from a point of view of just assessing character that they are seen as the villainous team versus the hero team. And... You know, we're about to look at a scene. It's the last scene for Corliss and Rhaenys. It's like, uh, or one of the last ones anyway, where they're talking about succession. And it's like, yeah, when you think broadly, Corliss is nothing but a good character in terms of moral. Like, he's he's a... Yeah. Has he's, he done anything that's wrong, really? I don't think so. 
And then Rhaenys, she's done one of the worst acts in the entire show, but the show doesn't know it. it they, they treat her as one of the, as do the fandom, as one of the cleanest and best characters in the whole show. Which is fascinating to me, has actually. Had affairs. I think Corliss I think that affairs. I guess that's probably his only like moral blemish at all. Yeah, which doesn't rank highly compared to like mass murder. But really. I was gonna yeah. say the um, the I think the Rainis what she did in season one, episode nine is actually the the strongest evidence for how the show is choosing who the good guys are because that's one of the worst acts yeah. in both seasons, but it's not recognized. Yeah, she got away with it, kind of. She basically got away with it. Yeah, it's, and so. They need to balance it out if they want us to feel like there's some kind of difficulty in deciding which side is the nice side and which side is the mean side. Um, I think I think who's holding the throne and not is a significant um, factor in tilting it. Like, I totally see your point about there being many factors as to why people root for one side or the other, but people... Underdog like, factor. They like an underdog, exactly, right. And Rhaenyra is the underdog right now because people know you know, according to Viserys's wishes, she's the one who should be in the chair, and Alicent is the one that's well, taken it based on a misunderstanding, right? For the record, I don't mind one side being significantly and obviously worse than the other. It's fine with me. It's just, yeah, specifically talking about how they market the show. And yes, as right. you've said, and I agree, it does make sense to try that. It's just the it feels like the show didn't know that that was the plan for the marketing necessarily, because it's not a difficult decision to make in terms of who you think should probably be in power there's things to say about whether or not Rhaenyra herself should be like does who thinks she would actually make a good uh queen there's there's this discussions to be had on that in the same way that it would be for Robert Baratheon or um whoever else had the chance to sit the throne but in this instance of the war between her and someone like Aegon Targaryen the second or whatever you're just like yeah I mean he's a mess he's he's totally yeah. unsuited so you know <laughs> He is, um, uh, is a socialite. He's unhewn raw clay. He needs to be <laughs> shaped. Yes. <laughs> he he would have been much more happy as the second son, I think. Probably. I yeah, if like if Aemond was first and Aegon was second, like that yeah. would have solved everything. Probably. Uh so yeah, Rainis and Corlys talk about succession and, and who's gonna become the Lord of the Tides. Uh this is going to be setting up stuff in future. Basically, that right now there's not really a good heir for Corlys to pick. Uh, combine that with some scenes of uh, is it Alan and Adam, and you can start to see maybe where this show is going somewhere with a certain storyline. Then we get yeah, we will see. Yeah, uh, Reyna is leaving with some eggs to go to the Eyrie. And what was funny was uh, I was speculating back when the episode came out. It was like, oh, those could be Daenerys's eggs. And I got like several messages, people being like, idiot, no, it wouldn't make sense because of this thing in the books or this thing in a timeline. And then the director said those oh, really? are Daenerys's eggs. Yeah, that was my assumption too. I thought it was funny because I was just like, I'm not, I'm, I'm just, you know, I don't know enough, uh, all the shit about the source or the necessarily things that imply, but I know that the shows change shit tons from the books. It wouldn't surprise me at all that they would want to be like, "Hey, look, you know these from the other show." Remember the I mean, um, it's not like the House of they, the Dragon exactly... episode one opens with talking about Daenerys, which I think yeah, was... the opening text specifically <laughs> is like, "This was this is a lot, this many years before Daenerys Targaryen." Hey, what man? I was very unimpressed with that when I first saw it. I was like, uh -huh, "Yeah, Daenerys." But also, the, in Fire, in fire too close. and Blood, it's it's not like they say it's not Daenerys' eggs in Fire and Blood. Like they just they're they're not. Not that much detail is. Well, it's because it regards a different character doing something that should have happened already, uh, from oh, okay. the explanation that I've seen. It's just a matter of you've got to wait for them to decide what continuity changes they're making, because obviously you never quite know. In any case, that is uh, apparently the future for those eggs. Be interesting to see how it all goes, but uh, the scene is just her sort of, I think, coming to realize how important her role is going to be because if things go to shit and everyone dies, that's the future of that house. So uh, she says goodbye. Um, which moves us over to. Where are we? I mean, it's a very emotional scene, all right? The family is splitting up for what could be a long time. They're not going to see Reyna again, yeah. maybe. I like the. I like this scene. Yeah, the family's getting split up, going places. Especially Rhaenyra, they have shown her wanting to be with her kids, and so you know, he, he's, you're by all sad accounts, she's, she's a good mum. That's what the yeah. the show seems to show. 
But yes, we get uh, Helena and Allison. Every scene they share is usually pretty damn awkward, unfortunately. Um, but this is a very good one. I, I find um, Olivia Cook is really good. I've, I've said it before. But, uh, yeah, she's great. Every, every scene she's in, I've always found that she nails it. She's uh, impressed me in this show, no doubt. Who would you guys pick as the best actor in this uh, in this television show? Simon. Okay. Team Simon. Like, huh? like, like legit or? Um, you know, I saw I I was going with a meme for a second, and now I'm thinking about it. Um, it, it's hard to tell because sometimes characters play such or actors play such incredibly different energies with uh with who they're actually you know portraying here. Who would I say is the best actor? I mean, Otto's actor, Damon. I think this like, unironically, going... Simon plays that character very well. The actor. I don't know any of the actor names, so just... but uh, the, this, this season, is I'm tough... going Kristen. Kristen Cole for me. I mean, this, that guy's killing it this season. I think honestly, it is really hard for me. It's really difficult to say because there's a lot of powerhouse performances here and good performances sort of encourage everyone around them to also give a good performance like because you want to meet that yeah. authenticity, that energy. So it's really hard to pick out one that's like standout. Well, fair. I was just curious to see if uh, a bit of exploration on that one. I would probably go with Reese Fun, so I think he's... Uh... Completely nailed it, though he hasn't. I don't. Th I don't know if he's been pushed as far as someone like maybe Allison, uh, being Olivia Cook. I, I don't know. It's it's hard to say. That, but they've got a very very strong cast. I would say for the most part. Um, all I would want I is give so. them all opportunities to uh, show their their strengths. I think a lot of people had a lot to say about. I've, I want to say Tom Glynn Carney is his name. I think. The actor for Aegon has been uh, impressing people with his performance because without it, I, I think that Aegon as a character would suffer. He's been giving him a lot of dimensions that made Absolutely. him a bit more complicated than in season one. We mentioned it, I think, when we cover in episodes one and two, but yes. Uh, I mean, actors really show their chops when their characters are tormented between like highly contradictory ideas or events or whatever. And like in that regard, Allison stands out to me because she seems quite torn. Like now that she knows or sus at least suspects that she isn't really the person who should be in the chair, but she has to like keep going as if she is an authority. Like, like I really get the sense that she's torn between two worlds. And I, I kind of see that she's really stressed in like every scene. <laughs> That, there's in. a there's a really strong sense of thorough self disgust with herself and her entire faction that permeates every single thing she does and says, and mm -hmm. it's really really effectively portrayed. Yeah. So, uh, since the events of that relate to uh, Helena and Alicent, she's desperately trying to be what could be considered a good mum to her. And she's listening to Helena say a bunch of things that half the time don't make any fucking sense at all, but it's seriously, this is why I was bringing it up. Olivia Cook's just her face throughout the scene of just being in so much pain, because obviously part of the reason why everything went down would have been the uh, sleeping with Cole when he should have been on watch, sort of stuff like that, like just the ineptitude of the entire situation and everything. And they're talking about the pain of motherhood and, and how to deal with grief. And then Helena just cuts him with, uh, I forgive you. And Alison seems to be taken off guard by it. And then she just repeats that she forgives her. And uh, again, the performance she gives is such a clear weight off her shoulders somewhat. Because it's mm -hmm. nothing but been on her mind, right? Like how she's responsible for what happened. And uh, how to explain or to talk about it with her daughter when their relationship is so strained in the first place and Helena's obviously very uh, she's very vacant her mind is scattered to say the least so um I don't know it's just I appreciate every last scene that Alison has with her kids not because they are um fun but b because they're so well executed as showing me like a essentially a broken relationship and how it's attempting to move forward in any way shape or form be it with Aemond, Aegon or Helena which I think is another aspect that um, I, I I love the scenes with Rhaenyra and Jace, but like it's oh uh, yeah absolutely to 
to constantly have the like almost every relationship in the green side has something that's been developed now for very a very long time and has incredibly complicated results that gives opportunities for actors to do all kinds of things so I guess what I'm saying is like any this is the funny thing is like I start to realize how much I like Allison is that any time she shares a scene with any character you know it's going to be interesting because of the background that she'll share with them Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. she is definitely of all the converging circles of who knows who. She's got a lot of. Uh, she, she brushes against a lot of other characters in very very different ways. Moving on, uh, Aegon, in his attempt to become more and more like the Conqueror, is now wearing his armor, and suitably, in a sense, at least symbolically, it doesn't fit quite right, and he feels uncomfortable in it. Uh, hmm. I enjoy. It doesn't look comfortable, so. No, um, but uh, it would be worth. I think they say it's worth a castle or whatever. It's uh, that's Valyrian steel armor. It's gonna be one of the most sought after things ever. Probably it would be one of the most unique items you could possibly have. I sure wouldn't wanna. You know, I guess it's probably the best thing he could wear if anything was to happen to him. <laughs> I'm honestly kind of surprised they hadn't melted it down and turned it into swords. Mm, it's a historic. I, I, I would be it's on historic the historic artifact, armor. right? It's, well, I mean, that like would be I, fucking bizarre if they melted it down. You wouldn't touch that. <laughs> yeah, that'd be weird. Well, mm. just because of how valuable and rare Val Valerian steel is, though, right? Like, I mean, well, yeah, you'd it, want yeah. armor made out of it, not a weapon. Well, uh, yeah, I don't well, know. This would be an incredible item of history and of actual use. Aegon the Conqueror's armor. I don't know. You'd ever it, melting that down would. First of all, like from a pragmatic point of view, I don't even know that that is pragmatic. But secondly, a symbolic and, and historical point of view, why would they ever want to? Well, do that? I, I guess it just be I, like I'm looking at the Valerian steel as as like a resource that they would want to have more of to be able to use in wars they're actually fighting. So I guess I, what the I'm saying is normal swords work just fine. And they've also had peacetime now for a staggeringly long time. Yeah, I guess, well, that's also true. But um, I, I, plus, I don't know. it keeps I your king I, safe. Yeah, it's, but but yeah. that's I, I, the thing I was about to say though is that like we don't really ever hear about other Targaryen kings wearing this right like it, it kind of just come it's like they, they it's like they pulled it out of a storage closet where it's been for like two hundred years right like they're, they're acting like it hasn't. Well, been it's probably worn on sometime. display or kept very safe somewhere. But the the fact is, remember that's the armor that belongs to the guy who essentially crafted this kingdom as it stands. Yeah. I just don't, I don't think they would melt it down. <laughs> You'd have to have, I think if anyone did, it would be seen as a, a pretty bad thing to do. An insult, yeah. Um, so yeah, he's, uh, he's sporting it because he's intending to fly out on Sunfire, and uh, Laris is on his way in, and he says, I think it would be a benefit to us all to prevent our king from being brutally slain by our enemies, and his body parts scattered to beasts, and his court come to ruin, don't you agree? To his um, king's guard. Which then is not the argument he gives him for why he shouldn't go on out on Sunfire, which I find fun about the character, right? Like, he knows how to strategize, knows how to manipulate. He says that um, there are rumors that maybe you're uh, going out to sort of support your men, and uh, it's a very righteous and courageous thing to do. There's also rumors that you're being outwitted by your counselors and persuaded to fly to war so that Alicent may reign in, absence, in your absence with Aemond, which uh, appeals to his insecurities just enough that puts him off the idea of actually going out. Which, she, again, is just another example of Laris's sort of uh, puppet He's strings being pulled. He's a clever guy, and it's, and it's still in a place where we don't quite know what his, uh, his ultimate goal is. Well, I think it's because we do jump a little sometimes, but I think uh, it's worth mentioning here that from what we know of the future, I think Laris is figuring out what he wants in real time. We're watching it. He's uh, seeing what control he has, what power he can have, where he can climb up to, and uh, from that we'll probably figure out where he wants to sit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was kind of interesting to watch because, again, the performances are so strong that you can see Aegon is like, it's my decision to go out there. Now it's my decision to not do it when it's not at all his decision. It's always dependent on what other people are saying and thinking about him that makes him. He's, he's, he's just insecurities is who Aegon is. Which again, if you were to draw it back to any individual as to why he is that way, who would it be? I, I no would idea. say 
probably his mother, right? In terms of his general attitude and the hurting correct. Do you think? Yeah, I would say it's Allison's fault that he's a completely worthless human being. <laughs> and then I say that uh, obviously hyperbolically. Uh, he's she has not given him the tools to deal with like any of this. Which is funny because in a way that would be maybe one of the tools she might have taught him, but even by accident, you'd think, right? Like how to spot being manipulated. But then again, she spent so much time manipulating him herself that she probably wouldn't want him to have that tool. It it feels very much like she gave up on him. Yeah. Like more so than any of her other children. She just gave up on Egon. And he sees this as quite a um beneficial bit of knowledge, by the way, and so promotes Laris to Lord of Whisperers, or Master Whisperers, I think, right? So, not a bad role, which uh, the, the line I appreciate about it is he said that his father never saw use for one, which totally sounds like a Viserys thing. Like, why, why would I want someone whose design is just spies and secrets and yeah. manipulations? It's shady. Yeah. But uh, I think even some of the smartest, wisest kings would have a Master of Whisperers in this universe just because you oh. need information. It's kind of funny, though, um, because, like, sophisticated espionage networks were a fairly late development, historically speaking. Like, you don't really see them cropping up until around the 1600s, I don't think. Mm. Like, before That's because that they were point, really good. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't know. I guess know. so. Like, they just burned all of their, all of their documentation, every last uh, scrap. No, they didn't, they didn't even write it down. No, they're such a keep it in their heads. Um... Yeah, then we get a scene with, I want to say, is it Ulf? He talks about how he's actually of uh, royal bloodline. He's a bastard. And uh, in retrospect, now we know exactly what this scene is for, because we're going to be dealing with dragon seeds later. At least that's what they're called, anyway. Uh, people who might have the potential to ride dragons because of bloodlines in relation to Targaryens and, I guess, Valarians. This is somewhere where I'd have to know more from source material, but I don't exactly know how all that'll turn out, but we get a bit of information on him. It, it seemed like uh, as best they can while he's hanging out with his friends. He's just talking about how his uh, lineage leads that way. And I think he's got a bit of white in his hair, but the argument, I think, from the friends is just that he's, he's old anyway, or old enough that that would be not considered anything weird. Um, the other characters that relate in that way of a bloodline like have i think we see um alan is trying to hide his hair with you know wearing shit on his head or or, or cutting it all off yes um but yes we see aegon coming in because he celebrates oh yeah i kind of missed it in the earlier scene but his king's god implied that they don't care about the chastity or much of anything else and aegon did not seem it seems like Aegon's figuring out exactly just how much he wants them to be behaving fully or not. Yeah. And after his conversation with Laris, it looks like he's gone back to the whole, like, oh, fuck it, let's just go out, have fun. Um, And uh, sort of a neat touch in terms of just the sadness of this world is he's Aegon is served by uh, the girl who he, uh, he raped in season one, who got the moon tea and paid off to leave by Alicent. She's now here and they don't even, um, they don't make it, like, obvious or clear, uh, as, like, pointing out exactly who she is. A lot of people didn't recognize her, but yeah, she's, that's Yeah, when we were now. watching it, I was like, I have seen that person before, and I was racking my brain on, where the fuck have I seen this woman? Exactly. And, yeah, just to have it so casual that Aegon has obviously completely forgotten her entire existence, the, uh, the damage he causes to so many people. I have to be careful with the visuals on this next scene, because there's lots of cock which is uh, welcomed by a lot of people. Wait, there's lots of boob too, but you you only pointed out the the pee pee. There's really not lots of boob. There should be. Yeah. Is there not? <laughs> no. <laughs> and I shit you not, people have complained about that. It's like, I don't watch this to it see very, penises. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a very blatant uh, fellatio occurring. Is uh, a bias. There is there is a bias. Um. So yeah, we'll just I'll roll it back, but. We still got to talk about these scenes because they're quite interesting. Aegon discovers Aemond with Sylvie and laughs at him because that was the first girl he ever slept with uh, as of season one and then has, has sort of been with her. And we went over before 
they had a prior scene where he's clearly with her for a hell of a lot more than sex. It's a, it's like a lack of connection, intimacy, and a sort of motherly love that he's trying to get from her. And um, makes fun of him excessively, but the notable element is that Aegon's like the only one that's laughing. All of the the men around him are very much like afraid of Aemon. Yeah, they were not laughing at him. No. <laughs> it's uh, interesting. And it's... Uh, it's it, it, we we said when we were covering episodes one and two that the scene we had prior with with Aemond is effective until you get this scene, which kind of replaces it and makes that one a bit more superfluous because this one achieves the same thing and more. Where it, it, it seems like a a really important moment of instead of being laughed at and walking away to try and you know figure out what he's going to do as a form of getting back at them in any way, shape, or form the people who bully him. This time he's sort of just decides, nah, fuck it, this is who I am. Uh, with his, with everything on full display, which is funny because there's always been conversations in the A Song of Ice and Fire shows as to, you'll find some people say all of the nudity was completely unnecessary and gratuitous. But what it, what is necessary nudity, you know what I mean? In, in like, stories, when does it... Yeah. It's like, how do I, I really, it? I really don't like appeals to necessity in terms of storytelling because, yeah, figuring out what exactly is necessary for a story to do whatever it's trying to do is an extremely tall order, and it's often not going to be, it's not going to be possible in a coherent sense, especially not in aesthetic considerations like this. Like some show, some shows want to be more crude about things, and they're allowed to be. Whether or not they should be is a question that you're going to have to debate in a way that's going to be hard to properly settle. That's fair. Um... This came up, well, this comes up all the time. One of the things that bothers me in a lot of these shows is when characters have sex fully clothed, I'm always like, that's retarded, oh. stop doing that. And mm. someone could be like, oh god, if you want to see naked people, go watch porn. That's always the argument, and it's like, that's not my point at all. I don't care about seeing naked people. It's more so you're yanking me out in the same way that uh, any inaccuracies or dumbassery in any way, shape, or form about operations in any other way can can do that. And so vice yeah, versa. Yeah, me out of the scene. Someone else could be sitting next to me being like, why do I have to see a fucking fully naked guy? Why can't they just film it so that you can't see that sort of stuff? And I'd be... I've always been of the perspective of like, I guess, I guess I'm trying to figure out where I would decide that it's gratuitous. But this is an example, this scene of um, it having, at least to me, a lot of reason. If Amond is supposed to be in this scene coming to terms with the fact that he is who he is, all of his elements that he gets made fun of, his inadequacies or uh, disabilities in any way, shape or form that those are things that at this point he's come to understand are him and he's not interested in feeling shame about them anymore then him standing up in front of all of them completely naked and saying do whatever the fuck you want and leaving like strutting out to me is very uh good visually of representing that that uh, journey in, in in favor of his character and if someone said like yeah but i don't want to see his cock i'd be like does that why, why don't we... look yeah, <laughs> it's just, yeah. like, it's just, don't it's... look pervert why should you know you know why he should would the have filmmakers... a visible one in that scenario why should the filmmakers be subject to your lack of desire to see a cock like <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> i guess that's where i'm at i'm just like it's kind of funny i don't know it's it, i feel like it it makes a good point but um if you can't like I don't know what else to say. It's just like I guess you know we have ratings for a good reason, right? If you don't want to ever be witness to something like that, I guess avoid anything with uh, high nudity ratings. But yeah, I wouldn't want to get into censorship conversations about how we can't be having that. You should have filmed him from the waist up. We'd be like, eh, we're fine. It's fine. It's good. I think it's he a, was filmed from the waist up. He was also filmed uh, from the waist, from down, the waist well. down simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you don't want to look, if you don't want to see a dong or two, then don't look at it. You just don't. You well, just look at his face. If you don't want to see a dong or two, don't watch HBO. So yeah, the, I mean, the you know. purpose of it is very clear. I mean, also, that, after the whole him emptying his, uh, or just sort of uh, talking about all his past trauma, and then just being embarrassed and berated, and then just unashamedly walks out. Like you were saying, he is who he is, and he's not hes not going to be embarrassed anymore. Like, fuck it. Yes, I would have just so. helicoptered that bitch. Hell yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's not to say that there Put wouldn't be the a room. scene where I might come to the conclusion that it was unnecessary slash gratuitous. It's just that, uh, I don't know. I, I, I certainly haven't come across it in House of the Dragon yet. When, when, you, when, when you enter like a brothel and you see naked people, I'm just like, yeah. This is where they would be. And, uh, this is where the naked people live. That's yeah. the avenue. Yeah. <laughs> this is where they this is their what it says on the tin. This is their... um, 
More like the, a bro the, the nudity is not just, <laughs> it's not for the audience there. It's for the people making fun of them. It's like, it's almost like a fuck you. Like, you know, there I is. am who I am. And I'm walking out. Watch this. This is a symbolic gesture of how much I don't care about what you fucking think. There is storytelling value. And that's what, that's what yeah. we're here to talk about. Uh, so now that the kid's gone, Rhaenyra's uh, packing away the toys and tearing up. And I think that we're supposed to take from this, of course, that it's a bit sad that everything is falling apart as a result of everything that's happened. She's had several conversations with Rhaenys, there's the council, there's all these efforts, and obviously she's coming to conclude, is there any way we can maybe not have the war? That would be nice. And she spots that she still hasn't read the uh, message she got from Alison after um, uh, uh, Luke got eaten. So, um, decides to open it up. We will come back to her in a moment. But for now, uh, Gwen, not taking much of anything seriously, is riding off with some of his men to go to uh, a tavern to just have some drinks, uh, setting up for when they're going to be raiding whatever they're doing in the um, tomorrow morning. And he, he doesn't take Cole seriously at all. He's like, I don't think it'll matter that much. If that's what we do, we'll join up with you. It's whatever. And we do get a, a moment of Cole looking into the sky, and they're, obviously they're completely exposed on like a field. Then you can just see in the distance a uh, black spot sort of moving that's kind of dragon shaped, <laughs> which is probably not good. Um, and again, uh, yeah, they, they obviously get terrified pretty quickly to start uh, riding for the forest line. And uh, people brought up, I think, that it was, it was disappointing that she would be able to spot them from that far away. But I think the show does a good job of showing you that it's not. Bela that spots them, it's actually Moon Dancer, her dragon, and then it signals to her. And she looks Moon over Dancer's and then she's kind of a gay name. You see from her POV, it's kind of a bit reflective something down there. Yeah, she you know? so uh Moon Dancer signals, she looks over to the area and then she sees a reflection on one of their armor. So it's to me that's that's justification fine. I don't I don't see it need any more than that. It's um and I, I can buy totally that the dragon's vision is gonna be really effective. Yeah. yeah, I can believe the dragon. And what else are you going to be doing? You know, that's her job. To see what's up. Well, interesting you say what that. Is... Her job, according to Rhaenyra, was to simply keep an eye and report back. But she goes in mm. pretty close with this one. He does. I, uh, the, uh, the thing to discuss is whether or not she was thinking about uh, burning them all. Which, um, man, would have... Oh, she was thinking about it. it just you, you think if she had successfully killed Cole there, I wonder how much that would have changed about everything. That would have I been think very the interesting. would have changed a lot because Cole proves to be uh, quite effective in terms of just plowing through uh, the Crown Lands, right? That's yes. that's where they are. Yeah, he, he he proves very effective in doing that. So who knows how well it would have gone uh, if he was dead? Makes you think about all of the half measures everyone is like mm -hmm. always taking. Mike Trout mm -hmm. like rolling in his grave <laughs> watching this show. <laughs> no half measures, Walter. Now I'm just imagining Mike on a dragon. Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> Imagine um, landing in front of Sir Simon Strong and walking in like, here's what you're gonna do. <laughs> oh, now I'm just imagining him landing in front of Walt. We had a good thing, you <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> oh, dude, see, now I'm... Because I could totally imagine it being Walt is on the dragon, threatening to kill Mike, yeah. and he's just shouting oh, at Mike's him and his dragon, not yeah. giving a fuck. Like, yes. but if you're gonna burn me, burn me, you stupid dick. <laughs> Let's just get on with it. <laughs> uh, but yes, the they narrowly escape. She uh, loses track of them. And Gwen says, a good showing, Sir Kristen, I am in your debt. He looks fucking terrified after that. And um, you can tell uh, Cole is distinctly unimpressed with him. Uh, which, which I quite like. It's, um, it's very likely that Alison would have told Gwen to just, you know, that Cole is not impressive. Which he's not particularly impressive when it comes to the politics side of things. He's obviously but... a piece being moved around the board. But in this scenario, yeah, he, was, he came through completely and kind of embarrassed Gwen. Well, the thing is, is um, we know that it was something that was kind of made clear in season one, is that Cole, out of all of the people who was eligible to get picked, he was the only one who had actually been involved in in, yeah. in combat. He's he's more ground level uh, compared to a lot of these other people who are more like in just tournaments and stuff. And so you get a bit of proof there, and I think yeah, it's uh, it's going to change how Gwen 
thinks of Cole, which is... Uh... Yeah, it kind of instantly changes the dynamics, which is kind of uh, interesting to see. So then, back to the Black Council, and we have the information being passed on that Cole is moving, and uh, he's, uh, th th there's, there's a bit of back and forth about what, you know, what, what the move's going to be, considering this. And of course, we're still at the point of Rhaenyra just not truly deciding exactly what action she wants to take. Um, and yeah, we're, the the general assumption here that that's getting in the way is just not knowing what Damon is doing. He's uh, and and it's kind of like a really important story point because it does come up, I think, in the next episode. He's not letting anyone know through Ravens exactly what he's doing at Harrenhal. And I think on one hand, yeah. you might assume, oh, so he doesn't want them to know. And it's like, I think he hasn't decided. I think he doesn't know. Yeah. He doesn't know what he's doing yet. The moment he sends a message, he commits to what he wants to actually do here. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah and also cause... there's an element of, yeah, like if he sends messages, it's it's almost like he's not giving up control, but being like, oh, if I'm sending, if I'm reporting to someone, it means that. I have someone I need to be reporting exactly, to. Exactly, that he's in deference to yeah. somebody in this case, Rhaenyra, which he hasn't made up his mind yet on whether that's what he wants to do. And so speaking of Hall, we get the closest thing to comedy in this show of Damon staring at the ceiling and watching droplets of water hit his head and shit, which I find funny, but at the same time it is like, yeah, this, this show doesn't have a lot of room for any kind of levity. In fact, Simon Strong is probably the biggest source of it, as a character anyway. Yeah, but this this begins Damon's hallucinations, visions, whatever they may or may not be. I assume we're going to get an answer more definitively on what they are by the time the season ends. Um, and the first thing he properly sees is a young Rhaenyra, played by uh, Millie Alcock, is her name? Yeah. She's, uh, she's back, which is kind of neat to see. And she's sewing the head of Jaehaerys back on, saying, oh, I always have to image. clean up after you, which, um, that alone, man, just that handful of seconds and Damon's reaction of his eyes tearing up, the amount you can pull out of that in terms of what exactly he's thinking and feeling. Um, first and foremost, I think he thinks that uh, Jaehaerys, what happened with that, was definitively a mistake, to the point where it sits on his mind significantly. You can't deny the fact that it was bad for the war effort, right? But simultaneously, I think an aspect that's not necessarily talked about as much is that he's obsessed with the Targaryen's, you know, bloodline. And uh, he had one killed, right? The mm, Kinslayer yeah. aspect is obviously shameful, but especially from his perspective of you are one of the things that is damaging the Targaryen sort of legacy right now. And then there's the damage he does to Rhaenyra herself. Uh, and, and what his role is with her constantly. Uh, that was their big fight before he left. How much does he actually only care about himself? I think that's getting further explored in these scenes as well. This is kind of what I mean about these, um, these hallucinations. You could probably talk and speculate about them indefinitely as to what they mean for him going forward because you're getting so much more of him personally, him vulnerable than you ever would in normal scenes. And that's kind of like why these sorts of explorations are useful. When you have a character like him, you have to do it this way because he wouldn't normally be this vulnerable with anybody. Yeah, he wouldn't open up. No. He barely even opens up to himself. Yeah. Sometimes you just need a spooky castle for a bit of introspection. Yeah. And who knows what these great scenes way of... might end up meaning once we get more context on the story that is of Damon Targaryen slash the whole show. It's also a great way of reintegrating the younger cast in a way that makes sense, and it's not just like a cameo. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, like that was uh, that was neat. There's an, actu see. there's an actual psychological component to the fact that he is constantly seeing her as a as a child. Yes, that's, that's how he thinks point. of her. Yeah. Oh, and then he uh, he teleports next to the weirwood tree and sees uh, Alice Rivers telling him, you're going to die here, which, you know, not the nicest thing to hear, I guess. Pretty ominous. So uh, we'll see if, what that's going to mean eventually, I suppose. But we're back with Rhaenyra and our favorite character discussing what they plan to do next in relation Otto's to... Otto's not missing. What? Uh, I know, I know. Nor is Simon. 
I was about to say, where is Simon? Is he safe? <laughs> Uh, they basically talk about what the plan is because Rhaenyra wants to talk to Alison about making peace, I suppose. Uh, and they eventually conclude what has to be the stupidest fucking plan in the history of this show, hopefully now and forever. I hope, I hope this is the stupidest thing that ever happens. There's a lot to talk about. I'll just broadly summarize. Uh, Rhaenyra's plan is to sneak into King's Landing and to speak with Alison while she's praying about how they should totally have peace now. Let's stop the war war, silly. Um, there's, 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 does anyone want to begin? Because there's about 17 things we need to talk about as to why this is well, a stupid we plan. Well, let's maybe we should start with the execution first. How does she, what is the plan for her actually getting physically into King's Landing? How does she get to the meeting? Well, uh, is that we not do the logistics jumping ahead? First. Would we not first um, talk about the decision uh, yeah, I... <laughs> to do this? You know, not, uh, yeah, not even execute sure the plan, that. just the idea. So, uh, uh, this is... I mean, right from the get-go, you are removing yourself from anybody's even knowing where you are for some amount of time. Uh, potentially a really long time if something goes wrong, and you're just like, hmm, okay, doesn't seem wise, especially at this point in time. I'm not against the idea of, like, the two highest authorities coming together to stop uh, more bloodshed, but it's way too dangerous. To uh, Allison is not the highest authority. Mm -hmm. That's part yeah. of the problem with this. Is uh, it's it's in conception, right? So let's just say she says, "I wish to speak to Allison." Be like, "Why?" Because I want to end the war. It's like, "Oh, you can't with that." It doesn't matter what you and Allison decide. You wouldn't be ending the war by convincing her of any particular position. Oh, the right. only okay. one. What is Allison? You're just gonna say, "Hey, let's stop it," and she'll be like, "Yeah." And then well, that's the thing, right? Castle. Let's hey, entertain. Oh, oh, let's entertain. You can mind control her. The war doesn't end. No, of course yeah. not. The only like thing Rhaenyra could do voluntarily that would end the war is renounce her claim, and even that wouldn't necessarily end the fucking war. Yeah, but that's I mean, the closest you could get. If you have anyone with half a brain on your team, uh, renouncing your claim would just mean that they're going to want to still eradicate you in case you ever try this shit again. Like I think the threat of dragons means not necessarily. Well, but... so you, I don't, I don't agree with that. Like they could easily just try to kill you, uh, sometime in the future without your, like, so you know, assassin and... style thing. Oh, well, I was about to say, like, without uh any knowledge of like an actual war taking place, cold or hot, whatever. Like they'll they'll just. We're dealing with Aegon, Aemond, Otto, all of these people who are well known to be very fucking ruthless, and with all the things that have already happened, why do you think you should ever feel safe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dragon or not, they can just send someone in to kill you at some point. Like, it's it's always going to be a potential. And this very you know, someone could be done. like, you know, without a tongue, or paid to never give away who's hired them. Blah, 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 blah. Like, you'll never, ever, ever live safe. This is one of the things that always happens in these situations is you'll never be safe. You've got to wipe out the entire line. Yep. So, point being, this, 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 if she had a fucking a set of people to discuss this with, let's say an intelligent advisor, they would tell her this is insane from the get-go. We're not even going to entertain planning this because there's nothing you can gain from it. So with that out of the way, <laughs> by the way, uh, Bessaria is able to facilitate this whole thing. Uh, remember, useless old Bessaria who can't help at all in any way, shape, or form is willing to facilitate you, the queen of one side, being sent into the belly of the beast, essentially alone. She's got a king's guard with her, but all he has is a knife. He doesn't have his armor. You know, of all the people to know about this plan, if you chose one, probably shouldn't be her. Yep. IMO. Be the worst. <laughs> in fact, you could say this is incredible information to give to her, and she now has so much leverage she can end the war. She was in a prison cell last episode. Yeah, but it's already like that <laughs> nice fast now. track to the idea of nah, she's chill, she's on your team. It's so, so bad, bad man. It's really it it is probably the worst part of this season. And so then it's, it's like that character. Okay, but does someone maybe make a really good argument on her team at least? And you're like, she doesn't tell anybody except Masaria and obviously her King's God. That's the the only people who know. She doesn't say like this the to least anybody. Trustworthy person to yep. tell Meanwhile everybody else is just where is she? Where'd she go? <laughs> Meanwhile there's decisions that need to be made and nobody can make them. Because there's oh. nobody who's the second in command, so you were just on pause 
for some time. Which is disastrous. The Queen has just got- it's, it's worse than her being like, I'm gonna go for three days. She just disappears for three days. Yeah, you don't yeah know she could be like, dead. still have a cause. So that's all terrible. <laughs> yeah. Then there's just the nature of her actually doing all of this logistically, right? Moving from the castle to the docks, and from the docks to the, the King's Landing docks, and then moving through the... the, the you, you need everyone along the way to stay silent, whoever notices anything. Uh, which is already... just There's risks everywhere in terms of being spotted, especially on Dragonstone. People just be like, hey, is that is that is that Rhaenyra? She's just leaving? And she's dressed as a Septon for some reason? A scepter? I don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's very risky, one might say. And then, uh, arriving in King's Landing, you, you know, I, I can buy that people aren't going to recognize her for the most part. It's just, um, you, you got to hide that white hair, which she doesn't do a really good job of. You can see the corners of her, um, her head. But I suppose if you keep your head down, good chance nobody's going to necessarily spot you. But then, of course, there is the question of, once you reach Alicent, what stops Alicent from getting you captured, and her plan is to simply put a knife to her. Um, I know that yes, they make a she's... joke out of it, right? She says, I have begun badly, lol, and it's like, yeah, but that was truly an you awful plan. You started badly, yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's like, haha, that was a bad plan. It's like, yes, and you had time to think about all of this, so why was that the plan? Yeah. You're banking way too heavily on Alicent letting her go afterwards, because obviously she has to reveal herself to Alicent to have the conversation. Yeah. But then right after that, like you, you can't. Well, their um, childhood relationship is not enough to justify Rhaenyra thinking that she can get out there alive. It's crazy to me too, because picture someone standing across from you and they have a knife to your belly. They're not in a way that they're holding you. Just they're in such a way that if you were to deliberately fall backward and then start crawling backward while screaming, they're not gonna be able to get you before someone's gonna turn up. You know what I mean? Right. Like the, this is so beyond incredibly risky that it's uh, I'm afraid downright out of character. It's just um, Rhaenyra has trouble this season with her intelligence, and I think that's another reason why it makes it harder to enjoy her as much as Alicent, because I don't think I feel the same way about Alicent with any of the decisions she's made. Like Alison the, seems really well put together. Yeah. But uh, they wanted to have this conversation. And I think when this was happening, when I was actually watching it, it's like, I get it. I get why everyone would want to have this conversation, of course. But you can't really. You can't just make it happen. Not like this. You got to work harder. It's a thing we've talked about before, but in all very sort of straightforward storytelling, uh, well, stories, when you have a hero and a villain, if you can get them to chat with each other halfway through at some point, that would be good. It's always, um, it could be really interesting, but the amount of ways that it can be terrible or really great, depending on how you write it, is, is, is it, like, it can damage the conversation so much, because this is a pretty good conversation, but they kind of failed at every single aspect of how to set it up. Not like this. Not like this. Um, and I think, you know, we've probably covered most of it, right? Uh, she does let it... The, the, the one aspect I think that I'm okay with is Alicent letting her go. I've seen people criticize Alicent being like, that was insane for letting Rhaenyra go, but considering the nature of the conversation and the sacrifice Rhaenyra made to get here, I can believe Alicent, the person, would decide to let her go. I think so, too. I don't, Absolutely. I know that you could be like, yeah, but doesn't Alicent realize she can end the bloodshed by calling out that Rhaenyra is here and ending the war right now? Um, I don't even know that that would end it. Damon would obviously keep it going. Yeah, that Damon would let it go. War because mm. the, the means that like backed her cause to begin with still exist. But they secondly, aren't necessarily um, all going to just give up. As much as people like to say it, I don't think Alicent is evil in the sense that I, I don't think she enjoys, you know, Doing being cruel. Like no, that. I don't. I, yeah. I think she's. Well, uh, the look on her face like all season. It's yeah. Like Laris, you did what? No, she's evil. <laughs> oh, okay. She's a meanie. Alicent hates everything that's going on right now. <laughs> Pretty much. She is. She was, she was uh, that visual. She was drowning in her own sins. <gasps> the horror. Um, but drowning I do like. Around bath water. I do like how this uh, conversation is put together, right? Uh, Rhaenyra opens with saying, we, we, we used to hang out together all the time, we grew up together, learned about shit together, we know that um, 
There's the, the war is on the way. It's going to be bloody. Those people are going to die. But we we recognize that it's not good, and we're we're not gonna. That's not going to happen, right? We we don't we don't want that to happen. Which um, then leads into basically like a kind of blame game, which I think is inevitable. Uh, it's it's like what Tim's can we come to? And Allison says, "Well, your surrender." And then she's like, "Well, you know, no." Um, the dragons are obviously getting more and more restless. There's, there's blood is on the way. People are getting angry at battle. Teams are developing and stuff. And she says that, um, you know, the, the they start going back and forth about all the major events, right? The murders of the sons or the 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 different um, the assassination attempt. Like it's very much the, the, all the way back to usurping her role, which was uh, de declared by Viserys, which is going to get us to the part of the important part of this discussion, which Rhaenyra still thinks that that was just an outright lie. Alison is still annoyed that no one believes her that what happened that night, and so they get to be more specific. And the words that Alison repeats back from what Viserys says uh, means that Rhaenyra now knows that he was talking about Aegon's dream, not Aegon the his son. And since she's able to talk about it with such a level of clarity, it's pretty convincing to Alicent that uh, Viserys wasn't talking about his son, but instead a story. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the actors really do sell it excellently. This yeah. moment of like, oh shit. Oh shit, yeah. What I really liked as well before that was uh, Alicent pretty much convinced Rhaenyra that Viserys did actually say that Aegon was the heir. And you get to see for about five seconds Rhaenyra thinking about, you know, her dad deciding she wasn't the one, the right one for the throne. Uh, but then, yeah, there's just she keeps explaining, and they sort of have a back and forth. And then uh, there's like this pause, and then they both realize the entire war is based on Alison misunderstanding the series. Yeah, yeah, no. it's because she's evil and stupid and dumb, and I hate her. I mean, that's the <laughs> that's an interpretation. What's uh, I found kind of interesting about this was some people pointing out what would have happened had Allison said that he reaffirmed Rhaenyra. Do you think? Um, I mean, as we saw in episode nine, they may still well uh, have gone ahead with their plan. It is curious because they clearly had schemes afoot, but yeah. I don't know how it would like what. It would, it would have been weird. I guess they I guess would have had to block have out to Allison. Allison. Either block her out or tell her, like, sorry, you gotta, uh, you gotta fall in line on this one. But it would have been curious. If Viserys had died the night that uh, Rhaenyra and Daemon were there, maybe even in front of everybody, you know, like, all these yeah. years, like, what would happen then? But, yeah, obviously the that question is yeah. whether or not Alicent made that mistake, I wonder if the war would have happened anyway. It's, it's hard to say. To know definitively, um, but yeah, you know, you get a lot of uh, I think nuanced uh, performances and and uh, dialogue in this scene that sort of represents the both of them, their relationship with the series and the respect recognized between them of of all of that. And like I said, the the conversation is pretty good. It's just how we got it. Yeah. it was, it's not at all something you were allowed to have. Show you have to earn it better than the way you that you did. To get yeah. This, yeah. Because it feels like a sort of a touching of base to realize just how far everything has come and how much further everything is going to go and there's nothing either of them can do to stop it now. Which is essentially what Alison says. She's uh, Cole is marching. It, both of his sons are insane. She even says, uh, you know what uh, Aemond what is. Aemond is. Yeah, which feels as much as a acknowledgement of the, well, rather, of the show to tell us that um, she's essentially given up on Aemond. Um. Yeah. So, uh, and she says, "But there's there's been a mistake, you know. Do do that." Then Alice's like, "There is no mistake. I'd leave right now. Just go." Uh, which is essentially just, "Yeah, I see what I've done wrong," which is gonna weigh heavier on Allison's mind than probably anything up to this point. Um, but there's no stopping it, which I actually do think is fair. There is no stopping it. There's nothing Allison can do. That's kind of the point of the scene. It's both cat. Well. Less Alice and more so Rhaenyra, but essentially both of them realizing, oh, it's over. What a, this delusion that it isn't over, uh, yeah, <laughs> or, or that it can be resolved at some point. Nope, mm -hmm. it's done. Yeah, it's too late. 
And there's um there's an aspect, right? So we know that this show is going to be four seasons in total. Uh, the war can only last so long in terms of all of the major events. A lot of people feel like it took too long to get this thing going and that this episode's ending is the acknowledgement that there is only war. We're finally at that point. When a lot of people criticized it for, I thought that's where we would, we would hit at the end of season one already. So uh, what do you guys have to say about that? I mean, I disagree. Agree. I think I like the idea that there's a lot of um, time and attention that is devoted to the setup of the war, things that happen before the war begins. Um, I like learning more about the characters and what they're willing to do to either accelerate the war or what their plans are for when it happens or to delay it as much as possible. I don't need action scenes and battles and fights to be interested in a show. In fact, oftentimes they're way worse than what we would have gotten otherwise so i understand why people feel it's slow but i just don't i don't mind slower i, I was or am of the position that the the validity of the dithering entirely depends on how they do justice to the presence of dragons in the war which i think episode four does a pretty good job at like, doing justice to the idea that these factions are very reticent to actually commit to this fight because they they have under, they have an inkling of what it's going to entail, and what it's going to entail is pure ruin. You know, throughout this show, I've never gotten the sense from any scenes that, you know, I was never thinking, oh, we're wasting time here. Like, it, 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 there's some flaws in the decision-making when it comes to the writing, but uh, it all... I think is very carefully considered and I do, I am interested in pretty much the entire cast. So I don't mind that we're, everybody gets a little bit of time and, you know, significant plot beats come when they will. And, you know, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not waiting for anything in particular to happen. I'm not going, Oh, where's the next dragon fight? Like whatever, when it comes along organically, that's cool. Yeah. I don't feel like time's being wasted. We're not just doing yeah. nothing. Something's always happening. I'm always interested to learn about the characters, what they do, where pieces are being moved, what people are planning, and how they're doing those plans. Uh, I'm a-okay with it. I don't mind it at all. I think it's a good show. Uh, overall, for the most part. Without, even, you don't have to have violence and open warfare to have a good, compelling TV show. Well, the argument that would be made, yeah. especially as of episode four, is what makes the violence and the battle so effective is all of the uh, prep work that they do in the form of scenes and stuff. I would consider the show a very Here's high grade again. of um, time well spent as opposed to wasted. We've highlighted ourselves as some scenes, maybe certain characters that we believe needs work, lines of dialogue that don't fit as well as we'd like or something like that. But, I mean, as TV shows go, this is, this is up there. It's not... Um, we're dealing, you know, I, I hate to bring it up, but it was it was an easy comparison because of the releases, right? But like, you know, comparing it to Acolyte, where it's just like, Acolyte is barely a fucking TV show. This is like actually properly a TV show that you can have very long discussions about breaking down everything that's happening. Big ensemble cast, a wide array of, of events and uh, things to care about beyond just one idea or something that they're not even nailing properly. Um, but, you know, and gradually trying to include these parts of the conversation as we go, uh, House of Dragons faced a shit ton of criticism uh, for being much lamer than people were hoping it would be. Not episode four, though, which is where we're heading next. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope for the sake of the show, especially with the quality we've gotten, that it isn't um, seen as, like, shit, ultimately, because it didn't have enough fight scenes or whatever, which I, I feel is maligned. Yeah. Or malformed, sorry, as a perspective to have on it. It's um, especially if we've got four seasons in total. I don't want to be, you know, uh, the comparison is often made to the late stage Game of Thrones, where um, as seasons were releasing, even before they came out, some people would be like, "Oh, this season will have this battle, and they're going to build up to this battle." Yeah, which was very much culturally speaking huge, but substantively speaking not very valuable in retrospect, because most people call the end of Game of Thrones at around season uh, five, ultimately. I, I think they'll consider... For episode three, though, considering the power of dragons and this being a civil war between a family, it's interesting to see the Cold War lead up to the war getting hot, you know? 
because it, it is the kind of thing that's like, hey, do we really want to do this? Because we're, we're talking about annihilating each other, essentially. And, yeah, and then episode four is we see the result. I think so. And so, let us discuss episode four then, I suppose. All right, let's do it. It opens with Damon having a little vision once again in the uh, throne room in King's Landing, the Iron Throne main room itself. And he's, uh, he's seeing young Rhaenyra again, who says, You created me, Damon. You're now set on destroying me all because your brother loved me more than you. And he chops off her head oh, after goodness, she says that. Which, uh, yeah, you know. I really pissed him off. Yes. He was um, big mad. I don't even know where to begin exactly with this. You could, again, talk about it forever. The nature that we know everything we know from season one about Damon kind of toying in his role with the, the with family, the power they had, and figuring out exactly what he wanted. He knew he was the heir, and so he got to kind of exercise his power in whatever way he wanted. My take on season one is still that Otto moved him around to prove to Viserys that he's not suitable in court, that he shouldn't be in power, that Damon is a monster, and that that would support the argument that he shouldn't be heir, right? Like, we get the impression that Otto's whole goal in season one was to prove that someone else should take the spot, that Damon couldn't be the ruler, he was going to destroy the realm. Um, and so in each of these roles, proved to be bloodthirsty, aggressive, and selfish. And, uh, Meanwhile, you know, his influence on his family was quite destructive and chaotic, and I don't know that he cared that much until his, uh, his time in season two, where having to face a lot of repercussions of the things that he's done, said, and how he's ended up where he is. A lot of it came from Rhaenyra herself in episode two, but now, in these visions, facing it directly, uh, he had a lot of influence on Rhaenyra when she was much younger, and he kind of helped craft her into the position she was in. It's his actions that forced her into a role of being the heir. He even felt that way when he was speaking to her, but of course he had that insane point of view that it was because Viserys feared him. Uh, but I think he's coming to terms with a lot more of it now, and again, just, I really like these scenes, because it makes me think about all of this stuff. Some of my favorites, yeah. These are flashbacks, and, well not flashbacks, but his dreams. And, um, I mean, what more interesting thing could you do with a character like Damon, who's so much of him is about his image, than yeah. go into his head and explore the psychology behind it and how he actually is processing things? Yeah, make him face all that stuff. Then when he wakes up, they have him uh, with the camera angles reflected, his blood on his hand, and then when it turns around, it's gone, sort of thing. That yeah. was really good. That was really good, cool. Uh, Aaron Hall is spooky. And uh, Simon keeps a appearing at the post of his dreams, right? Waking him up or being involved at the edge of them. I, I wonder if there's something to that or if it's just coincidentally the person who is trying to wake him up, you know, because he's got information or whatever. Doesn't have to mean anything more than that, but it might do. Uh, you know, the curiosity is whether or not Simon is in on this. Uh, I think a lot of people's perspective is he obviously must be, but a lot of other people would say, well, he's just doing his job. And that's what this would yeah, be. Yeah, then he shows up intermittently later, yeah. Which to me is... Every time is, he shows up, it's like, yeah, he's here to do something. To me is evidence of how this... Uh, it, it could be either, because they've set it up very well. It's very clean. And, um, of course, it takes a while for Damon to even acknowledge that something weird is happening, you know? These are just strange dreams. He doesn't need to talk to anybody about them. Or are they? Um, but in any case, yes, his news is that... Uh, the uh, Kristen Cole is taking castles and they're aligning with Aegon underneath it, right? Like, the way it works, obviously, is you take a castle and you say, like, hey, surrender, fight in our army, and you'll be spared. So, just standard stuff. Uh, but still bad news for Team Rhaenyra, including, of course, Mr. Damon at Harrenhal. And uh, he's organized for... I forget his name. It's the... Because you've got Grover Tully as the River Lord, and his son's son is who Damon's going to be meeting, because Oscar. yeah, Oscar, because his They're father both died. Sesame Street characters. <laughs> Grover and Oscar, yeah. It would be cowardly of them to not include Elmo, but you know what? It's fine if that's, if that's <laughs> how it has to go. Fine. Um, Maybe that's the father's name. I guess they don't mention that. that that's probably something people know, but yeah. So, yes, he is the heir, and uh, he's going to 
like Simon is set up for Damon to speak with him. And uh, this would be another example of the actor doing such a great job. If you keep an eye on Simon in the scene, he looks very uncomfortable because he clearly cares a lot about uh, Oscar. And we find out that he raised him. And so obviously introducing Damon Targaryen to him is a bit of a worry. And Damon obviously treats him very you know, rudely, for lack of a better word, because he doesn't give a fuck about uh, him other than what he can do for him. And so, yeah, Simon just looks stressed out in this scene. And I, I like the touches of... Um, he can't quite... He, he sits down awkwardly, the sword is in his way. Uh, Oscar, he's holding himself very uh, sort of nervously in front of Damon as he would be, but it's interesting because he holds a significant amount of power. He's going to be the one that can decide exactly what the Rivermen are going to be doing if uh, Grover Tully dies. So... Uh, which comes up in this conversation. Damon basically says, do you mind putting a pillow on your grandfather so that we can speed this along? <laughs> yeah. Which is just, yeah. But I would <laughs> never! <laughs> well, it, it cuts over to Simon, who's essentially face-palming. <laughs> he's just like, Jesus Christ. Because, like, uh, again, I think he's a lot smarter than he lets on. He, there's nothing he could do here about, in terms of like saying that's rude or that's inappropriate, or whatever. The Damon has full control over Harren Hall to the point where he's kind of dangerous. I assume he has a reputation throughout the kingdom. So it's uh, not something Simon's oh, Damon, not aware of. Yeah, yeah. So they got to be kind of careful with him. Um, but yeah, he basically says your house is kind of useless right now, and uh, instead he's going to go for the Brackens or Blackwoods, whichever one fights for Team Black. Which is like that shows how much Damon even gives a fuck. About any of this, and he says, "Yeah, just summon uh, them." Yeah, and you get a little moment of Simon trying to reassure Oscar. I'm, I'm genuinely curious because, obviously, like I said, we we're recording this at the time. There's two episodes to come out for the season. I don't know how things will conclude with uh, Aaron Hall. I'll be interested me neither. To see it, though. I don't think they're gonna conclude the Aaron Hall stuff this season. I think that that'll probably be season three stuff mostly. But, I mean, also, I don't want to give anything away, really. Well, the way seasons work, right, you, t you tend to tell a story. It doesn't necessarily mean there won't be any more scenes in Harrenhal, but there will be. There's no way they're not going to make some kind of I'm conclusive sure point. Right. Yeah. yeah. Some kind of closure, for sure. And so, next up, we've got Rhaenys talking to Alan, making uh, pretty clear at this point that he is a bastard son of Corlys. Not with that explicit of a language, but she says, in other words, you're able to pick it up. Uh, something that he's tried to hide. Um, and yes, uh, this gets highlighted by her somewhat with uh, Corliss, and it is the, the last scene they're going to share. I'm pretty sure this is the actual last scene they're going to share anyway. Uh, yeah. I'm just trying to make sure there's nothing else to mention. Because I remember finding that there's a future scene in one of the episodes where they are hyper explicit about the nature of Alan and Adam being bastards. And I remember thinking to myself, like how necessary Later that on, one was. Yeah. Because it was the last episode, wasn't it? Well, it's one of the, yeah, the most yeah, recent ones. One of the most recent ones. It's, it's just that it, 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 it came across to me as very um, unnecessary again. It's, it's something they've done a couple of times where they will give you subtle information. You're like, oh, and then they'll make it very explicit in a scene where nothing else is achieved. And so it's like, oh, I guess... That was the scene to make sure that all the people yeah. who didn't pick up on it are make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah, I was like, oh, all right. Then we get Alicent, who is uh, checking out the uh, dragon statue he had fixed for Viserys. And you can even see where it's glued. Um, and it's kind of, you know, after what happened at the end of episode three, you can only imagine everything that's going through her head. And by the way, this is the kind of thing that I think is very much missing from a lot of the terrible TV shows we cover. As simple as Alicent staring at this thing and have reminder. you talking for a long time about what, she, what or all the things she's going to be thinking about and everything that that would represent. Like, is there anything like this that you could think about in terms of um, something they do in like a Disney Star Wars show? Well, in, uh, hey. yeah, in Ahsoka, people stare at, uh, they stare all the time. You like vacantly? <laughs> that, uh, yeah. Distance, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Because uh, I was just thinking to myself, like, even in Obi Wan Kenobi, there's got to be a time where Obi Wan stares at something that's important at some point, right? There's the, got, um, yeah, there's got to the, be right. The bodies of all the the Jedi and the, you know, that. That he's responsible for. 
<laughs> I guess so, yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. Well, I mean, we were talking about this a bit last time where there's just no subtlety or extra layer to the performances. Everyone just, I mean, the writing is to blame for that as well. I mean, everyone just says what they think. There's no like, there's no visuals like that that make you think, you know, she's staring at that statue where you're, as an audience member, are thinking, what is she thinking? Like, it could be a number of different things, and they're deliberately not made explicit. Well, can we, let's just see, challenge mode. Can we come up with six different things she could be thinking about that are meaningful and would be accurate between the six of us? We can take it in turns. Uh, well, I guess the obvious one is she's very much thinking of Viserys and her personal relationship to him. Um, how complicated that was and how she thinks of what her role in all this was being set up by Otto, being his wife and running the kingdom and, you know, her, her personal role in, you know, kingdom stuff. Um, but there's also the implication that she's thinking of better times, not just when she was younger and everybody got along, but when everyone got along at a broader political level and people weren't at each other's throats and uh, things were just kind of relatively smooth, especially compared to now. Um, let me see. Well, like, Obviously, like three of the possible explanations of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought I thought it was. I thought the point was that everybody picks one thing from the scene to uh. Yeah, Rags did two, so now we got to come up with seven in total. But he's not allowed anymore. Oh boy. Because okay. <laughs> yeah, um... of yeah. Hmm. Anyone is welcome to go next. I think also the maybe the idea of keeping up appearances, appearing strong, even though you're severely hindered, like in the Allison's case, and she now has this knowledge, this sinking feeling that, oh, he really wasn't talking about my son, was he? But she needs to project this image of still being the rightful queen. I guess that's one thing that I would pitch. Sure. I feel like pretty much in any scene that she's in, she's contemplating like how far she's fallen. <laughs> I think it's a matter of she, like, I, I think it kind of varies throughout the season, her awareness of like what kind of person she is. But uh, I feel like it's kind of omnipresent, a discontent with who she is. And, and the uh, I think inability, like a frustration with her inability to really change anything at this point, like a powerlessness. Yeah, whereas you is could it... say that this is representative of back in the day, she had the power to change almost everything with a kind notion of simply fixing a toy, arguably. But That's this... what got her in the door. Yeah, and, and I would say another thing that I find easily represented by that particular statue is Viserys was the glue that kept House Targaryen together. Oh, and, uh, hey, I like that, yeah. She mm -hmm. was the one that gave him somewhat of the strength for that. But it was simultaneously something she acknowledged in season one being kind of a deceptive move, right? Like the whole plan of from Otto did how much like we talked about it before, but how much of her love for him and his love for her was genuine versus almost like artificial? And then uh, was that move genuine from her to him? And then how much of a, an effect on history did it have? And uh, what effect does it have today, which I think is summarized by her then dropping and breaking that statue? It's, um... That statue is really having a rough time. Yeah, but like, I think, I think that's probably proof enough of just how much you can draw out of one image. Uh, mm -hmm. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. I think that we probably came close to at least, I don't know, five hundred there, <laughs> something like that between us. It's. Uh... And, and I well, love I it. would say there's uh, there's another right. There's the uh, the foreshadowing. Oh yeah, of course, hundred percent. Right. Uh, but I mean, we, we're not. I, don't, I think the part of the assumption is we we all recommend this show, and so it's worthwhile probably to see it before necessarily checking out our breakdowns of it. But uh, yes, especially that one of the dragons in this fight is going to suffer a significant uh, wound to its wing. So it's uh, I don't know suitable, I guess, that it not only was repaired at the wing but break, breaks again at the wing. 
Um, there's a little bit of, uh, more of that later as well in terms of symbolism, but yes, it's... A lot of symbology and broken wings as an idea. It's, uh, right. what else can you say, you know? And it's like, how do they achieve all that? It's like, well, it's all those fucking scenes of people talking in rooms. I'm not kidding. That's what, that's what builds all this up. Yeah. Now you can have the it The fact that something can be broken and glued back together, but it is still fundamentally broken and Change. the glue is, is very apparent. Like, you can tell it's... Mm -hmm. There's a fracture there that will not go away. In any case, we move on, and uh, Maester Orwell, or Orwell, I can't remember how they pronounce it, but he, uh, he's got some moon tea. Because, of course, Alicent needs to provide the moon tea to some girl. Some girl is going to need this. Some right? naughty girl. And uh, he's like, oh, yeah, just, you know, let me know if any changes need to be made, because it has to be brewed pretty specifically. And she's like, yep, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to get it to the girl and to make sure... I'll make sure that no, it's for a friend they... of mine. <laughs> yeah. Make sure oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's for my friend. Yeah, I'll tell my friend. It's for my whore friend, not it, for well, me. It's, it's funny, because he clearly is just like, you sure? <laughs> you, <laughs> you, it's, a, it's a moment I think of him being like, we both know I know, right? <laughs> so yeah. we, do, we don't need to, but okay. Yeah, Am I fine. supposed to know? Are we okay? Like, what's going on here? I'm just not going to hear an argument from me. <laughs> I'll just go pray or whatever I do. And so she <laughs> asks him what is to be considered a pretty fucking awkward question of... Uh, uh, do you believe Viserys wanted Aegon to succeed him? Which and he gives it, about diplomatic answer possible well, just, because before even answering it, it's such a like. Why would don't ask me that? Is this a, <laughs> is this a trick? Yeah, like why are you saying like I got this to like me? I got candles to light. Go away. Yeah, <laughs> you got your abortion tea. Now I gotta go do busy work. Right, basically, <laughs> his answer is a much more eloquent. I don't know. All right, bye. <laughs> he never See mentioned ya. it to me. Bye. Yeah. I gotta go do maester stuff. Yeah, there's just so much maester stuff, you'd never believe it. <laughs> Man, boy, am I busy these days. And uh, Mondays, am <laughs> I right? this All this maester stuff. All this maestering. Now, uh, then we have uh, the Black Council again, and there's an interaction here that kind of summarizes part of my issue with, I think this is with the writers rather than the characters. You have uh, Bartimus says, you know, what is Cole's heading? And you have, it's difficult to say, but there were signs of an army moving northwest, I believe. And Gorman Massey says, she believes you should have burnt them when you had the chance. And then, uh, uh, Gisaris says, perhaps you can, Sir Alfred, when you next sight them on your dragon. And it's, it's such a, like, the show believes that was a good response, but for me, I find that a bit unsatisfying. The, um... The Targaryens are incredibly lucky to have dragons, and that's kind of the point that that guy was making, right? It's like, you had a chance there to wipe out one of their leaders, and you didn't, which is the same criticism Yeah, well, your Rhaenys parents got. should have been different. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, well, maybe <laughs> next time when you have a dragon, it's like, that's it. I don't. And if I did, I would have made that choice. So what is what point are you making? And uh, there's kind of, I, I think, like I said, I think it's a gap in the writer's perspective. I think the writer thought that was a, that was a good response. Like, yeah, fuck you. When um, I don't enjoy in this show the lack of criticism the Targaryens get for being so fucking high and mighty when they literally lucked into the bloodline they have, and that's it. Yeah, maybe I, you I get should fearing have been the protagonist, them, fucker. And I get I mean... uh, respecting them too. But when it comes to the way they operate, right? And I think part of the show is doing this, is being critical of how they are crap as leaders, a lot of them. But they think themselves the above everyone else. They they were like a lower house of Valeria, though. I think they were like sheep farmers, and they just they happened to be the ones who ended up sending people with dragons to Westeros. What does that have to do with what I said? Well, I mean, it's not just lucking out with the bloodline, like because they, they there were Targaryens that did, like I mean, Aegon the Conqueror being the guy who conquered Westeros, you know. That would still be luck. Aegon, that, that he... Aegon himself did those things, not them. They're his future generations. Oh, yeah, you're talking about, yeah, okay, these people specifically. I thought you meant all Targaryens. It's always just they lucked into that bloodline, and I was like, well, I mean, not exactly. Well, all of them do luck into that bloodline. Yeah. But but the bloodline didn't always mean something, is what I meant. Well, no, it, it would have meant exactly what we're talking about now, which is access to dragons. Like, whenever they, however far you want to draw back yeah, that access, which isn't really relevant to this show, uh, is going to be still relevant to the point being made right now, which is, in this scene, 
the council members are being critical of the decisions these people are making with their dragons, and the response is, yeah, well, you don't have dragons. Which yeah, is uniquely like, unsatisfying. <laughs> it's like, I mean, yes, yeah, I know. They don't. That's not, that's not fun for them, is it? That they're at your mercy just because you've got dragons. Yeah. It's kind of a thing that I hope gets explored a bit more. Uh, not that it hasn't been explored, like, not at all, but, you know, that, that feeling of, like, man, so, like, just because you guys got dragons, you're in charge, huh? <laughs> you know, man. Mm -hmm. I wonder how, how everybody feels about that. Though it was nice to see Corliss is back on the having his opinion met on the council. I do yeah, think right. maybe they should have shifted things around such that Callers could have been on the council this season. Before. He has been sorely missed. Yeah, yeah. like I said, just the experience, the intelligence, and the, the nature of his cause being united with Rhaenyra's, I think would have been a better way to have his arguments with the other council members. And, like, just the leading voice, because the council doesn't really... I know that's sort of a point the show is trying to make, but, uh... Once again, we don't have much context in that way, but having also, someone whose voice we can somewhat understand there. Uh, they're in a bit of turmoil because Rhaenyra fucking left without any instructions, as we highlight, so at least that's having repercussions that it should. But secondly, um, they call out Rhaenys for pretending as though she has a more important voice than any of them on that council when she's not named Hand, which I actually think highlights a bit of a problem. Why isn't there a Hand of the Queen? That'd be one of the first orders of business is yeah, to get you'd, yourself one. You'd think, yeah. I don't That's understand a really good question. why it took so long to get a hand of the queen. It's uh, weird. Because uh, acknowledging it is better than not acknowledging it at all, I suppose, because it's they're trying to move it into like a character thing, but I don't think it makes sense that Rhaenyra wouldn't choose a hand. Especially when she's going to leave for three days. <laughs> it's like you're gonna, you're gonna have to have some authority, lady. Doesn't uh, work out as well otherwise. In any case, House Darklin is defeated, and uh, Cole executes their liege lord because he is not willing to bend the knee, and says, you don't deserve to wear the white cloak. It's pretty mean, I think, you know? Cole, Cole's just trying to do his job, okay? I say this knowing full well, as I assume you guys know, Cole is one of the most hated characters on this show. Mm -hmm. Really? Yep. Absolutely Why? hated. There, there are posts about. How, uh, there was one I saw that fucking drove me mad. Where it was like, who, who do you hate the most? Kristen Cole, oh, yeah. Joffrey Baratheon, or Ramsay Bolton? What? That As if ridiculous. there's even That's, like yeah. a competition there. It's insane yeah. how people's brains work with this sort of thing. But for the record, if anyone doesn't know, Joffrey Baratheon and Ramsay Bolton are two of the worst pieces of shit in the history yeah. of A Song of Ice and Fire. And overtly painted to be the worst pieces of shit, like, from the beginning. Yeah, there's nothing like, redeemable about either of them. There's no element of humanity left in them. That's kind of the way they work as characters, almost. Yeah, and neither of them are ever really even given a moment of, Not oh, really. I guess this guy's kind of alright. <laughs> yeah, whereas Cole is given loads yeah, of those like moments. Psychos, right? They're just, like, outright psychos. Certainly Ramsay. Like... Ramsay's practically right. a demon. Uh, Joffrey is pretty much a demon, but the fact that he's a kid somewhat gets you in a position of wondering about his raising, if you know what I mean. But Ramsey's an adult enough, and he practically admits that he just loves causing pain. That's just his whole thing. I mean, it was mentioned earlier, but like, I mean, Kristen Cole versus Damon. It's like, how much does anybody care that Damon stepped on that guy, you know? Yeah. For instance, when he went to the Stepstones, like, nobody cares about that, or what he did to his uh, first wife. Um, or just the like Damon. Damon does a lot of bad things. Very interesting character, but I mean, he does a lot of bad things. Um, it's not like Cole doesn't either. Slamming that guy's head onto the table. That was that was oof. ridiculous. <laughs> that was a big oof. Um, but I mean, there, there's like no way that people are being consistent in terms of their no. like or dislike of characters essentially being tethered to their morality. Um, it's much more vibes, I think, and the the one with with Cola's eyes. It, look, he's a little bitch because he got rejected, and now he's he, you know, like he's big mad about that. What a loser! And that that's that's basically it. <laughs> it turns well, so the <laughs> the thing is with how people talk about Cole, you'd expect his ending will be that of a selfish man trying to cower away from you know the duties he has to perform. Meanwhile, because Fring, you and I talked about this, like if. If you were to guess what his ending would be, because I've got absolutely no context for it, and to be honest with you, I'd prefer he stay in a bit longer because I quite like him. 
Um, at this point, I would assume the story would have to be that he gets to prove that he does have honor, that he gets to come through on his oath somewhat, you know? Like, in the form of defending his men, or winning a particular battle, making some kind of sacrifice. I wouldn't expect at all that his story's gonna end with a, an overtly selfish act, you know what I mean? I'd be surprised no, if it was. Later. I think, uh, especially with the ending of this episode, I don't get the impression that that's even the direction that they're heading in. No, I don't either. And so I'm curious if that's gonna, if, if they do end up giving him some kind of ending that's admirable, if that's gonna, like, make everyone upset, because they'll be like, that was never what that character deserved or something, and I'm just gonna be like, great, so we're gonna have to argue for the fucking rest of time that Cole was actually a hell of a lot more interesting than people realized. I say that, mm -hmm. knowing that, Theo, I believe you picked him as your uh, sleeper favorite for this season, yes? Yeah. I think so. I think that's still the case. Uh, um, yeah, I don't think later episodes have changed it at all. Well, Damon might be sneaking up, actually. That's fair. And so, but over yeah, to Cole's the... Cole's high on the list. Go. Over to the Green Council. One of the, again, just Green Council scenes a banger, so this one is too. Mm -hmm. Something I like about this one is it opens with Aegon just saying, fuck you, and... We have no idea what the fuck the context is. It's just fun <laughs> that it's so chaotic and he's such a obviously bad leader that it's like that's because there's no context where that's going to be useful in, in a council meeting, you know? It's, uh, but yeah, he says, <laughs> uh, he, he's like, we should have sent the dragons. Damon has taken Harrod Hall. I gave you a job and you just sit there. It's your fucking castle to, uh, Laris. Laris. Who's, he says, uh, the castle is more crippled than I am. <laughs> and, uh, it's like to drive Damon to madness as he attempts to make use of it. It's beyond his faculties. It's, it's also penniless. I happily control all of its gold. It's so funny, he completely dismantles Aegon's position, like, immediately and calmly, even though he's on his team, if you know what I mean. He's, he's like, you put me in a position where I'm gonna have to now make you look like an idiot, because you, uh, you just said, like, something stupid. But, um... It's also indicative in that line that he might know more about what's happening at Harrenhal than uh, previously expected. There's speculation on whether or not he and Alice Rivers are aligned. I'd be curious if they were. Don't that would be to interesting. Because... Um, I guess, because we don't really know yet his relationship with Harrenhal's spooky elements, you know? If... They, if, if or, or how... Heron Hall's spookiness sort of manifests to different people based on who they are, on maybe how much well, yeah, it's needed it, from them, or... It does benefit Laris to maintain that it's a spooky place, considering he relies on that as the reason why his family died there. It's it would haunted. be interesting, yeah, if he thought it was total... He thought it was total BS and he uses it, mm -hmm. but it turns out, oh, it really is haunted. It's, it actually is a spooky place. Yeah, he might actually know more about it. He might be aligned with her. It might be that she despises him, actually. Who knows? Who can say? We, we haven't got more information on that just yet. Alice is not an unimportant character. I'll, I'll say that much. Never really see that. <laughs> I, I was going to say that you can get that from the show, so I don't, I don't yeah, know why you said that. I, like, I, I just don't know how much more I can say because I don't want to give away book stuff, you know? You just don't. Well, then don't. Right. <laughs> so all, all you have to do is speculate based on the, the show. It's uh, especially useful, or rather possible, because the show and the book aren't the same as well. Yeah, that's true. Um... But yes, the, uh, I'd say this scene is all about Aegon gradually realizing how much power slash... Power that he doesn't have, but also can't have, because he's uniquely uninformed compared to almost everyone else in the room uh, on almost every subject. He realizes that any of his plans are being ignored, and that a, a plan from C Kristen and Aemon put together is being put in place, which is actually pretty dodgy. Like, Aemond announces the plan to everyone in the room. None of them have any idea what's going on. Uh, which is to take a bunch of castles and then Rook's Rest, which on the surface is uh, like a land plan, is going to block off uh, Dragonstone from support in many different ways. We know there's more to this plan than he's giving away. Uh, it's designed as a trap. We'll get into that a little bit later. But the point for this scene, of course, is that that's laid out and then Aegon is like, you, you've you been, like, plotting behind not only him, but also the council, which you get a shot of them all looking at him, uh, Aemond, being like, man, that's that's bold of you. 
You know, it's like you, it's just because the word treason is uh, hanging on everyone's mind a little bit. This is not something you're supposed to do. Um, and I, I think it creates a really awkward sort of tension-filled moment, but uh, I love the way it's diffused, which is uh, Eamon starts speaking in High Valyrian, which is uh, complicated because we get a strong sense that Aegon is not fluent, but he should be. He is be. not fluent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he ought to be. He ought to know. And but so yeah, he's the he king, comes he's back at him with that broken, <laughs> just like a broken sentence, which is conveyed in the subtitles. It's just like Make it's the contrast it's, between it's, them so stark. Yeah, exactly. It's um, it's like actually such a Chad move to just basically just showcase how much more skilled he is, um, and that that actually just makes him sen essentially sit down because it puts him in a difficult position. Especially if anybody else there knows what they're talking about, which, um, the... The is Maester there, would, for sure. Yeah, uh, say, yeah. People have speculated whether or not Laris would be familiar with High Valyrian. There's a good chance he would be because of his nature as a... He, he like, you know, deals in communication. It's like his whole... There's a chance yeah. he would have learned High Valyrian. Uh, as for the other two, like, uh, Thailand, I don't Probably know if not. he would know it. Probably not. The thing um, is, though, it's really, it's most important to kind of both of them, right? That, like, Aegon recognizes himself yeah. that he doesn't actually know what he's being told, and that he doesn't even know how to reply, and then on a more broad scale, he doesn't really know what he's doing. Um, it's a really, like, cool maneuver by Aemond. Like, immediately establishes how much power he actually has. Yeah, and he puts Aegon in a difficult position because what he actually says is you had more pressing matters to attend to, such as holding court, choosing your subriquet, and naming imbecilic lickspittles to your king's guard. Do you have a wiser strategy, my king? If so, you should voice it to your council. We all await your council, uh, you know, your <laughs> council. Which um, I think uh, the, several of them turn to Aegon after he finishes, so I think that's a sign that they do understand, at least like the maester for sure, like we said. But it's... Um, so well spoken and so straightforward after the accusation almost of treason to then completely flip uh aegon's got to make a decision now either he says i have no idea what you just said even though i'm the king i'm Tar aegon targaryen i i don't know how to speak high valyrian enough to know what you just said so fuck you uh which is way too embarrassing for his already entirely crippled pride that he can instead Assume that whatever Eamon just said explains perfectly why he was plotting behind him and simply agree and be like, sure, man. <laughs> I get it, yeah. Yes, I agree. Uh, his response it's, it's like, is, I can have to make war. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. It's so good, like, to just convey that through the broken subtitles that he, he can't speak it. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, cool and uh, and he looks around the room, and it's just everyone is is embarrassed for him. It's like, hmm. Yeah, well, that just happened. Uh, and yeah, that is definitive. He sits down in shame, and Aegon is just completely defeated in one scene. He's this, all you know, beginning with him aggressively shouting at everybody about how they're doing all the wrong things, to just be, you know, undone in every way imaginable. Everyone is planning without him. He can't do anything, he can't suggest anything. This will all be very important going forward, by the way. People talking in rooms makes further decisions later mean a lot. Just uh, putting it out there. I'm just saying, man, the Green Council meetings, they're top-notch. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, and so Laris gives a visit to uh, Alison, who's not feeling well. Uh, she says it's because she got into too much of the lamprey pie, I think. When uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he just he just yeah, looks yeah, down at the table. And you can see the mood tea. <laughs> <It's> like, um... <laughs> He'd be like, "Can you stop bringing it in that jug?" <laughs> funny that nobody <laughs> cleared that away. <laughs> what happened to discreet shipment? It is kind of funny. Of uh, to be on one hand, yeah, she probably should have moved it. But on the other, it's just it seemed like a moment between the two of them of like, why why do we put up with this sort of lying? It's no point. We both Why know exactly what the fuck's going on. Neither of us care. <laughs> it's like just... Mm -hmm. It's such a... Well, I think Alice appearances. cares, right? It's the Well, yeah, it's the appearances that she does care about, I think. Well, she Nothing's knows... happening as long as I don't admit it. My, my assumption is... Uh, what, I, what I mean when I say she doesn't care is that uh, he already knows that she's doing this. And I think she... Remember, there's the scene in, I want to say, episode one 
where he implies pretty strongly that she know he knows what she's been doing with Cole. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's I guess what I'm saying is like hiding it from him. I guess she's just doing it at this point for pride. A lot of characters do it as well. It's like it's not really necessary. The the lie, you know, just like if 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 you must, and he you know he allows her to have it anyway. But he does say um uh. It is, it's a sin to deny your appetites. They're what make us fully alive as mortal men. Which, um, you know, Laris is uh, he's still a very interesting character. Don't quite know what he's up to. Still keeping his options open somewhat at this point in the story. Uh, yeah, and they just end up talking about what Cole's plan is, where he's up to, and um, her, it's her sudden surge of interest in the histories of Westeros. She's looking into a lot of what's happened here and there with... Uh, different things, and, and I think it's safe to assume she's actually searching for the dream that Viserys would have Song of Ice told her about, yes. Hmm. Which, okay. um, I don't think it's unreasonable for it to be written down somewhere. Um, I'm not sure if it would be findable in this, like, in the castle versus in maybe with the maesters, or at least on the knife, right? But, uh, I'm not sure how much luck she was ever gonna have finding it exactly. Is the writing on the knife, is that a known thing to... The families? Or I don't think that, so. No, no. Is it a secret it's, for that Viserys kind of kept and was, was very selective about? Mm -hmm. It's supposed to only be knowledge that is known by the king and the heir. And so, like, ideally, no one even knows that that knife can be heated up and have a like, story on it if, um, if you're not the king of Westeros or the heir and a Targaryen. Oh, so, here it is. A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin. <laughs> oh, that's weird. It's not finished. Back <laughs> to Luigi's mansion. We have, or Damon's mansion, I should say. He's uh, wandering about, having a little vision, and he spots himself with an eye patch. <gasps> I guess we could play the game again. Imagine what that could fucking mean. What are yeah. all the things that could mean? What is, why would he see what something like that? Why is he looking at Eamon at home? Yeah. <laughs> Low rent, Amond, fake Amond, but uh, I mean, you know, not to actually do a, a, a full set of things. I just the primary meaning probably is going to be that it's uh, he and Amond share. They're, they're like two sides of the same coin. They have a similar sort of role in their families. He sees Amond as the most threatening element of the this war, riding the most powerful dragon, but simultaneously having such a uh, a, a impactful personality. We didn't get a lot of interactions between the two of them. And what I found funny as I was watching a discussion about the two of them on uh, Twitter, or rather reading it, and someone said, like, this is clearly a, a result of the fact that uh, Damon feels he created Eamon, which I was just like, I don't think that at all. I don't even know that there's what? any scenes no, that really support met, that right? even slightly. No, yeah, no, I, don't know about that. I think that's a complete misread. There's nothing there about he's created him. It's just that they, they have become rivals. Uh, they both are the most arguably chaotic slash strongest members of their family that are clearly, they've got underlying motivations beyond just what they represent to uh, the realm itself sort of thing. I think Damon sees a lot of himself in Aemon, yeah. uh, the younger version of himself. The fact that we're seeing... Damon with an eye patch is pretty clear symbolically, I'd say, representative of uh, he's he's like you are me, and I need to defeat you. I know you. I know what you're gonna do. Um, but I think it's safe to say that Damon also kind of is worried about Aemon. He's, he's not sure about him. I don't think he'd ever claim this, but I have to imagine he's kind of scared of Vega with uh, the fighting hard this guy. To yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's gonna be on his mind. This is the biggest thing in his way for winning the war. I would say. Uh, illustrated in the first episode where he said, hey, let's go, me and you with Maelise uh, and Caraxes, we can take out Vega, and she, uh, Rhaenys doesn't go for it. He's not going to attack it himself, which means he doesn't want to 1v1 Aemond, and Aemond enjoys knowing that fact. But uh, this is the biggest hurdle to get over. It is essentially defeating what he sees as somewhat himself, and uh, something that Gary was talking about, and I find it really quite interesting. A lot of what caused what happened with Damon were fiddling around from Otto. Otto was desperate to not allow someone like Damon Targaryen to take over. But uh, with what happens in future episodes, as a result of every decision that's made in all different ways, if Aemond is to be seen as a sort of similar archetype, he is now 
the one that's in control as a result of bad decisions for almost everyone involved. And so you could argue, like, in full effort to prevent Damon from ever rising to the throne, Damon too has managed to make it there, you know? And uh, who knows what kind of results that's going to have. We'll get I to all of that. Right. Take away. He, he just likes the eye patch and he wants one. Yeah, obviously. It's foreshadowing. That's, that's the key, that's the key takeaway. <laughs> but your stuff is interesting too. Yeah, I guess your stuff's okay. <laughs> them both being second sons is a big thing too. Like even Otto is actually like second sons are yeah. are, are often looked at as being somewhat purposeless in like this universe. Oh, well, and they so, get very yeah, I, I think the know, idea ambitious too. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. And then seeing one that's like Aemond is basically me if I was kind of doing all the things that I wanted to do, but I didn't want to because of Viserys. Well, that was a, what was so interesting about. Damon is like he's set up in uh, up to episode five in season one is like oh god where is this guy gonna go and then we find out he actually did settle down somewhat right in, in settling down equivalent to him with uh, Lena mm -hmm. and they had kids and they were kind of happy it was like oh and uh, you're right it's like Aemond is the other version of that story where he manages to actually climb up to near the throne has chances to kill family members slash uh, affect hugely the events of war and you know it's that's why I, I think a bigger part of it is just how much he sees of himself in him and how he needs to defeat him would arguably involve defeating himself somewhat there's so much to take from it it's wonderful though um at the time we were really hoping it would be for serious cuz we were just like i just want him back okay i just want to say hi <laughs> i was kind of hoping to see him and so then he gets his first conversation with Alice Rivers who's uh a bit strange you might say yeah, yeah, she is mm. an odd one. And, um, the conversation he has with her and future ones, they veer into very personal pieces of information, and this is genuinely speculation because so I don't know exactly where it's going to go, but this is actually part of why I don't believe she is there. This is my running theory for now. We'll have to see what happens. Uh, different people believe different things, especially because some people are familiar with the source, so they'll assume certain things based on that but with everything we've seen i tend to treat her scenes as though she is exclusively in his head um and that that's why he's able to talk to her a bit different than he does everyone else is a different vibe for him and her he, uh, like so, some of the things she says i think he wouldn't let people get away with do you think that she has any physical presence at all in the world yes i think she's actually castle? currently with grover tully I think that's what that okay. line was supposed to mean in the latest episode. I think she's currently right. been sent there to look after him, and that she's using her magical flames over there to reach Damon here. Now, that could all be nonsense, but it's just going from the fact that a lot of the dialogue she shares with him... Remember, at this point, she says, are you here because you've been... Um, she says something like, you've been fighting with your wife... Which is not only seems to know very specific information that would be not well known at all, and it wouldn't be well received. I feel like Damon would be no. like, "What the fuck did you just say to me?" Like yeah. that's the kind of thing that you could say if you weren't there, right? Like if you mm -hmm. <laughs> if you weren't actually in his presence, and it would be something you'd have access to if you were in his brain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. A lot of uh, I, yeah, a lot of the way she talks to him, like it seems like it only makes sense due to his psychology in this place and you know all of the weird stuff that's going on with it because um not only would you know a lord not let someone talk to them that way Damon's not letting anyone talk to him in that sort of manner unless mm -hmm. there's something else going on uh i could be completely right. wrong but i'm half expecting in the next episode that she arrives and then Damon is like finally she's back or rather she's back that was quick and then simon will be like huh you know, you'll have a little face to that yeah. to that statement. And then maybe in the final episode, he'll say, um, you know, Harren Hall hasn't been so bad, especially with Alice's company. And then he'll be like, my, you know, my, 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 your grace, she's, she's only been here since yesterday. She's been dead for four, four years. Oh! <laughs> going to roam around Harren Hall in a, and then, and then Hudson's going to punch him in the face and explain to him what's been going on. Yeah. So and then I'm put on his sunglasses. I'm half oh, hoping for, for a payoff like that because of how weird every interaction is with her. Because remember, that was absolutely a hallucination he was in when he met her. 
and then he yes. wakes up in the real world. Like Feels the... like an important clue since, um, I mean, the only people that we see in the hallucinations are, you know, like people who are absolutely not there. Yeah, it's um, good old visual storytelling, one might call it. And she hands him a drink, by the way, and says to drink it, and he looks at it very, you know, the, the attitude of no. And then it cuts to him having drank it, and he looks at the cup again like, wait, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. I find this very curious, as uh, a lot of people said, like, why the fuck is he drinking? He, he already said himself these things could be poisonous. I'm not convinced that's what that's telling us. It's kind of weird. He doesn't seem to be consenting to the drinking, so to speak. Or rather, could like the drinking not even... It might even be a misdirection. I'm not sure. Maybe. Maybe he's being compelled to it subtly. Um... It's just the fact that they show, showed us and explicitly tell us he's not interested in getting poisoned, but then to and show yet. him making this drink that looks fucking witchcraft level, handing it to him, saying to drink it, and he's clearly like, no. And then he does. It, you know what I mean? It's like, eh, I, don't, I don't think this show's going to be that silly. I think they're trying to make a point about something. I but... think so. A lot of this feels deliberate, very deliberate. Almost like it's totally different to the um, the Masaria stuff. It just feels so weird Yeah, to have both of those we'll, in the same show, you know? But we'll see. What is made explicit is that he's at least tempted by the drink. He's too, he sort of leans his head into it, like he's, should I take it? So... It could like deliberately. It could go either way. Yes, it's uh, it's relatively open. Um, but yeah. Then we hear Willem Blackwood saying, "I now rule my house as a regent until my nephew Benjacott comes of age. The Brackens of venal, venal creatures, venal creatures. I think it is, and they must pay for their treachery against laws of gods and men, and against the crown." And then it just cuts over to uh, David, and he goes, "Who are you?" <laughs> <laughs> Which is <laughs> and uh, Simon is like Sir Willem Blackwood of House Blackwood, Your Grace, as I said, like trying to be like, bro, come on, you're embarrassing me. <laughs> it's like, we're doing everything right. David's had a rough night. Yes. Um. So yeah, the obviously he's going to be important for future storylines, but he's uh, somewhat aligned with them. They're they're explaining their goals and stuff, and then you start seeing Lena walking around the room. And she says, um, oh, I think, I can't remember if she says it in this, no, she says it in a later scene. For this scene, I don't think she speaks at all, which, but I do like seeing the, uh, the actors from the past season. Neat. It's, uh, it's, cause it's like, it just shows a level of effort, I think, to get them into the full costume, to have them appear for literally seconds. Yeah, for like 10 seconds, yes. yeah, at most. Oh, um, Yeah. But it's important to remember it. It's striking, and it also makes you go like, oh, hey, it's you, you again. The Absolutely. young you, the different you. You might be dead, like, in real life. Well, not in real life, but in the story real life. Mm -hmm. But you're not, you know, your presence and your effect is not gone. So, uh, back over to a Green Council meeting, and Laris is talking about the uh, nature of livestock and how much the dragons need it. They're, they're mentioning where they can get it from, uh, how their money is doing, and during it, Aegon gets really mad and says, you're all fucking boring. Boring. Which, uh, there's Keep nothing not they boring. can Keep do cool. with that, you know? It's like, yeah. okay. <laughs> we gotta feed yeah, the dragons, I mean, though, boring or not. I guess well, this it, material is a little dry. It's kind of what I like about it, though, is he storms out of the room, and then they immediately continue talking about Buddy yeah, and food and stuff. They're just like, well, okay. Right <laughs> if anything, you're like, oh, I'm glad he's gone. Yeah, probably. I mean, get some work done in here. Um, and so he storms into his room where he finds Allison is moving through his stuff and uh, just showing the state of their fucking relationship. He says, what are you doing here? And then she says, where are your father's books? And uh, he says he got Bad rid of them. Read. And she says, with no thought to the centuries of knowledge of those pages. And what yeah. I liked about this wasn't that he they made him go like goof mode and just go what knowledge or they, he he instead is like I didn't burn them yeah like <laughs> you know like take try to take me at least somewhat seriously please which uh, he's Not been that struggling stupid, with yeah. and uh, he orders his king's guard away and it's just another funny element as they walk into each other as they leave <laughs> there's just lots of little great things like that how. Yeah. Terrible they are as kings, guys. Undisciplined. Mm -hmm. How they don't take their jobs seriously. 
no protocol. They don't train. They don't, you know, practice. So, he has a little uh, conversation with his mumsy and says, they don't care what I think. And it's such a like, it's, it's such a great opening to a conversation, right? You get a full sense of like, okay, so we're doing this. And she immediately goes into, oh God, you're such a whiner mode and says, who after Saig? And it's like, you know, she has an opportunity to, we get, we get to see here blatantly uh, another example of what she's like as a mother. Right, as much as she has the guilt of failing her kids, this is still representative of how she treats them. And uh, you can tell a lot of it is based on how I think she has a lot of pride for how she behaved according to how she was supposed to and how annoyed she is that her kids don't do exactly as she says. Yeah, I had to put up with all this. Yeah, and I did know. it, but you guys aren't. Um, anyway, he says, yeah, Cole, Amond, they're going for their campaign. And they're not looking for my aid or even my thoughts. And she says, what thoughts would you have? And it's, it's such a, like, damn. And then he says, <laughs> Mom, you're, you're not, this is not a nurturing environment where I can no. flourish. <laughs> Every single individual around him has just written him off, other than his, like, enabling buddies, I guess, who just want to fuck around. Yeah. Everyone's yeah, written they, him off. And they do nothing but feed his ego. Like, they're like, you're yep. Aegon the Conqueror Reborn, look at you. But the thing, yeah, and that's the thing, right? You can you could be hypercritical of her, but simultaneously, she's uh, she's going through a lot. You would argue she's um not feeling too great. She's oh, yeah. failed miserably in a lot of different ways, having to deal with the lack of decisions she can even make, and then the absolute failure of the people that she brought up around her. And she says, uh, "Do you think simply wearing the crown imbues you with wisdom? The men at your table earned their seats. It was my hope that once enthroned, you would honor the burden of your new duties, be silent, and strive to learn from your more studied minds around you, in the hope you might be half the king your father was." Again, we always we're, we're appreciators of a series here, so whenever someone yeah. mentions, even by hitting out someone else, that he's good, we're okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, he was he was a neat guy, right? It makes yeah. me very happy to see that, to see the Viserys appreciation from everybody, because mm -hmm. he's the best. <laughs> he's he's, yeah. he's bitching. We love him. He's great. I think it's fair to say that Alicent is being, you know, quite mean here, but she's also kind of on point. She's a little bit drunk as <laughs> well, I think. Line, but she's right. Yeah. She's not she's walking super straightforwardly, and she's pouring yeah. it during as well. Yeah, she's um, not having a good time, as we mentioned. She's uh, feeling ill enough from the moon tea, knowing the huge fuck-up she made with this series, all of the things in general, but not feeling good, taking it out on her son, who she already treats like shit, so yes. And uh, he, is being a, he is being a brat. You know, he doesn't study. He doesn't yes. have wisdom. He just wants to be told that he's well, right all the time. It's so sad that she does have a son who does all of those things, but uh, she's written him off because of what happened with the, the end of season one. Yeah. And that's something that he's not actually... Like, she would probably be quite forgiving of if she knew the truth of that she'll never know because he's got too much pride to admit it. All these yeah. uh, problems, you know, it's just, uh, it's a great bit of set of writing. In, you know, in retrospect, we still feel like a, the scene of him revealing that information to her is a, a, a bit of a miss from the show to not include. I'm not sure what the logic on that one was. Hey, maybe it'll be in the deleted scenes for uh, the box set. Who knows? That'd be neat. Or maybe it would be worse because you get to see how much they, they didn't include it. I don't know. I'll pick up the 4K of this season. Well, I'll Working decide once it's fully out, you know? <laughs> uh, once... Oh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's true. Jinx. Is this, is this getting a physical release? I'm not even sure. Season I mean, one did. Season did. I think yeah. it will, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so he says, tread carefully, and she says, oh, what? You'll hang me as you did your rat catchers? Have me banished as you did your hand? I, rule in your, uh, I ruled in your father's absence throughout his long illness, and Otto Hightower was as cunning a statesman as ever lived. You should humbly be seeking our opinions and counsel. You have no idea the sacrifices that were made to put you on that throne. Which, as uh, Theo mentioned, true, but maybe not the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You don't especially necessarily tell your kids things because they're true. Yeah. But especially, like, put you there. It's like, oh, you know, now is probably not, you know, now might not have been the time to tell them that. You know, yet another person who's told me was put there. When he still thought, oh, well, you know, maybe I got it, because, you yeah. know, it got given to me. <laughs> I'm Aegon the Conqueror, reincarnated, here I go again, no. Yeah, oh, the same shit. name and everything. <laughs> Incarnated, as they'd say in Mexico. 
And um, yeah, he says, what would you have me do? And she says, do what is needed of you. Nothing. Oh, man, such a rough line to hear from your mom. <laughs> yep. And uh, she meant it probably as spitefully as she could. And she will go on to regret that one. Mm hmm. Yes, she will. It's funny. Um, again, this is a scene of two people in a room talking. And it's arguably more important as a moment than any other scene in this episode for certain of how things will turn out. Just, uh, it's just one conversation at the wrong time with the, just enough of a lack of empathy. Because I mean, she, uh, <laughs> she had a choice. She had a choice to make. You could either be very supportive of them and say, you know, I understand your issues and here's what you can do. And you could do this, you could do that and, you know, look at it this way. Or she could do what she did. And uh, that's. You know, the, the things that people do, this is one of those underlying scenes of the show where it shows people don't just randomly do things in the world. Mm -hmm. They do those things because they've been influenced in some way by other people, the people around them. So if you influence people poorly, then they will perhaps make very bad decisions. Aegon has now lost the best advisor he could have. He's lost his hand of the king to the actual, like, efforts involved in the country. He's got his brother undermining him in every way, shape, and form while also planning without him. He's got the guy who rose to Master of Whisperers, like, embarrassing him just by accident on the council. He's bored by all the other council members, and his mum doesn't take him seriously. He can't speak high valyria, he can't command the council in any way, shape, or form. He has no insight into the actual fights. All he can really do is get drunk with his friends, and that has uh, cranked his insecurities to critical at this point. I wonder where they're going with it. I wonder if he's going to make some big decision. Perhaps do something rashly. Very possible. Who knows? Don't know. Can't you, and you just, you just think that in a different world, if Allison had maybe been a bit more patient with him in that scene and said, hey, you know, what you it's... can do right now is exactly what I said. Try to be quiet, learn, and then you'll find you start understanding this whole world better. And then you'll find that people will respect you when you can give good advice. Don't just try to throw any advice out there because you think you're smart because you have no experience. It's an element I kind of love. If you draw back to one of the best, I think, auto moments in season one is when he is removed his hand of the king and he gives Alicent the speech of the worst case scenario, right? Like, Rhaenyra becomes queen and she has to kill anyone who could inherit the throne legitimately who is male slash would be the, uh, the correct heir sort of thing. And he's like, you have to prepare for the day where she will try and wipe you out. And in doing so, right, like that kind of insecurity about that nature, all the prep for that, doing everything according to that. Remember the scenes that Alison gives her own son uh, about how that's his future and she, he needs to prepare for it? It's like it practically ensured that would be the future by preparing mm -hmm. for it. Instead of being, if she was just a loving mother who assumed everything would work out. Which isn't necessarily a, a good way to operate in a world like this. It's fucking ruthless and backstabby. It's just that all of those decisions have had dramatic consequences. In a way, it's funny to look back at season one because a lot of people were annoyed they didn't get any dragon battles, you know, like of significant level and castles and war and stuff, when season one should never be forgotten as to how important it was for justifying almost everything in season two, three, and four going forward. Uh, all those tiny decisions that were made so long ago, which is part of the point of the whole show. Can't even you can't even necessarily know. Certainly, the people writing the histories will never know how the hell everything ended up this way. But we know because we were shown That's all of right. it. The omniscient eye of the filmmakers. The histories will have that. some of it. Yeah. But in many ways, it's going to be written by people with narratives in their heads for some part. Mm -hmm. And so we're at the point of uh, they usually stay under cover of forests and during the day, and then at night they will siege castles so that they're better protected from the fear of dragons. And this time Cole is saying, no, we're going to attack Rook's Rest in the day. Which and... uh, instantly you're like, huh. <laughs> That's well, not when... protocol. When me and Frank were watching it, uh, really I was quite happy with both of us being able to figure out that this is this is a trap. They've set everything in place. This is going to be Aemond and Cole's little plan put together to draw out a dragon and then kill it because it thinks, rather than the dragon, the rider thinks 
that it would be unchallenged because it's just a bold move by Cole to attack some castle, but they'll have Aemond lying in wait. And it's a really good trap because there is no dragon that can challenge Vhagar on their team. So whatever singular dragon they send, it should be countered. And the interesting yeah. thing even more is that the bigger, scarier the dragon they send, the better, so to speak, because it's getting wiped out whichever one it is. At least that yes. would be the assumption. Well, mm -hmm. and, yeah, and it either has to make fight or disengage. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was like, ooh, 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 things are getting heated up. And so Rhaenyra heads home. Um, <laughs> this is for me. Like, uh, uh, I, I quite like even uh, uh, Jace is very angry with her, which is like, yeah, good, I you really should be. Like yeah. Yeah. Understandably that was sorry. a dumb move. And, um,. Yeah, I think because uh, she's like, "What's uh, what's happening, everybody? What's even going on? Why do we need? Why are we sending dragons to places?" And it's like, "Oh, you know, because a bunch of castles allied with us have been destroyed by Cole and taken. You know, while you were off doing your little adventure." It's uh, that's what I mean. There's like, anyway, welcome back. There is anger like... toward her, but it's just like, oh, what a decision you made! What a dumb fucking thing you did!" Yeah. Um. Yeah, and he says. Yeah, I... he, I like the I, I do like the mother son dynamic where he can kind of get upset at her and he has a very personal interest in her obviously being the son, um, but they there is this understanding of we do have to be a team. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and she does the one line I do like appreciate. I think it was pre relatively well written. They're all shitting on her, and she says, I inherited 80 years of peace from my father before I was to end it. I needed to know there was no other path, and now I do. It's like. Okay, I guess. Yeah, like, it's, that's, uh, I get, I get it. It's satisfying somewhat. I still, obviously, all the criticisms stand. It's just that it's, it's a good line to get from her as a character, I suppose. Uh, but yes, they talk about how Rook's Rest is being attacked more than likely because Lord Staunton is a member of the council and because the castle is vulnerable and the uh, benefit it represents from land. Uh, they still say that Cole is brazen to make this decision, especially in daylight. And there's this sense in the council of, like, it's time we respond. And Rhaenyra is like, I'm ready to take action finally. This is it. We're doing it. We're sending a dragon. And then the logic, of course, is, okay, so which dragon? Rhaenyra's? Well, can't risk the queen. Okay, Jace? Like, well, his dragon's too small, not experienced enough with war. And so, inevitably, it falls to their obvious, which is their biggest warrior, which would be Melis with Rhaenys. And, uh... At what point you think, ha, huh, pair, you know, your speculation together. Yeah. What does this mean for her? And I, 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 it's interesting as well, because it's like, finally we take action, Melis is strong and experienced, this will be a first act strongly of a big battle, a war move, everyone everyone in that room is pretty sure that Melis will be fine. Yeah. Like, and, uh, yeah, with everything that's being set up here, it's just, they did, I think, you know, a lot of people have a lot to compliment about this episode, they do a really good job of setting this all up without giving us the full information, but the, it's all there for you, you can figure it out, you know? Well, pretty much, you've, uh, it's been highlighted with the, um, Allison and uh, Aegon conversation, as well as already knowing that Aemon and Cole have been working together, and now this. It's like, oh wait, that's like, there's a, there's a potential at this point to realize what the totality of the uh, collision is going to be mm -hmm. at the end of the episode. Especially given what Aegon was going to do earlier anyway in the, in the prior episode of uh, potentially flying off on his dragon. Yeah, and we get one more Aegon scene before that happens of him just sitting in that room, restless, pushes the flagon he has on the table over off to crash down on the, the floor, and it has a little dragon on it. Golden, you might even say. And then he steps on it as he walks away. Oh, it's yes, so no, good. It, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is symbolic of uh, his unappreciation of good craftsmanship. Yeah, but uh, you know, on, a, on a legitimate standpoint, right, like, the dragons ultimately are just creatures that exist in this world, they're used as weapons, there's no need for them to be forced to kill each other fucking Pokemon style, but they will be, they're gonna have to be, and the lack of consideration for them is just gonna be the, the underfoot of the Targaryens, right, like, everything, 
all the dragons are going to be destroyed by the Targaryens trying to vie for power. And having yeah. this sort of golden color, uh, Aegon's decision is going to destroy Sunfire, which is sad because Sunfire... They had to do it. They had to throw in a few seconds of a scene of yep. Sunfire being cute. <laughs> oh boy, we're going out yeah. flying and doing some fun stuff. Boy, I sure do love that. It's not nice, <laughs> though, uh, well, in retrospect. Around, cool. Had they included a few more of those scenes, maybe in uh, this season or whatever, I think it would have been even more effective, because that one selection of seconds does so much work to make you like Sunfire before what happens. It's anyway. like I'm a dragon. I don't care about politics. No, well... You just want to eat me sheep. Funny you say that, Rags. One of the, the, the Drogon burnt the throne. Remember that, Theo? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I that remember was, that. that. Oh, was, you are right. That was so cringy. That's that was one of the <laughs> stupidest fucking decisions, and the writers were so proud of themselves. <laughs> well, what does Drogon, it mean? Uh, Drogon understands subtext. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so, it's so fucking stupid. Like, there's a there's a meme of like he burns the throne. It's like one of those like leftist memes or whatever, yeah. where the third panel is just filled with this huge paragraph about you see John, the throne represent. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just imagining Drogon writing a political like theory. Yeah. <laughs> I had to do it, John. You have to understand. It was manipulating all of you. Drogon was the one to break the wheel. Yes, truly. But, What's uh... even matter though? They'll just make another one. Yeah, why not? It's not exactly like the super difficult to make. You just get a bunch of swords. Drogon oh, thought it was the only one. Yeah, it's this one, right? Never gonna yeah. find that many swords one again, sec. ever. <laughs> no, John, it was power to <laughs> kill my mother. <laughs> <laughs> why would I burn you? By melting the throne, I have signaled my rejection of the discourse of violence and hubris. <laughs> In this way, I fulfilled my mother's dream of breaking the wheel, interpreted in the faculty and sense, and by reducing the iron to liquid, I gesture to a semiotic fluidity that I argue functions in the praxis of his speech. Oh, the praxis! It's so yeah. fucking funny. <laughs> Drogon, it's like, Drogon knows it's all that. Shows <laughs> Oh. Drogon, de Drogon definitely lives in a society. It's <laughs> genuinely I'm just imagining Drogon with Joker makeup on. <laughs> to a dance, oh, to a dance on top of a car. It's such a good meme because it's incredibly funny, and then it's also like summarizing just how much just fucking things went wrong in that season. Mm. Just how much they weren't understanding the work they were doing anymore. Anyway, I'm glad the bad scenes of this season definitely seem to be outliers. Oh yeah, we're safe for now. Everything's okay. For now. Who knows how to I thought go. Westeros was a tragedy. Now I see it's a comedy. No. It is a comedy. Uh -huh. But yeah, so we get... And you know what? I appreciate the fact that they show Aegon and Sunfire enjoying each other, so to speak. It's like, uh, instead of making him evil man who has evil dragon and hopefully will be defeated, it was genuinely like... That's possibly the only relationship in his whole life that's actually, um, I don't know, normal, <laughs> like, and happy. Positive for him in any way. Yeah, uh, it looks like they, it's a, it's a cool fact. It's a, it's a nice thing that's got going on there. And then Rhaenys with Melis, you get much more of a sense of uh, veterans just, you know, getting into the mode of, like, we got to go do this again. Because something they've mentioned, but I don't know if it's been properly understood, is that she's been... Rhaenyra's top weapon, and she's been cycling through the gullet over and over and over and over and over and over again. That's how we started season one. She's, like, tired from being her god throughout the the whole world, essentially. Which is why losing her is going to be significant in terms of changing the stakes and how they might need to find some more dragons, because it's, it's too much of a big strategic loss, but uh, I just appreciate that as going forward, because it's going to matter into the decisions that get made later but yes yeah, so this scene you get visuals like that while um Rhaenyra is explaining the song of ice and fire the dream because Jaceris is her heir and she hasn't yet explained it to him and the reason she is is because she's trying to explain that this is part of why she's definitively going to war she needs to be on the throne because she needs to ensure the world is protected ready ahead of the white walkers or the force from the north that's going to destroy the world. You know. 
Game of Thrones. You guys remember that? Important stuff. Game of Thrones. The yeah, it's it's weird when I see all this stuff in this show because obviously I don't have as much of a connection to Game of Thrones as you know some of you do, but um, even I, you, it's inescapable what that show became. So seeing all this and thinking that it's a lead up to that makes me kind of hope that they maybe pull something that says actually this is a different continuity and all that bullshit. Uh, no, it's not actually how it goes. It goes differently. We would have done it better. Um, no, I mean, it would maybe give, it leans into something. It would give them an excuse to make a lot more money remaking all of Game of Thrones one day after they do like 20 spinoffs. That because is I true. think they've got, what, two, three planned now? But Well, I was going to say, that is true, but they've got plenty of shows to make before needing to remake Game of Thrones, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just, I, the idea that it all leads to season eight is... Yeah not pleasant i don't i don't want to think about it i want to think that this is a different continuity and the changes that they've made in the books is you know it, it sort of is maybe even tipping their hand at nope we're doing things a little bit different this is a prequel to something that you're not quite familiar with and so the battle begins oh my goodness also i'm gonna get a drink i'll be right back the battle for Rook's Rest, which uh, when it starts, you're immediately like, ah, this is going to be a big thing. Lots of money is clearly involved in this one. There's people everywhere. Oh, There's all kinds of effects. And yeah, they're moving forward. And so arrives Melis, in which Gwen is like, you moron, Cole. They're, they're doing the thing that we knew they would do. And then Cole's like, teehee, just as I planned. And Gwen's like, what, what in the world do you mean? Why would you say that? And uh, they send up a signal, which is prepped for a spooky little sneaky Vega who's uh, sleeping in the forest. Which, uh, before we go forward, because I think I talked to you about it, uh, Theo, um, a common criticism is, how did Vega sneak in there? What, 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 what does everyone think? How are you feeling on that before we go further? There are ways to mitigate the damage, I guess, but for me, like, Vega is too massive of a creature to get anywhere at any point without people for miles around knowing about it. Yeah, like, even if oh. they travelled at night, they'd probably... You'd still, like, when you, you land... You would hear Vega. Oh, she lands, oh, yeah. Maybe. You know, like... You, the imagine? ground would shake where she lands. Yeah. You would hear her wing beats. Like... Yeah. Well, I mean, I they also... True. They also, the signal goes pretty far because they shoot up the arrow. A guy sees the arrow. He blows a horn. And then I think you see two more horns, at least, with them implying that they're so going to be more. Um, what if somebody along the way saw, you know, as, uh, as Vega traveled and then that got around as well? I, I, I guess like medieval cool. forces have scouting, like, faculties. They have this capability uh, and you can't really stop people from scouting. I guess I can believe, though, that if it's at night and he has cloud cover and he's above the clouds, like, how is anyone reasonably going to see him other than another dragon rider that happens to also be out? Like I said, you don't necessarily have to see him. You can hear him or her. Well, sorry. well but I mean, like, if you're on Dragonstone, you got to consider there's the, like the sound of the ocean not, not, as well. Not everyone involved in this is on Dragonstone. So are you, are you talking about the people at Rook's Rest, There's I guess? people then? at Rook's Rest, whatever forces they have, they would have scouts around the area. Well, I, I don't know, though, because you got to think if they're you got if they're like 100 kilometers away, then I, I don't think you I don't think it would be reasonable to think that you would hear a dragon from 100 kilometers out. And and as I said, they, they do. They have a bunch of horns that they seem to blow, indicating that Vagar is actually probably quite far from Rook's Rest. Sorry, Rook's Rest. I guess that, that's the way I saw it, at least. Then, anyone? Anyone? That is how I see it. I just got it. back. I, what, are, what are we arguing about? I think that Eamon would have left uh, late in the night. He would have flown all the way up, as we saw in Season 1. So nobody is going to hear or see Vega until you get all the way over to wherever they've aimed for Rook's Rest. I think Cole could easily have scouted ahead himself to find a good spot that would reasonably have like nobody around to tell Eamon where to land, and then Eamon would have gotten there, and it would have been a handful of hours, not even that long, before the plan would be enacted. So the scouts from Rook's Rest have to find and report Vagar in that time, which I don't think is reasonable. Hmm. I suppose I that's viable, yeah. 
It, it's viable. Um, I just sense? really, I really struggle to imagine nobody finding Vega. I really struggle to imagine it. In the woods at night? I don't. I just don't think there'd be anybody out there. No scouts. Well, so even if in the morning, for however many hours they have, if the scouts move in such a way that they would be in able to spot Vega, which is, you know, Vega's relatively camouflaged, which we've shown that, even if they are, who's to say there aren't counter scouts waiting in case any scouts were to spot Vega, ready to kill them? Well, that's not really how that works in a medi in medieval combat, so to say. You can't really... It is not strictly feasible to stop people from scouting in that manner. You can't build plans around denying the opponent intelligence by killing their scouts, because the likelihood of your ability to catch them is extremely low at the best of times. Yeah, but we're not talking about a totality operation. This is just a handful of hours. Sure, but I, I don't know why the same principle wouldn't apply. So, again, Cole makes sure ahead of time to find a position that, as Mark pointed out, is relatively far away, because two horns have to be sounded to get to the uh, alerting Vega to move. They, they don't show us exactly how far away Vega is. And then that position, I think Cole is smart enough to know where a good position... They can't scout everything in that amount of time. Sure. And so all it needs to be is a relatively safe pla place and to drop several scouts around the area that are pro Vega to keep an eye out in case anyone was to stumble across Vega that they could kill. And even then, if a person stumbled across one, was killed, what are Rook's Rest going to report exactly? And then even if they did, what they're going to ask for is help, we've got a dragon here, which would send in, presumably, a dragon in defense, uh, but we don't even get that, it wouldn't be enough time. I don't, I don't think this has any issue. And I think it's actually I mean, an unreasonable instantly... request. Like, I don't think there's there's that many scouts for Rook's Rest. It's a tiny castle, and where would they place the scouts if not uh, more in favor of where the army is coming from, which I think Vega was placed behind. as Not necessarily behind Cole's army, but behind Rook's Rest, like in a place that would never be expected for anyone to be coming from. Hmm... I mean, I think it. I think it checks out. And plus, if the plan wasn't to work at any time, and they were ready to execute the plan, they could have pulled out if they wanted to. Well, the fact is, if they even spotted Vega, uh, Eamon can bring her up and just burn the fuck out of Rook's rest and then leave. That could always be the plan too. That's I suppose cool. that's probably the most important part. Then is is um if if they got found out. Does that change whether or not he would even still consider it viable to just follow through on this plan anyway? The answer is probably no. Like, or, or, no, meaning he would still do it. Yeah. Yep, I get you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm still willing to be argued into it. It's just the with the cover of the hyper high shit they showed us in season one. I don't think there's any visual or sound anyone's picking up until the the come down from there to, to Rook's Rest, but Eamon's a pretty good rider, Vega's a pretty good uh, veteran dragon. I don't see there being much Maybe chance. Kind of quietly or... Not necessarily that they would be silent or anything, but they would come in as quiet as possible, as far away as possible, and then that means we're relying on some distant flapping sounds that I right. think could be written off by anybody, if not heard, not at all. Yeah. Yep. But then it would also just be the landing as well. Again, it's still it's just going to be so far away, which I assume they did that on purpose with us, showing us that uh, how much it how much sound had to be like what signal was required to get Vega into Multiple the battle. Signals. Yeah. Um. But with that, we can begin the big scene, I suppose, because uh, I think it's fair to make sure mechanically that this functions as well well however well we we assess it does because i this is possibly my favorite scene of the season that isn't very very character related right like it is a battle scene but i guess it what else would it be at this point because it's not describe the whole sequence then in that case which almost feels fine. a bit unfair to say it's the, the best one when it's like 15 20 minutes um yeah it's uh it's not short <laughs> a lot of things happen so with everything that's been set up, uh, Aegon is on his way in, which is a huge shock to basically every character except the audience if you've been 
paying attention to just how much he wants to prove himself, right? Like, nobody's expecting this to happen. It's going to fuck everything up. Uh, but what's interesting, I think, is on his way in, he spots Melis burning the shit out of everybody, and he, like, commands Sunfire to attack. You've got to give him some courage points. Oh, yeah, the guy's he's fucking ballsy. Absolutely. He's a brave guy. And, uh, you know, you I'd might be going, nope. Might be able I'm to leaving. say it's strictly a, he's just trying to get glory, but you could also argue maybe it is partly due to him being like, I'm the king, I gotta, I gotta do this, I gotta help him, sort of thing. Maybe. It's, it's hard to say definitively okay. exactly what's going on in his head. Well, yeah, I mean, if the reason he's going out is so that he can do stuff and be respected and be seen as kingly, that makes a lot of sense that he would use that as a reasoning for it. If he's not being respected as king, and he manages to pull this off, then that's going to get him some insane reputation points, in his mind, certainly. Yeah, and uh, moving yep. over to Cole, his, that's getting started up already. He immediately moves into a speech of talking about how his king is here, the, your king is here to support you. This is essentially approved by the gods at this point. We're going to win. We're going to dominate. Help him get out there. He's helping you. We're helping everybody. We're going to win. This war's ours. And uh, Win bigly. It was very much cool to see, instead of writing him so that he panics and runs away or anything, he just he rallies the men as best as anyone can and gets them in and uses this situation, which is a complete shock to Cole, to his advantage, at least as best he can. And he's uh, obviously very mad at Aemond right now because this shouldn't be happening. And so, yeah, Rainy spots Sunfire, which I imagine to her is probably pretty easy as a fight. Especially uh, I, well, especially when you pair her experience with his inexperience. Yeah. It's like In... easy picking some melees. Yeah, which gives us our first dragon fight, which they do such a good job of in this episode in general, but we'll go through it nice and piece by piece. Uh, they're heading toward each other, and Aegon's strategy is breathe fire on it, and that's <laughs> yeah, uh, that's nice, uh, I guess, <laughs> as a move. It's, um, you know, it's what dragons do. But, uh, and he fires way too early. Yeah, it barely gets to the target, and it blinds him and Sunfire. Both of them show like they can't quite see or move properly after he does it. Uh, she You're dives like, down uh, straight away, Melis. Yeah. He did her a favor. Yes, because she dives down and then swoops right back up and immediately claws the belly out of Sunfire. It's 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 not even close to fair oh, as a fight. Too. Um. Brutal and yeah, just the screaming, and then you see uh, Sunfire's blood splatter across a bunch of the enemies, burning them, um, or rather, not the enemies, their, their allies. Because dragon blood burns hot is a thing in this universe. But uh, before Sunfire can fully recover, Melis comes in and starts biting the right wing off. Which is uh, it's just, again, it's kind of like you gotta do it this way, uh, from Melis and Rainey's sure perspective. Dead, yeah. yeah, just gotta kill no it as fast measures. as possible and it's seen as like a fuck yeah we're totally winning you know team black and then uh the lord spots vega coming in from the distance and <laughs> it's, it's so just... awesome <laughs> every time seeing vega yeah from it's, the ground. it's such a gg thing it's just like because vega just represents game over that's all that is <laughs> um but yes, uh, the, they're sort of tangled, Sunfire and Melis, and Aegon is obviously very happy to see his brother is here to save him. Kind of sad, <laughs> to be honest like, with you. Yeah. <laughs> you are, help me. Great, great you, performance, you, you just, too. You know what's Definitely about to happen. Definitely a the king moment, yeah. Yeah, and he's like, uh, thank the gods that he gets a bit melted, because Vhagar cooks him. But yeah. they do take effort to show that he's um, he's falling, right? And the it's the, the it's complicated. Like a lot of people had uh, fights over whether or not this should have been the death of Aegon. From what we see, the main thing for me, because I think that Sunfire would have slowed down the fall significantly just by having wings, even wings that aren't fully flapping. But it's mm -hmm. the landing and this little explosion you see, the, like the fire. Like, yeah. I wonder how much damage that would have done to Aegon, actually. <laughs> it was, I think it's, um, Sunfire just, it's just cough or fart when he landed or something. Maybe. Good old filmmaking <laughs> vocabulary, right? Like if you see it from a distance, you got it as a question mark. Mm, when you see it yeah. close up then you know for real, uh, mostly, unless you're dealing with some... Well, and that just seems to be the way it works. You see it at a distance, you're like, well, I mean, we didn't see exactly what happened. There's that, and then there's also just 
man, if Aegon yeah, survives, the storytelling potential, you know? Yes, that's uh, that's the main yeah. thing. Well, like, the armor actually you... also adds some believability to him surviving. Well, that that's like the in-universe explanation, the narrative one of like from a writer's perspective as man, like he knows he knows what Aemon did. That's some great drama, like that you could just tap into if you keep him around. Well, he's down and possibly out. Cole's on the way to help him out, and Aemon is probably relatively happy with his decision, but the curiosity is, Maylise has the chance to escape uh, with Rhaenys, so and Rhaenys decides not to. She turns around. Is possibly the uh, a big old discussion as to exactly why, because this show doesn't have her shout out why, so we have to discuss it. Unfortunate, yeah. but uh, that's where we're at, you know? If maybe, maybe in future episodes they can have someone explain definitively what the decision was. Or we can talk about everything that has happened in her life that would make her decide to do this. Does anyone want to start? So I think it's interesting that Renice is often characterized more so by others than herself as the, the queen who never was. That there is this element of the the idea that she essentially gives up her life to fight for a queen who's in a position that she should have been in uh, by many people's rights uh, is an interesting way for her character to end. How she's not like bitter, bitter about it. Uh, she still sees that she has a place in you know in the kingdom and stuff to do. Uh, she doesn't have any like anger against Rhaenyra. For that, especially, you know, because it wasn't her fault. And that's kind of how she, you know, how she goes to, you know, how she goes. Sure. I, to, to like, be clear, what's being discussed is just that she she has the clear chance and acknowledges it of escaping. Uh, but she chooses not to and flies back into the fight. There's speculation and discussion as to why would she do this when she should probably know that she's not going to win against Vega. Like people have said... Why didn't she escape and come back when maybe there was a better chance of doing this, that, and the other thing? I think that, uh, first and foremost, the recognition is from her that she... I'm not sure she believes she's going to survive this fight. I think that's pretty mm -hmm. obvious. Um, secondly, Vega is one of the most important things in this war, and that if she can take Vega out, which is very not... Like, it's not impossible. Um, yeah, it can be that she's experienced and, you know... That would be a I've... hell of a... Go I've ahead. spoken to some book readers uh, and stuff who have said apparently, according to the books, the way this plays out is whoever's narrating seems to give the impression that Melis and Rhaenys have a chance against Vagar and Aemond, like it could be an even fight, so to say. It was just the presence of Sunfire that shifted things in Vagar's favour. So uh, I'm not sure how the show feels about that with respect to how it wants us to feel about Rhaenys' chances in this fight, I guess. Yeah, I suppose, because in the book, uh, there there is more of a three-dragon fight at the same time, right? This is a plan hatched yeah. by Aegon and Aemon in the book, but in the show, they've done it differently, which I think Gary said he felt was an upgrade in the show as a change, um, narratively speaking. It feels more ripe with characterization opportunities, but yeah, really I, can't, I don't know. Over, I haven't yeah. read it. Yeah, I can't necessarily this, speak to that. This fight's over a lot faster in the book. Like it's it's kind of just one move happens and then Sunfire's down, uh, Melee's is dead, and Vagar's Vagar's fine. Like, and they basically kind of all just spin. Like that that spinning thing when I think it's Vagar and Melee's do the thing where they're both shooting fire and spinning to the ground. That's kind of all that happens in the book. Like it's just that they they crash together, they spin down, and boom. In any case, People are dead. Uh, the. Nature of the decision, I do think, is interesting, right? So Shad was one, uh, one of his first suggestions was that he believed that Rhaenys assumed that she wouldn't be able to escape if Rhaegar decided. Sorry, if Vega decided to chase. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure of that in terms of like I... they haven't really told us if if Melee because Melee seems like it'd be a pretty fast dragon. Is Vega faster because bigger? Doesn't sound necessarily true. Don't well, know. they say that Styrax is faster, right? I think so, yeah. Well, and Melis, I, th oh, I think they actually describe Melis as faster, in... right? Yeah, it, just because you're bigger. Is... 
maneuverability can be like massively advantageous anyway. Well, I'm not talking about that with just speed of escape. Just who's got the top speed? I assume. Maybe well, no, but what I'm saying is that even 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 if she wasn't as fast, simply being able to move around a bunch means that you can just like run away for a while and probably be successful. You're not just going to be going in a straight line if you're trying to escape necessarily, especially if it can catch up with you. Well, if she's heading well, theoretically back to Dragonstone, that would be over yeah. sea, so there's not going to be a lot of maneuvering as well until uh, they catch right up. Well, just in the air, that would be it. Just well, like trying I said, to like, I, get around. I wouldn't be convinced that Melee's wouldn't have a higher top speed anyway. Um, yeah. In the way they I chose to show things to us, I don't think that's what they were trying to get across as to why she didn't choose to flee. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I don't see that either. I don't. I think the primary think reason good. is pretty much the main thing they've been using with her that we wish they'd have used more of, which is her mistake in episode nine of season one, which mm -hmm. is she had an opportunity and she chose not to take it because uh, she's got insecurities in relation to like she says in the show it wasn't her decision to make or something like that. Um, the writers have said she would never kill a, a, a fellow mother, which is just bullshit. And then... I would kill a fellow mother in a fucking heartbeat. With... Uh, in, a war, <laughs> in the fucking I war? I would stab that um, child. With us, uh, I'm not sure what our assessment was of why she made the decision she made in episode 9. In retrospect, I guess, uh, she just did, <laughs> didn't feel right, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like, it's like... Yeah, she, bad vibes, I guess. Yeah, bad vibes. The war had just begun, technically. The, the line had just been drawn in the sand, so it's, it just didn't, didn't seem to match up. Whatever. That indecision has now, even by her own assessment, cost several lives, several innocent lives all over the place. And so this feels like, I'm not going to make that mistake again. And she's going to move in instead of running away. And she has arguably one of the best f fighting dragons available. She has a good shot of being able to win this somewhat. But simultaneously, I get the sense that she's thinking... I'm probably dying no matter what, but if I can take out Vagar, that actually gives Rhaenyra, uh, Rhaenyra the best chance in this war that I could possibly give her. Yeah, because I've already, like, potentially taken out Aegon and Sunfire. If I can now deal with Vagar as well, that's incredible. Like, mm -hmm. that's almost winning on the spot. I mean, even if you injure him, that's, yeah. like, yeah. that's a big deal. Even if Vagar is injured, and it comes into play to be a very important element in the next episode. Yeah, and uh, the strapping in, right? So uh, when I was talking about this on the first stream, that was, to me, a signal that she was like, whatever Melee's fate is going to be my own sort of thing. Like, I'm not... There's no separation for me and the dragon, but it's simultaneously to me like a, I'm dying for this, we're, we're getting in. There's no... I'm not thinking about anything other than the fight itself. And then, of course, there's the nature of the strategy in the fight. She's going to flip upside down, which I imagine the strap probably helps with. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a neat sort of element of the fighting strategy, which, again, she it's not that Rhaenys has necessarily fought in dragon wars or something. Um, I'm not even sure, with the histories that I'm aware of, that Vega's ever fought another dragon, but that they've fought in whatever wars you may have over time, like uh, the Stepstones, for example, or the, the stuff that Rhaenys has done at the Gullet. They're both older, you know, both Melis, Vega, and uh, Rhaenys. Aemond is actually the least experienced of these four elements, so to speak. But he's still pretty strategic. Like, he's not inexperienced or not untrained somewhat. He's got he's a brain. Probably, he seems like the type that would have read a lot about um, yeah. dragon warfare. And so, um, but the, then there's the final aspect that I think is important that also uh, Rhaenys and Melis, I get the sense from this um, that they're both pretty tired of this whole thing. That they have spent their lives with the unrealized potential and then in this war for as long as it's lasted which hasn't even been that long she's just been constantly used to patrol and attack to patrol and attack over and over and over and over and over and uh this looming sort of i'm gonna be i'm the biggest weapon and i'm gonna have to be used in some way shape or form against their biggest weapon which is what this is and so, you know, combine it all, it feels like the decision that i can totally buy but some people uh don't think it makes sense what do you guys think in conclusion? I think I think it was yeah, go ahead. The the, the most compelling argument I've heard uh in that capacity is that the show doesn't do justice to Rainey's chances in the fight in terms of justifying the decision she makes to go back and tango with Vega. Cuz 
in the way the show is, presents it, it feels very one-sided. I think you would be fairly fair to say. Um, maybe we yeah, should talk about that I once we talk think... about the fight, because... Well, sure. Uh, we suppose, do... um, it's a question of a choice, one of character and one of tactics. I think in character, it makes a lot of sense. Tactically, it, it may it may not be, like, the best move. <laughs> would be, Like, I got to imagine 2v1 would be preferable. Yeah. You know, if you're going to take on Vega for real, would be a 2v1. I guess what I'm trying to get across is that, uh, from that perspective, it is tactically justifiable. I, I think it's 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 justified in character and tactically in a way that isn't made clear by how things actually play out. I guess. Maybe we'll, I get what uh, you mean. Like if they showed it play out in a way where she had a better, like you know, if, if it if looked had, like, like she had a fight in of how it yeah. went, and and this was like the worst case scenario for her. That if you yeah. presented the one where she still lost, but she did a bit better, that that would kind of convey that it was not like a totally illogical decision that she made. Yeah. Well, so if we able to put a pin in that conversation, then until we go through the tactics sure. and the results of the fight, first of all, I was just going to say I love the the shot before they first start fighting. So, um, yeah, they do a lot with the dragon <laughs> cinematography. It's just neat for the the stakes of it all. But yes. So as of having strapped in and knowing Vagar is going to be a much more difficult takedown than um, Sunfire, it feels to me that both Vagar and Melis recognize the best format for destroying if enemy dragon is the Talons. That, that's like something they said they're based on eagles and stuff, right? Like it's mm -hmm. uh, not the Dragonfire, even though that would be used, of course, as well. But Melis flipping upside down and trying to go for the belly straight away but both of them go for each other that way and so the talons get caught in each other and then they start flipping and firing but to be fair Melis is the only one that gets a significant shot on Vagar in this tangle that we see yeah. it's um a scram into the the belly which would be much more damaging to Sunfire because how much smaller he is but Vagar's huge so that kind of damage isn't going to be as effective I'd imagine it's got a lot of belly yeah, and then they spin and fire and spin and fire until, and I think this is deliberate, um, they're falling because the wings are not going to be able to keep them up if they keep spinning like that. Um, and Melis escapes before the ground comes in. Vagar doesn't. To me, that felt like Melis did that on purpose. And so my assessment is Melis wins the first bout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Because they could have you know, left if they wanted to. And I don't know if yeah, I think she had control of whether or not there'd be a second fight. Going in upside um, down and, and being more nimble to escape uh, by using gravity to her advantage, it just felt to me like Vega's good, but Melee's might actually be better. Um, yeah. So this is what I mean by, like, before we get to round two, um, the, the showing that Melee's didn't have as much of a chance or whatever, I was just like, I don't know, I got, I got an impression that um, uh, Eamon was surprised by how effective Melee's and Rainey's were. I'm yeah, I I'm sure he was. Though no, I it's funny, I know that we're meant to be talking about it tactically, but I mean obviously the symbolic uh significance of oh, two yeah. dragons caught in a lock and then dragging themselves and plummeting to the earth. Oh, it's uh, great that that spinning with the fire everywhere, the dragons destroying yeah. each other. It's the best image to represent what this show's all about. Yeah, that's yep. straight out of the book. perfect. Yeah, well, because that, that's something I uh, mentioned before, but I haven't, I don't think, on this stream, just that this episode is the realization of the promise of this show from as much as early as season one. People are like, what is this show about? It's like two, well, one big family that control a medieval fantasy universe, and they have a succession issue that leads to civil a civil war where they have dragons on each side, and so there's going to be a war with dragons. This episode is like, yeah, this is what you wanted to see, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it delivers on that promise in a big way. With the with the efforts that are made in the um in in the show and particularly in this episode to give the dragons personalities and yes. um and like that they're not they're not like um, mindless monsters they're emotional uh like you know beings um and that they don't want to be fighting like each other <laughs> that's not yeah. a, well it's so it's so simple the but the fact that they care about their riders is something that is really easy to make you like them more as well yeah exactly and I love the um. When we come back up from the, you know, fade to black, the all these men in war running and Vega's just stepping on several of them, trying to get back in the air. 
Yeah, it's such like a the, chaos. You are really horror. messing with uh, powers that are kind of beyond man. Yeah, at this point. And so, uh, the Mace... fight is. Um, sorry, if I can say one thing about the fight that's very well told visually, to the point where you can tell like it's a well written action scene, and yeah. probably very thoroughly storyboarded. And like oh, every shot yeah. is just a very clear beat of action that communicates something. I don't so think we like, could talk about it the way that we are if it wasn't, right? It's just, it's too well done. It can't just be an accident. Yeah. They weren't just well, like, yeah, just, they um, do fight. That's it. Some thought yeah. was given to the nature of how dragons fight each other. Obviously, taking inspiration from Birds of Prey, right? Like locking talons and attacking with talons. Even though, you know, most people would think of dragons like, well, breathing fire. That's like their main thing, right? But. Well, and I like I that mean, that's incorporated as an amateur move. It's cool. Yeah. Exactly. And certainly, it's... if you go too early, it created like a smoke screen that uh, Aegon mm -hmm. could not see through. That uh, she takes advantage of by maneuvering out. Well, of it's kind of like it, uh, in Community when Annie uses a pepper spray but runs into it. <laughs> yes, you know? yeah. like just like that. <laughs> Throw in a flashbang in front of you with no cover. I saw a clip of that the other day on the internet. Someone <laughs> they they had this video of someone yelling someone at some lady at a car and the lady took out pepper spray and started to run after the car as it was leaving and she huh? sprayed in the air as she was running forward oh, well, why would you <laughs> and she did it twice and then she just car. stops and grabs her grabs her face and is like oh god a car is very effective armor against pepper spray i think so a, I a lesser uh show would have tried to sort of hide the specific beats of the fight in editing yeah no I think yeah you're right. it would have just been Fast this is, who, this is what the plot <laughs> yeah the plot yeah, wants like... this person to win so they win in the end and what happens in between doesn't matter this is who needs like, to win for the plot some michael bay movies and shit like it's just like the editing it's like what is even happening i don't even understand beat for beat like what's going on but here it's just like every single shot advances the fight in some concrete way it's like no yeah he, it's like it, it's a Chad move to have the clarity of a fight for something like this, because that means that they want you to see what they've got to offer instead of trying to hide anything. Yeah. yeah. It's like, all right, sweet. I'm into it. I mean, is it fair to say this is the best, like, live-action dragon versus dragon fight we've ever seen in, like, media? I think it's fair. I, I don't know. Like The I mean, only one that people asked me about was, like, there was the one with the zombie dragon versus Drogon in episode three of season eight but nobody could fucking see anything anyway so what was it two dragons that fight in reign of fire it's been a while since i've seen it but people tend to cite that as one of the better like dragon i don't think any movies, dragons fight but... each other in that movie do they they're all bad guys uh, in that movie well i guess the, i mean i guess then broadening it is there any other is there a better dragon scene in anything um maybe we're not the selection of people to ask because i can't think of anything but it feels like there would be something to compete with this it must be I don't know, nothing's coming to mind for me, at least. Probably, like, there's gotta be something animated that had dragons fight each other, that's gotta be a oh, thing. Oh, uh, live action, I, I did specify. Well, I know, but, yeah, like, I don't know why you would disclude uh... animation. Well, I, I guess because then you probably have to be roping in all of, like, the anime fights against dragons and things like that, and it would it would really broaden the field, whereas having, like, a live action show is obviously also much more expensive. <laughs> we should probably broaden the field if none of us can come up with even a single example to compete. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I, I guess so, but I mean, like, it's, I, I guess, yeah, right, if there's no example, there's no example, I guess. Yeah, because I'm like, Reign of Fire, no dragons fighting in that one, I don't think. Well, um, what about smog stuff in Hobbit, Desolation of Smog? No, the dragon. You, what? <laughs> name well, name I mean, the sec <laughs> other dragon. Uh, but I, I, brought in the, I brought in the criteria from um, animated to uh, instead going with n just dragon battles in general. Like, what's the better one? Well, at that point, we, we, that opens up a huge amount. Like, just generally an action scene that involves a dragon. We would be involved in Reign of Fire, all yeah, of the scenes from Game of yeah. Thrones. Yeah, well, at that Hobbit, point, uh, I don't smog know. action scenes are actually quite bad. Uh, smog well, I mean, is really, I... really good uh, when he's talking in that one scene. But other than that, his dragon fights. When Benedict is doing his yeah. But um, I mean, I don't, I don't know how it ranks. Uh, I love this for its uh, the way the tactics sort of work, the obviously spectacle of it, the character of it. But I don't know how well it stacks against I don't know other significant spectacle level dragon encounters like i remember daenerys attacking the lannister army in game of thrones being 
like very effective, but in retrospect, I don't trust anything from what about that, post season uh, that, four, you know? That Iron Fleet one. That was pretty that was pretty uh interesting, wasn't it? <laughs> I, I don't I forgot about the Iron Fleet. What are they? Uh, he has remembered about what you. Daenerys has forgotten. It's, uh, well, it's just because, isn't it, that the, the dragon gets hit by, like, three arrows? Yeah. That's, um, it's, uh, that's something that gets cited back in, in videos of mine. That's where, I, it, like, I kind of broke a bit. When it got shot, because it, it's in my video, I think I make it go black and white, and I just start, like, contemplating fucking media suicide. <laughs> just like, yeah. what, what is the point anymore? I must desist. Uh, it's so fucking sad to a dragon that's been with the show for that many seasons just gets randomly assassinated you're like okay the fine. shock value yeah oh god it was painful but anyway melis and rainice get to make the choice again um arguably winning that bout they look pretty rough obviously under the flames you've got the the battle damage the worn aspect and you get a, a look from melis that i any expression from melis i fucking love in this whole sequence uh definitely a sense of man we've been through a lot but uh, the job's not over yet, sort of thing. And mm -hmm. especially considering, like I said, I from my perspective, I think they won that first encounter, and so they've got to go back and do it again, so to speak. Um, but they're both tired. The battlefield is filled with smoke, and I think they expected that they had done more damage to Vega than they actually did. And so, because this, this part's, I, I would say, relatively controversial of the fight as well. Rhaenys is looking up, down, left, right, and so is Melis. They're not spotting Vega until they pass the Rook's Rest castle, and then Vega goes for the jump scare kill that Vega is now famous for. <laughs> they already yeah. have it. Vega's surprisingly I sneaky, I guess. <laughs> the thing about well, it is, I, I to guess. me, is that it's it's well. So let's first of all start with this is the controversial part: is that people would rate this as silly that Vega could possibly have gotten the jump on Melis. So how do you guys feel about that? I, I'm I so, think so that, on it. I think that Rainey's has proven herself more competent a dragon rider than to fly that close to a blind corner. Like that, it's pretty much the only place it could have ambushed her from, and she fell like right over it. Uh, or sorry, flew right over it, as opposed just, to getting up a lot higher. I suppose I'm just un a little unsure as to the logistics of it all because I'm not sure like where Renis is going when she starts flying. Like she appears to be flying in a straight line, right? Um, but so she would be heading like out past the castle or maybe she's circling the battlefield but i don't know that's not the impression i got from the cinematography but all of that being the case i i again struggle to imagine how she lost track of vega i think that's maybe the thing that would be more so of a of a question mark is how did she lose track how especially did vega... when get to where Vega got and how did Rainis not notice because they're clear of the smoke where like where where Vega comes up from is clear of smoke so my impression was you have Rook's rest in front of it is where they landed the fire and smoke would have filled up the battlefield Melis moves away not really concerned as to wherever anything is just concerned with don't hit the ground and get space between us and Vega uh to the point where Melis would have moved far enough away that she wouldn't even be able to see Vega past the smog, and is moving in a straight line away from Rook's Rest, and then decides with Rainies to turn around and go back. So as far as they're aware, Vega crashed down in front of the castle. That is where they seem to be primarily surveying, but keeping an eye out above and to the sides. And then it's like, where the fuck did Vega go? And as soon as they pass the castle, Vega comes up. So what did Vega do? We assume Vega recovered a lot faster than Melis or Rainis expected, got into the air, swooped down past the edge of the, the cliffside, and then back up and synchronized with uh, Melis passing by, which was you know not necessarily unplanned in terms of like there would have been knowledge of uh, exactly where to aim, not necessarily that they would know Rainies would come directly into them, but that that's where they would have been heading anyway, um, once passing back up through the, the castle. Uh, what I'm trying to say is I don't think um, Vega was sitting on the castle and then did the jump scare and once Melis is in the right place. I assume swoop down, swoop up, uh, and the, it synchronized well enough for Vega to take advantage. 
that all seems well enough for me. The variable being that Rainice and Melis were both exhausted. They're not at the top game at this point, and they're trying to return quickly because they think Vagar is down. Uh, that is clearly the impression both of them have. It's only once they spot that the Vagar is not where they left her that they start getting a bit worried. Hmm. I'm just trying to watch it to get a feel for, like, where on earth everyone is. Because I suppose that's what's bothering me about the scene at this point, uh, is my lay of the land is pretty distorted, because to me it appears that Rhaenys is flying in a straight line the whole time, more or less. Well, yeah, a straight line away and then straight line back, right? But we never see the turn, if that's the case. As far um... as I'm aware. Yeah, we do. Am I crazy? Yeah, it's after she looks at Melis, Melis looks back, then they turn. Maybe I'm just crazy. Fair enough. Well, if there's anything else, I mean, that's just an opportunity for anybody to raise uh, anything they want. <laughs> I, I still feel so-so on it. Um, I just feel like she would be way more experienced, the both of them, and not having it come out of blind spots would be like your one of your biggest concerns you wouldn't want to be flying close to cover you would want to make sure that you're as far away from things as possible so that it cannot possibly get close to you without you being able to be in control of what you know the angle is or anything like that um i i just i'm so so on it i just mean Vagar is so massive Vagar <laughs> displaces Vagar displaces smoke by moving right and like, yeah, I don't know. It it is it is tough for me. Well, all right then, <laughs> because uh, the Vega bites Melis's neck, and uh, Radis gets to share a look before Melis dies, and is let go, and the body crashes down on Rook's rest, opening up a nice chunk of wall. Or the fall of the castle, which obviously would have fallen anyway, but it's just a bit symbolic of Rhaenys was the only thing stopping Rook's rest from being taken anyway. And you know, if if Rhaenys didn't burst through the fucking ground in episode <laughs> nine, this might have I might have said like, man, what a great character and what a what a fitting end in a sense, you know. But but instead, it's like. Well, I mean, I guess it was a fitting end for what they intended her to be, save for that a... one scene where she burst through the ground. And what a noble attempt to save this character. character. Yeah, I mean, yeah. to be to be very serious about this, had that not happened, and I, I'd be thinking about the story as intended, which is, she always felt, had she not been passed over, that uh, the world would have been directed in a completely alternate way, not leading to this fate, watching her dragon get brutally killed. And then accepting just falling to her death after everything else that's happened, all the other people that have died and will die, and there's nothing to do to stop it at this point. It's it's out of her control, which is kind of an argument that was made earlier in the episode and episodes before it, that it's just it's done now. This is what will happen. There's loads to work with, but it's so fucking hard to think about all of that and to think about her comments about like, you know, innocent people don't deserve to die and the, all the things we could have done to avoid it when she's still at the top of the leaderboard for killing innocent people. For no reason at all. At least when other people kill innocent people, there's tactical reasons, war reasons, or even reasons that relate to, like, some kind of plan. But she How just did it. How many rat catchers were there in King's Landing? Maybe that could compete, but <laughs> the, uh, the nature of her killing the people in Season 1, it just makes this difficult to enjoy as they intended. Uh, yeah, because it, it just looms intended. over it. It's like, man, you know, like, what an interesting character, except for that one time you were insane. <laughs> yeah. um, insane except for in the, the most dramatic, consequential the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's not a small thing that she did out of character. It was a thing that loomed over her entirely, and it fucked with every single thing she said. Tell people, like, oh, you just have to ignore that. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, it happened. Well, so... it, to take that argument seriously, uh, part of when we break down a lot of the different these scenes talking about how good they are, we're relying on things that happened before and remembering them, right? We don't just forget things that get in the way and remember the things that work. You have to take it all 
because that is what the story being told is, and that's what I'm analyzing it is. I suppose you can, on your personal level, ignore what doesn't fit to make you know a bit more meaning come out for you for yourself. But when we're talking about how well they executed this, that scene was an absolute blight on this show. And the only way to have fixed it was to acknowledge it directly and to have the character face the fact that she's a hypocrite. Like, at least somewhat. Yeah. Uh, but they but, didn't do that because they, they never they never realized it was a problem, that scene. Well, it's just in the face of... Yeah, they realized... Off, but it's insane. How, was, how did nobody notice that that was just a cute... Why would you do that? Like, they had scenes before where it was clearly portrayed as bad when Damon through uh indifference like inflicted lesser carnage on innocent people you know like stepping mm -hmm. on that dude in the step stones that was yeah. obviously meant to be played as wow that's bad meanwhile she just like burst through even, the ground even that you could argue that damon would have avoided him if he like if he knew, knew more kid more yeah. you know like, but it's just like whatever i'm getting my job done at the step stones i gotta yeah, kill the crab feeder bursting out when you know that there are thousands of innocent people above you yeah to then do that and then to not end the war like it's yeah you got all the negatives that's... without any of the at least but, pretty much it's it is, you know... it is a total error but the work that was done in this season like with this moment you know it's worth commending it's just dragged down by a decision they made last exactly. last year and i you know as much as i despise a lot of what came as a result of that decision lined up with a lot of the lines from here i have to re i do respect the work they did with rainy's targaryen as a character like a, from start mm -hmm. to finish so, uh, i guess yeah it's like there's there's lots of stuff like it's, you know the one bad scene doesn't it's what stannis said the one one bad doesn't wash out the good but the good doesn't wash out the bad either it's they they're both there yeah and uh, yeah, she's out. Eamon is pretty proud of himself. And then we get a surprisingly awesome scene that I wasn't necessarily expecting from this show. A um, really important scene for the show and for uh, for Cole as well. Yes. He wakes up in what is essentially a molten wasteland of his men having been just burned the fuck out by the dragon fight. Uh... He's struggling to breathe, he's covered in ash, there's just burn victims everywhere, there's screaming, moaning, and just death. It's uh, very well shot, very well acted, very effective. Um, maybe, at one point, slightly silly, the whole uh, the suit of armor that falls apart when he touches it, because it's probably wouldn't be that way. But at the same time, symbolically very effective. I really like the use usage of um, cuts to black in this. Like uh, the first one happens when he like f hits the ground, he falls off his horse, and he hits his head on the ground hard. Cuts to black. Yeah, I think they they can't end the episode there, can they? And then it's like, okay, good. I was. So and then happy there's another cut to black, and then you think, oh, is this gonna be the end? But then we do this, and it's like, oh, cool. See, it's like he's waking up f from a haze, and it's like, it's so jarring it's like you know this this whole field was intact and all my guys were alive and then you wake up and everybody's dead it's like horrifying to like wake up to and this uh this adds to the horror of it i think yeah this graphic portrayal of yeah this thing we said that would be really bad if it happened uh this is it and it's really re it it we weren't lying it's, it's really terrible worse. it's awful and then yeah. you have just the normal like how do people deal with this you know, terrible violence and, you know, the, the post-traumatic stuff that kind of comes into play afterwards. And, like, this isn't, like, a regular war. And those are bad enough. This is something yeah. special. Well, um, how do they deal like, with like, the capacity for destruction that is so beyond comprehension and beyond their control? It's, like, when he gets back up from the ground, right. it's almost like, it's like, am I dreaming right now? Like, is this is this really happening? This is so horrific. It, like, it's almost beyond mm -hmm. belief he makes his way to his king where he catches what i assume was aemond close to finishing aegon off and uh realizing Mad. just how much <laughs> you know like just the, the what was going on in his head when he saw that just like oh my well, god it's worth, um, <laughs> we know this going forward this they had a relationship somewhat that relationship is over after this like 
it was kind of cool to see them planning together and talking to each other on a real level instead of, you know, whatever uh, dynamic one would expect the ranks permit. But, you know, that season one, uh, sorry, episode one of like, we move here, do this, this person's doing this and saying this, these people have that. But like after this, Cole realizes more than Games ever that are... uh, people are playing games who are above him that have no concern for the damage they're doing other than just the game they play for themselves. And uh, I got to imagine he's having an existential crisis of what the fuck all of this was for when there was so much sacrifice and on top of it he's looking at his king who, as far as he could tell, is dead. Mm -hmm. And why? Because the person that he made the plan with betrayed him. Uh, which all of this was supposed to be... For, you know what I mean? Like, it's completely tangled yeah. everything up in his head. That they had a rapport, sort of. It's like, okay, so you're the, for lack of a better term, normal one. You're the one I can actually yeah. like get things done with. Oh, never mind. You are just as insane <laughs> as the rest of them, but in different ways. Well, and this is why uh, I really like this scene for Cole. He's um he's back back up. I would say by the time we get to the end of this episode, he's easily yeah. back in a position where I think it's fair to pick him as a favorite. But it's really weird because. The discourse for this show online is insane, and he's like still one of the most hated characters. That makes yeah, no that sense. just isn't. It's not fair. It's he, it just isn't he, fair. It's weird because he expresses unlikable qualities in unlikable ways, I guess, as opposed to unlikable qualities in likable ways. However, the fuck people manage to draw that distinction in their heads. But he's got so much humanity. <laughs> I know, right? But I guess not. And I just, I've never gotten the impression from him that he wants anyone to suffer in any way. He just wants this to be over. Yeah, he, well, he hates to... Rhaenyra. Maybe but, Rhaenyra. You know, well, yeah. He's blighted him in a way that he feels well, is particularly I was about to special. say, like, God, if everyone else gets the understanding, you know, so should he. He sees well, Rhaenyra I mean, as the symbol of the destruction of his, the meaning of his life. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's also just, you know, like Aegon, right? Where people are like, oh, well, you know, Aegon, oh, it's like, do you guys remember. You, do you guys remember what he did? Yeah. Like, he's a bad person. He's pretty bad. Yeah, he's not a good guy. Pretty bad. Aegon is a very, very bad person. But but it's kind of the nature... When people are actually saying the characters they like or dislike, it's not based on a consistent judgment of their morality. Nor is it something that necessarily should be influencing characters that you pick as favorites or characters that you dislike, potentially. It's just that it, it is kind of like weird that like Kristen Cole is the most hated well, character. Uh, I've seen people say, like, you know, I, what I don't like about it is how fucking petty he is, and they'll cite, like, his insults to Rhaenyra. What character in this universe isn't pretty petty? <laughs> like, I mean, it seems yeah. at this point, yeah. I mean, I mean Damon's really petty, and everybody likes him. <laughs> you could argue that it's the height of pettiness from Aemon that he wants everyone dead because they've been making fun of him. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's bullied teenager syndrome. But, you know, it doesn't change the fact that it's, it's what was said. You can cite these things as to why you do or do not like a character, but I just think it's kind of boring in terms of a perspective that you're going to say Kristen Cole is a petty little... Uh, do you remember I was talking to you about it, Fringy? Uh, there was a tweet that essentially referred to him as um, an incel. It was yeah. like, he's just an angry little insult. It's like, that it, he's the opposite of an insult. <laughs> he's, he's Fucking getting... is what got him into this position. Well, but he doesn't even want to have... He didn't want to have sex with Rhaenyra or Alison necessarily. They were both dragging him into it. He was like, oh, okay. And now it's cost him immensely. And he just... All he really wants is to be an honorable king's guard. But he, like, he feels like he can't because it's too late, right? That seems to be the, the difficulty he's facing is that... He feels he's sullied his cloak permanently, and so continues and so, to. Eh, you know, like, eh, yeah, he'll just continue with the course. Yeah. Not realizing that he could just start but, being honorable, you know, in yeah. the present. Having him go through this got me the distinct impression that the show has plans to absolutely give him, you know, a human story, not just a, a he's an asshole and he'll I die hope story. So. Yeah. I, to be fair, it's... I expect everyone to die, but I'm just saying that... Uh, you don't give a character this POV without caring about how they they have something insightful to say about all of this, which he does in in mm -hmm. later episodes. Unless they pull a Jamie Lannister again. Well, do you mean like he goes from uh, everyone assumes he's a one dimensional oh. asshole to a really awesome character back to being lame again? <laughs> yeah, to totally yeah. abandoning <laughs> his potential and dropping the ball on his story. Let's hope not. But uh, that gets oh, us God. to the end of episode four, which is best considered by many to be the best episode in the series outside of episode eight of season one. Yeah, it is uh, a... yeah I think I'm there. I think I'm yep. there. 
I'm happy with that. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to work with. They've paid off a hell of a lot. Like it does feel like a one, two, three, four is a package. You watch it as like a I agree. big old movie. Yeah. Um, well, episode four was important in terms of getting people to accept like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, essentially realize like, yeah, chill out, be patient, let the story play out uh, at a natural pace. Yeah. And then you get your big climax, you know? Um, and, you know, who knows what'll happen next? I guess we do, because we've seen two of the episodes already, but... Yeah, we do, yeah. There's two more to go. We're excited for that. But for Ooh, now... Two mm, more to go. I suppose that wraps us up for this episode of FAP. Hope you enjoyed us discussing... I don't know about you, but I sure did. And Yay. Yeah, we'll, we'll get the last four discussed in future... Um, but for now, I suppose that is us signing off and saying goodbye. Unless there's anything else yeah. anybody would like to say. No, I uh, I think yeah. if the discourse around this show is negative, I don't think that's fair at all. I still think it's a really good show. It's got some bad spots, but it seems like they're very... Um, yeah, but Rags, you would that... not agree with the criticism. That's You have to understand, <laughs> your criticism would be different than the criticism that's being offered True. on Twitter. Yeah, we well, have specific disagreements. Well, one and of the, the bold things statements that... of this House of the Dragon character is a bad person. Damn, it's a great <laughs> criticism of a character in this universe. Well, I feel like the bad elements of this show um, are a lot. They're, they're very, they're kind of compartmentalized in a way. Where it's like, oh, it's this character so far specifically, like Missaria, right? She seems fairly contained so far. Mm. Uh, to just, oh, it's you. I know that you're not you're not really fucking around with a lot of stuff other than you just shouldn't be here. You should be dead or in a cell and you, it's, this isn't right or fair. Um, or in the same way that episode nine felt like it was uniquely bizarre in how a lot of things can come specifically from that thing. Or we have the, like, Rhaenyra's plan to do stuff. And, like, when Rhaenyra goes to see, you know, Alicent, like, that whole thing is bad. But the moment that she's out of it, we're kind of back to, okay, we're back doing good things again. She even had a good thing to say about it. Um, so it kind of lets you put that in the little box of uh, crap. Um, but uh, it, it's easy to not look past, but it's easy to, I'd say, consider the show really good despite its flaws. Uh, it doesn't seem messily bad, if that makes sense. It's cleanly bad, in a way. Uh, not everything is bleeding into everything else. I believe I one... understand. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. And the one place that would be a concern going forward is my Saria, I guess. But... Yeah, I'm worried about every time she <laughs> opens her mouth, I'm like, oh, are you going to say something that's going to be insanely retarded, that's going to have huge repercussions <laughs> for people that I care about and that's have investment the problem is... in? She can only have bigger and bigger repercussions because she's a direct advisor to the queen of one of the sides of this civil war. You know what I mean? It's like, how, yeah. could, how could she not, you know? One thing I'm curious about, though, the people who think Kristen Cole is a bad character, what do they think of Masaria? Oh, they love her. After You know what happened oh, in the man. last episode. They, they adore. Twitter's been going nuts with what happened in the last... Uh, oh, okay. Literally the latest scene. Thinking, we'll talk about that <laughs> next time. Oh, boy, we will. <laughs> I just figured the consensus is that she's bad. Maybe they'll just like downplay her or write her out in season three. Like there's a chance. I think the uh, thing you need to understand is that generally the aura of positivity surrounds Rhaenyra uh, yeah. and the aura of negativity surrounds Alicent. Yes. So like characters that are in the orbit of Rhaenyra are viewed v very positively and characters in the orbit of Alicent are viewed negatively. Except for Otto. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I mean, Otto is not like a nice person in this universe, you know? No. Well, when I say positively, I just mean people saying, yeah, they're, they're great. great. Woohoo, yeah, the, the, I hope, they, the, I hope things <laughs> yeah. work out for them. <laughs> that sort of thing. Well. But, you know, at least, hey, look, all right, episode four, really good. Good times. Yes, no, Otto, good. which is, you'd think, oh, like, oh, Otto being absent, how can it be, the, how can it be one of the best episodes? Oh, well, it, it comes makes back, you then. feel bad in a sense, because it's reassurance that we can have amazing episodes for the show even without Otto, like even it doesn't ruin on him. There. And yeah. even when Viserys isn't there, you know, since the best episode <laughs> yeah. of the season was his last. Yeah. Which is uh, something a lot of people cite as being like, I'm no longer interested without him. It's like, well, it's still pretty interested. <laughs> I yeah, so. absolutely it is. Well then, on that note, goodbye everyone. See you next time. Yeah, yeah goodbye everybody. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. See you later. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.